Chicken Hawk, Cassette 6. Nate and Wrestler and I went to town one morning. There was nothing up that day, so we hung around in the bars and watched the girls. Nate claimed he was immune to Viet clap, so he had most of the fun. Something did come up, but since we weren't there, the company left without us. We got back early in the afternoon to a ghost camp. Everyone except the Bobsy creeps were gone. Big battle going on just north of Lima, said Owens. Where were you guys? The Major is pissed. Did you have a pass? It's hot out there. Really, the Major is really pissed. Nate thought the time was right to open the canned ham he had been saving for Christmas. We had a quiet party. The ham was good. Just after dawn, Lease busted in through the door flap. The new guy was killed. What? said Gary. The new guy, you know, the replacement. He got shot through the head. Hey, you guys, get ready to get out there. I wondered if I would amount to that much of an utterance someday. Mason got shot through the head. Hey, you guys, get ready to go out there. What's going on? I said. It's hot, said Lease. Lot of automatic fire. All in the same area where we've been farting around for the last two weeks. Yesterday, Charlie decided to fight. It's already hot again this morning. You guys are supposed to crew the next two ships coming back. Mine is fucked. Nate, you and I take the next ship, and Bob and Gary the one after that, okay? There was an hour between Lease and Nate's departure and the arrival of our ship. Wrestler and I were alone in our corner of the tent. I smoked. Wrestler cracked his knuckles. There are some islands out about twenty miles from Quignon, said Gary. I know. Twenty miles away. Completely uninhabited, too. How do you know that? I said. I've heard. Terrific. Do you ever think about quitting? Gary asked. Sometimes. Me too. Sometimes. Guess that makes us chickens. Maybe. But we do go fly, don't we? That's got to make up for feeling chicken. Yeah, I guess it does. He paused. And when I'm flying the assaults, I start feeling brave, almost comfortable, in the middle of it all. Like a hawk, maybe. I do, too, when I'm in the middle of it. But times like now, I'd quit at the slightest excuse. So what am I, a chicken or a hawk? You're a chicken hawk, Gary smiled. Yeah. There was silence. Yes, I thought. We were both scared out of our minds. It felt like we were near the end of our wait on death row. How long do you think we could live on a Huey load of sea rations? asked Gary. Shit, probably a couple of years. Two thousand pounds of food. Maybe we should take less food and steal a couple of girls to go with us instead. Go where? The island. You know, you're right. We could do it. I know we could do it. Wrestler smiled proudly. I liked the idea very much. Yes, by God, we could do it. That's it. You've got the answer. We just keep flying when we go out. We'll have a big load of seas. We can stop in Quignon and get a couple of women, fly out to the island, land, and dump the food and the girls. Then one of us has to take the chopper out away from the island and dump it. Why dump it? We can camouflage it, you know. Gary leaned forward eagerly, caught up in the plan. Well, we'll see when we get there. Maybe there'll be enough trees and shit to hide a Huey. But if there isn't, we ditch it. Okay, if there isn't enough. Some booze, too. Can you see it? You and me and two luscious girls lying back under the palm trees. We have to have a radio with us, too, so we can keep track of the war. You know, so we know what we're missing. Gary looked concerned. Maybe we could fly to play coup first. Why? Well, I don't know if I want to live out there with just any girl. Remember that girl Mary in Play Coup where I spent the whole night? Yeah. Well, she loved me. Ah, Gary, she didn't love you. She wanted your money. She wanted a ticket out of this bullshit country. She was nice, wasn't she? She loved me. Suddenly, we were both quiet. We looked away into our thoughts. 
My strength drained away. What a stupid idea. Just hopeful, dumb fucking wishing. Face facts. Face facts. Face facts. Gary, I think we can't go to play coup first. I think we could only do it if we flew out of here just like normal and then disappeared. We could probably get away with landing at Quignon. There's a lot of transient traffic there. Not without Mary. Gary, be reasonable. Hey, guys, it's your turn. Wendell ducked into the tent. The palm tree aisle, the bronze nubiles, popped out of existence. The crew chief is patching some holes, but the ship will be flyable in just a minute. Wendell looked kind of pale. The old man wants you to join the gaggle at Lima. They've got some more missions to fly today. I hope it's better for you guys. The crew chief, along with the maintenance officer, had inspected the ship. The holes in the tail boom were a concern because the bullets could have gone through the tail rotor drive tube or the control cables. They had not. The crew chief covered the holes with green tape that almost matched the olive drab skin. It was now our ship. The sky, as if on cue, was overcast. At the Anke Pass, Gary had to drop to within 50 feet of the road to maintain visibility. We landed at Lima. What's that all about on the road? I asked Connors. As we circled Lima on our approach, we had noticed a crowd of men around a big pile of something covered with canvas next to an overturned mule. A grunt mule driver lost control and flipped over. Was he hurt? No. Killed. You and Wrestler are red four, said Lise. He hurried back toward the front of the gaggle. Lima was crawling with activity. Troopers moved around in small groups, looking for their assigned ships. A few Hueys were out over sling loads, hitching up. A Chinook made an approach, slinging in a fat black fuel bladder from the golf course. Shall I put my men on board, sir? A cav sergeant asked me. Yes, sergeant. Let them get on. I looked forward at the other squads moving toward their ships. We're leaving pretty soon. He turned. Move it! They were in place in about fifteen seconds, I think. It was a monster gaggle. Forty or more ships. The kind I hated the most. And we were flying the four position again. We would have to fly hard to keep up with an outside turn and flare like hell when the gaggle turned our way. Plus, the ship was a dog. When we took off, she hung down in the turbulence of the choppers in front of us, straining her poor guts out. We caught up to the gaggle at mission altitude and watched the prep going on. Smoke trailed in long streamers drifting off to the west. Air Force jockeys streaked away back to their base, their job done. Our gunships worked the area with their rockets and flex guns. Gary flew, so I just watched the show and smoked a cigarette. Kind of like being at a movie. The grunts behind me were screaming at each other over the cacophony of the ship, smiling, laughing, smoking cigarettes, scared out of their brains. The ships in the gaggle rose and fell on the sea of air. Formations always looked sloppy when you were in them because no two ships were ever at the same altitude. From the ground, you got a flat view of the V, and it looked better. One of the noises on the radio was the colonel. Yellow four, pull in closer. You call that a formation? The colonel was flying above us, being a colonel. There's a reason why they do that, we said. It's from the word itself, colon L, or asshole. They do exactly what you would expect them to. Guns ready? Gary asked. We were now dropping fast, having crossed the initial point, a meager hut near a tall hedgerow that marked the beginning of the final leg of the assault. The LZ was two miles away. Ready. Ready. Fire at my order only, unless you see something obvious. Don't shoot into the huts. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can't fire into the huts. If you fired into the huts, you might kill a VC. As we swooped toward the ground for the low-level run, I put my hand gently on the cyclic. My feet rode the pedals. My left hand touched the collective. Flare! Fifty feet off the ground, Gary was doing well. He flipped the tail past a few trees just when I thought he'd hit them. The gaggle mushed and bounded into the LZ. The troopers leapt out, firing. 
Yellow one, it's too hot ahead of you. Recommend you pedal turn and go back out the way you came. That was one of the Dukes, the gunships making runs at something at the far end of the LZ. The guys up front were yelling that there was a lot of shooting going on, but I couldn't see any back our way. Roger. Flight, we're going out the way we came. Wait your turn. The flight leader lifted to a high hover and turned to fly back over us. Each ship, in its turn, leapt up and flew back over us. By the time it was our turn, the first ships were already calling in hit reports. As we joined up, the ship ahead of us was hit, showering bits of plexiglass back on us. Next I heard tick, 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 and new bullet holes appeared in the plexiglass over our heads. Gary pulled full power trying to get higher, but the ship was a dog even when empty, so we lagged behind the others. Tick, somewhere in the airframe. At one thousand feet or so, I lit a cigarette and contemplated the new holes. Bad place for them. It'll leak if it rains. We didn't make it back to Lima. We were pulled out with the other three ships in the red flight for a couple of emergency extractions. Gary and I followed Ferris and Kaiser in Red 3 to get some wounded out of a hot LZ. The other two ships went somewhere else. Ferris orbited a couple of times to make sure there was no firing going on. We were supposed to wait until the grunts secured the LZ. All clear, Red 3. I heard gunshots in the background as the trooper talked on the radio to Ferris. Ferris did too. You're sure? Affirmative, Red 3. You're clear to land. Of course he was lying. I would have lied, too, in the same position. As we made our approach, Farris took the spot I was headed for, so I had to fly a hundred feet past him. I landed in a grassy spot in front of a hedgerow. I saw troopers low-crawling all over the place. Secure my ass, said Gary. Two bent-over men ran toward us, carrying a stretcher. Sand sprayed out of the grass near them, and they went down. The body in the litter shifted like a doll. Fire from the front, I radioed to Ferris. The stretcher bearers got back up and made it to the side door, where the crew chief quickly jumped out and grabbed one end of the litter and shoved it across the deck. Another few rounds hit the dirt in front of us. I looked at the radio antenna of the grunt leader swinging around behind the hedgerow. Fucking liar. Another litter had been hauled to our other door, and the gunner was out helping. We were locked to the ground. Farris called that he was leaving. Come on, come on, I yelled back between the seats. Two walking wounded rolled on board. The grunt leader stood up for a second and then hit the dirt. All I heard was the whine of our turbine. No shots, just little puffs of sand in the short grass. At the hedgerow, a man held a thumbs up. He pointed to a man at his knees and shook his head. For the first time, I noticed the body. Of course it was a body. Strands of intestines had followed the bullets out of his guts and were lying across his abdomen. He could wait a little longer. I was up. Pedal turn. Nose down. Tick. Go. Tick. Climb. The four wounded lived. We spent a rainy night back at good old Lima. The new bullet holes leaked. There was a Christmas truce, but we flew anyway, taking patrols out to check on reported VC violations in our territory. I couldn't get over how bizarre it was. We could decide to stop killing each other for a few days and then start again. I was still young then. Actually, the reason I was out on Christmas was that I had fucked up a few days before on a flight with Captain Gillette, our supply officer. He and I were the lead ship in a gaggle of 40-plus ships operating in the hills. On the flight back, I became very aware that there were all these helicopters following me. I had never led a big gaggle before. All I had to do was bring the gaggle back to the refueling area, where the Vietnamese worker had died of snakebite. The lead ship had to fly smoothly, no quick turns, gradual descents. But as I started to slow down for the approach... I was too careful. I kept thinking that they would all ram me. I slowed too late, with the result that I overflew the approach. I missed the whole fucking field. Gillette turned to me in awe. 
There were rumors around that I was a pretty good pilot, and look, Mason missed the entire field in a helicopter. I had visions of the whole gaggle laughing behind me as I flew past and set up to return. But it was worse. When I made the turn, I saw that all the others had gone ahead and landed while their leader flew off to La La Land. I flew back to the field, flushed with embarrassment. How would I ever live this down? So on Christmas Day, I found myself flying with Ferris. He didn't say as much, but he was checking me out to see why I had fucked up. I was the lead ship pilot again, but I had spent so much time worrying and thinking about my mistake that I made perfect approaches. I picked the right spots. I allowed enough room for the gaggle to land. My landings, takeoffs, everything went just fine. Gillette said you were having a little trouble with your approaches, Farris said tactfully. That one time I did. I can see that. You did just fine today. Thanks. Merry Christmas. That evening, after we delivered Christmas dinners to all the patrols, we had our own turkey meal. Later, we sang a couple of carols, ate some of the goodies sent by the wives and families, and I, for one, shed a few tears when I went to bed. I don't believe it, Gary Ressler said, crouching by his bunk. Heavy gunfire sounded outside our GP. Why? I shook my head in the darkness. Madness. A machine gun blasted just outside the tent. I forced my ass farther under the cot up against the cross braces. I closed my eyes, trying to make the chaos outside a dream. The blast of the machine gun lost itself in the roll of hundreds of other exploding weapons. I was hiding from the madness. A shadow ran down the aisle, thumping a loose board under my head. Pistol shots rang out inside the tent, then the shadow was gone. The firing continued. Riker was inside with Gary and me. The others were outside in the trench. Safer, maybe. The cot wasn't going to stop bullets, but I felt safer lying on the floor in the darkness. Maybe we should go outside, Gary called from the corner of his area. We tried that, remember? A staccato blast sounded from just beyond the canvas wall. They won't stop, I shouted. The madness roared like a storm. I guess I won't forget New Year's Eve, 1965, I thought. In a lull, Gary said, I think it's dying down. I'm going outside. You'll be back. He didn't hear me. I felt the boards creak as he got up and left. He was back in five minutes. I felt someone thudding along our aisle again. Mason, wrestler, you guys here? It was Captain Ferris. Yeah, I said from down on the floor. Well, get out there and stop them. Stop them. We tried. Well, try again. Let's go. He ducked out through the flap. I don't believe this shit, I heard myself say. Come on, let's go, said Gary. Under the tracer-streaked sky, a Spec-5 held an M-60 machine gun at his hip, blasting away. The light was dim, but that demonic face was clear. Stop that, I shouted. Put that gun away. The Spec-5 shook his head and smiled ominously. He watched his tracers stream into the sky toward Hong Kong Hill. God, I thought, there are people on top of that hill. Lots of them. It had started with people shooting into the sky for New Year's Eve. Now it was totally out of control, and bullets were going toward the radio relay team on top of the hill. Suddenly, tracers came back from the top. The relay team was firing back down into the division. The colonel was a spider scurrying and dodging from sandbag pile to ditch to tent, encountering his men gone mad. Fifty feet away from us, he stopped and screamed at a man firing a machine gun. Stop! I order you to stop! The man paused with an irritated look on his face. His battalion commander was becoming a nuisance. He smiled menacingly and swung the hip-held M-60 toward the colonel, aiming it carefully at his chest. The colonel shrank back. He turned momentarily to look at Gary and me. Do something, he said, glaring at us. What? 
We shrugged. He bent over and dodged back toward his tent. It was quiet at last. At 12.30 or so, the Battle of Hong Kong Hill stopped. Planes that had had to orbit since the beginning of the melee could now land. The shooting had stopped, and the men had put the guns away. It was still New Year's, but it was now very quiet. Some people were killed at the maintenance depot, said Connors. We all sat quietly on our cots, lights on, as if nothing had happened. How many? somebody asked. Seven, I think. There's some wounded, too. He spoke without emphasis and stared at the floor. Hell of a party, huh? They shouldn't allow holidays in a war. Chapter 7 The Rifle Range The verdict on the first cavalry concept was in last week. Stepping out of an olive-drab tent at An Kay after an hour-long briefing on the division, Secretary McNamara was brimming over with praise. The division, he said, was unique in the history of the American Army. There is no other division in the world like it. Newsweek, December 13, 1965. January 1966. Not long after Ressler and I talked of disappearing with a Huey, a ship from the Snakes, tail number 808, took off on a foggy morning to go out to Lima with sea rations and supplies and never arrived. The pilots called once before crossing the pass to say that the visibility was almost zero, but they could make it. By 0900, I was involved in the search. By dusk, they had not been found, not even a clue. Do you think they did it? Ressler asked. Nah, it was a stupid idea. The next day, half a dozen ships from the battalion combed the jungles for miles around the pass, looking for signs. Nothing. The first cav, the helicopter division, lost one of their own Hueys in their own backyard. It was bad for pilot morale. Meanwhile, supply sergeants throughout the battalion were keeping their fingers crossed. This was a rare opportunity to balance the property books, once and for all. Let me explain. In the Army, specific amounts of military equipment were allocated to the company supply sections. Once or twice a year, the inspectors general, agents from the brass, came through to check that all property was in the supply depot, or properly accounted for. If it wasn't, mountains of paperwork had to be done including explanations by the commander and the supply officer. Searches were made. That was the formal army system. The informal army supply system worked around such rules. The supply officers simply traded excesses back and forth to cover their asses, and the IGs never knew. Unless, of course, they had once been supply officers. The informal system made the books look good and protected the supply people, but we still had no jungle boots or chest protectors. Certain things you had to get for yourself. I was able to trade a grunt supply sergeant some whiskey for a pair of jungle boots. The chest protectors, though, were still not available. There were only a handful of them in the battalion. All supply people dreamed of a way to balance the books, once and for all, without all that trading and shuffling. Flight 808 looked like the answer. After two more days of searching, a Huey was found. It was the wreckage of a courier ship that had disappeared on its way to play coup a year before. The search was abandoned, and Flight 808 was declared lost. Declaring the ship missing started paper gears working all over the battalion. One of the questions the supply people loved to hear was, Did you have anything aboard the missing helicopter? Well, now that you mention it, I did have six entrenching tools on that ship, plus some web belts, seven web belts to be exact, three insulated food containers, four first aid kits, 24 flashlights, and so on. When all the reports were tallied, I was told by Captain Gillette it came to a total of five tons of assorted army gear, about five times what we normally carried. One hell of a helicopter, don't you think? said Gillette. Maybe that's why it went down. Gary said, slightly overloaded, by 8,000 pounds, I'd say. Yep, we'll never see another like that one. 
The action in Happy Valley slowed to nothing again. The brass took this to mean that we had won. Won what? A higher body count score, for one thing. And we did dominate the skies. Wendell believed that the communists had decided to stop fighting temporarily, like they'd often done with the French. Instead of picking up a gun that morning, Charlie went out into the rice paddies and worked. We didn't believe this. We thought the murderous hordes were beaten and whimpering out in the jungles, licking their wounds. But Wendell said they were with the villagers, because they were the villagers. Back around Christmas, a group of Montagnard mercenaries had revolted and killed more than twenty ARVN officers at the Mangyang Pass. After that, the CAV guarded Mangyang Pass and the bridges on Route 19 going to play coup. The American patrols had their HQs next to the road. We delivered hot food, clothing, mail, and ammunition to them every day. Four or five ships from our company did the resupplying. Ressler and I flew one of those ships, logging six and eight hours daily. It was difficult to adjust to peaceful times. The deaths, the close calls, and the generally hectic pace of the past few weeks had established a combative mindset and an expectation of continued action. Just going out to resupply some patrols on a secure road was so bland that we played games to make it interesting. Ressler and I took turns flying low level down the road, seeing who could hold the ship in the turns. We also buzzed the convoy. MPs in the convoy thought we were maniacs and radioed our battalion. Farris was waiting for us when we got back that night. He said we had really scared the MPs. If I hear of any more cowboy stuff by you guys, I'll... He had to stop and think for a minute. What could he do? Ground us? Send us home? What could he do that we wouldn't like? Tomorrow is your day off. You two have just volunteered to work on the club. Perfect. Rumor came first, then the news. The 229th was scheduled to go to Bangshun Valley. Every recon ship sent to this coastal valley 50 miles north of Quignon had been hit by ground fire. The VC called it their own. A huge joint operation was planned involving the CAV, the Marines, the Navy, and the ARVNs. The Navy would bombard the LZs with heavy guns. The Marines would land on the beach north of the valley. The CAV would go into the middle of it and take the place. The ARVNs would mill around somewhere. One of the recon ship pilots, a warrant officer from another platoon, walked into the company's HQ tent and turned in his wings. Silver wings he had earned before the Second World War. He put them on the table and said, Enough. God, what will they do to him? said Ressler. I don't know. Is it legal to just quit? I asked Connors. Got me, said Connors. Probably they'll shoot him, or cut off his balls, or maybe even make him work on the club. The quitter was whisked away. Several weeks later, we learned that he was operating an in-country R&R center in Saigon. It had never occurred to us that we could quit. Technically, we were all volunteers, and if anyone couldn't take it, he could resign from flight status. But actually, to do it, just quit. It was definitely an intelligent thing to do, but so dumb, how would he live with himself? A few days later, we flew farewell assaults in good old Yadrang again, following up reports from the ARVNs that the NVA was gathering strength near the Cambodian border. About 24 ships from our battalion, including one with Nate and me, were sent to poke around. Sherman rarely led a flight. The aging captain, he was in his early 40s, needed some combat command time before he could make major. He was nervous and cocky at our briefing, the dashing leader of a combat mission to the dreaded Ya Drang. His plan had us flying to Play Jereng Special Forces Camp near the Cambodian border, then breaking up in groups of four to land grunts at strategic points. Nate flew on the way out and I played with the maps. It wasn't necessary to navigate during a formation flight, but I was always curious about just where the fuck I really was. 
we crossed the turkey farm at 2,000 feet, heading west-southwest. A half hour later, I saw what I thought was the camp five miles off to our left, but Sherman continued straight ahead. Getting close to the border, I said. How far? asked Nate. Well, it looks to me like we're almost on top of it right now. Really? Yellow one, yellow two. Yellow one was Sherman. Yellow two, Morris and Decker. Roger, yellow two. Go ahead. Yellow one, I think we'd better turn real soon, Morris drawled. There was a moment of silence. I could imagine Sherman unfolding and folding and crumpling maps, trying to figure out just what part of this miserable jungle he was over. Yellow two, we're right on course. Ah, uh, that's a negative yellow one. I've got us past our target. That was Morris's way of saying that we were over Cambodia. Another moment of silence. Negative yellow two, I've got us on course. You could hear the static of Morris's mic as he hesitated. Roger. Poor Sherman had fucked up and still didn't know it. His very first authentic combat mission as commander. Kiss Major goodbye. Five miles into the jungle marked Cambodia on the map, Sherman's ship lurched. He veered left, then right, before he actually made the turn. He made no announcement, simply turned back. Man, it's hard to navigate around this fucking jungle, the dumb shit, Nate said. The radio was silent until our expeditionary gaggle returned to the proper country. From that day on, poor Sherman would get no command more adventurous or prestigious than being put in charge of digging the company's well. As we crossed the border, the chatter began once again. Sherman called Connors and told him he wanted our flight to stay on the ground as a reserve when we landed. Then he told us all to stretch out in trail formation. The gaggle strung itself out in single file for the landing at Play Jering. As the first ships flared, red dust billowed up and swallowed them completely. The special forces people had bulldozed a landing strip, and the dry season had turned it to dust. Don't try to hover. Put them straight on the ground, Sherman radioed. We couldn't even see the ships that had already landed in the red clouds. I trailed in behind Connors. When he got within fifty feet of the ground, the dust from the ship in front swallowed him up. He called, Go around! He pulled up and headed off to the right. I followed. Ships three and four behind us went on in and landed, and then the rest. By circling around, Connors and I put ourselves on the tail of the line. As we set up for the second try, I drifted back farther from Connors to stay away from his dust. Ten feet off the ground, Connors disappeared. Now it was my turn, the last ship in. Roots and leafless bushes stuck up wildly at the extreme end of the strip. When I flared, the rotor wash stirred up the dust and everything vanished. I felt the ship hit something. I thought it sounded like a stump coming up through the belly, which happened pretty often on the assaults, so I elected to land a few feet farther ahead. Which way was ahead? Which way was up? There were only seconds to figure it out. The compass showed that we were turning to the right. I pushed the left pedal to stop the spin. It didn't work. This was a tail rotor failure. The solution was to chop the power quickly to stop the ship from rotating under the main rotors and then do a hovering auto-rotation. We had practiced this routine in flight school hundreds of times. I tried to roll off the throttle to stop the spin, but it was locked. Nate, flying right seat, had locked the throttle for cruising. There was no way to release it from my side. There was no time to discuss the problem with Nate. This whole spinning machine was going to go over and beat itself to death real soon. So I decided to put it down before it spun too fast. The ship hit and twisted on the skids, rocked over toward the left, hesitated precariously, and flopped back level. We were out long before the dust settled. It didn't look too bad. The ship sat crooked on its skids. The tail rotor gearbox was hanging by mechanical tendons. The tail rotor itself was twisted and bent. Connors came back looking genuinely concerned. What happened? I'm not sure, but I hit something with my tail rotor. Nate and I, 
Connors and Banjo and the grief-stricken Reacher poked around the ship looking for a stump or a rock or something big that could have done such damage. But there was nothing obvious. Nate finally called us over to where he squatted. A root? I exclaimed. Looks that way, said Nate. See, you chopped it off right here. He pointed to a fresh cut on a scrawny root sticking up through the dust. The cutoff point was two feet off the ground. Damn, I said. Don't worry about it, Mason. You couldn't have seen it, not in this dust, said Nate. I didn't see it. Yeah, but you weren't flying. Couldn't be helped. I bitched some more about my rotten luck, but Nate and Connors kept saying it wasn't my fault. Reacher came over and said, It's okay, Mr. Mason. She'll be flying again in no time. I felt better. Reacher was the one to know. It was his ship, the most powerful ship in the company, the ship Lease had used to haul that impossible load. If Reacher thought it wasn't too bad, then it wasn't too bad. Nate and I walked to the Special Forces HQ hooch to wait for a ride back. Reacher decided to stay with the Huey until a Chinook was sent out to sling-load it home for repairs. "'You guys want a beer?' asked one of the advisors. He wore a camouflage uniform like the Vietnamese Rangers, covered with red dust. Red dust collected on everybody's skin. "'Sure,' said Nate. "'We weren't going to be flying any more today,' so having a beer was okay. We sat on a cot under a canvas canopy and sipped our beers while the rest of the gaggle gathered their load of grunts, cranked up, and left. A half hour later, the dust finally settled. Well, how do you like it? asked the advisor. The beer? No, this place. Play Jereng, the asshole of the world. Dusty? Yeah, we keep it that way on purpose. Keeps the shit from stinking. A lone Huey courier landed at the camp. Nate and I hitched a ride to play coup. We had the pilot call our gaggle en route to tell them where we'd be. Sherman said he'd come fetch us near the end of the day. Camp Holloway at play coup was familiar territory. We immediately went to their officers' club, drank some more beer, and played their slot machines. I still felt bad about breaking the ship. I couldn't enjoy myself at all. While the rest of the gaggle was out getting shot at, I was acting like a typical advisor, drinking beer, playing slots, jerking off. The whole thing was due to my incompetence. Nobody else had hit a root, so I drank more beer than I should have. So did Nate. He suggested that if we had to wait till sunset, we might as well do it downtown. I agreed. We decided that the best way to get there was to walk, and that's what we started to do. We got a mile down the road when the daylight began to fade. Hey, Nate, something's wrong with my eyes. Everything's getting dim. I stopped. Yeah, mine too. The sky turned a pale orange, yet the sun was still high. Man, every time I drink too early in the day, I get fucked up. Not like this, though, said Nate. While we blinked at our dimming world, we saw our gaggle approaching Camp Holloway. The sun got brighter. Aha! I exclaimed. It's not the booze. That was an eclipse. Hey, yeah, Nate grinned. We weren't going to continue to dim out and fade to nothingness after all. The sun got bright again, and the gaggle thundered and whopped and hissed to a landing. We ran back to Holloway to rejoin our comrades. The original damage estimate was $10,000, later raised to $100,000. The accident board decided that the cause was extreme, dusty conditions. They had let me off the hook. The usual verdict was pilot error. I mean, if the rotor blades came off in flight, the pilot was posthumously charged with failure to pre-flight the ship properly. One time I saw the rotors of a Huey slash through the cockpit and decapitate the two pilots while the ship was on the ground. The pilots were guilty of not checking the ship's log. The ship had been red xed by the crew chief while he worked on the control rods. Pilot error. If you skewered a Huey on a sharp stump during an assault, it was pilot error. 
If you tumbled down the side of a mountain while trying to land on a pinnacle under fire, it was pilot error. There was usually no other conclusion. So the board was generous indeed when it decided that the accident was due to extreme, dusty conditions. But guess what I thought? The pilot was in error. We'd already taken Happy Valley, but we had to go back out to patch up a few holes in the victory. Somebody forgot to tell Charlie he lost, so he was still out there shooting down helicopters. The dumb fuck. The news about our victory against the North Vietnamese regulars at Ya Drang had been so well reported that the CAV was taking on some of the mythical qualities usually afforded the Marines. We were the pros. I knew that the press was doing a selling job when we supported a newly arrived unit from Hawaii. When we landed to pick up the men, they rushed us like kids when they saw we were air crews from the famous CAV. We were celebrities, the vanguard of more units like ours that would squeeze the communists back up north like so much shit. In two days, we flew twelve assaults into the same areas we had taken several times before. To add insult to injury, the VC fought even harder. One LZ lay near the thin jungle at the base of the hills. I was flying number three slot on the left side of the formation. Our squad was the second one to go in. Gunships made their chattering runs beside us, and door gunners killed bushes. Smoke from the prep was billowing skyward, and as we got to within 500 feet of the ground, red tracers were streaking among us. By now I had learned to concentrate on my job and to suppress my fear. I felt almost brave. This was Happy Valley. I'd been here scores of times before, and it was never as bad as Yadrang. Besides, I was one of the pros. The return fire from the invisible Charlies was more intense as we got closer. We continued straight in. Near the bottom of the approach, maybe a hundred feet off the deck, I saw a steady stream of tracers off to my left. Aiming at somebody else? Who's behind me? Then the stream began to move in toward my ship. He singled us out as his target. He's got us! God damn it, he's got us! I could not move from my slot, or even dodge around. I was flying tight on number two, and somebody was flying tight on me. Just keep going. I felt Gary get on the controls. The tracers were close, only a second away from raking the cockpit. I tightened my stomach, like the bullets might bounce off. My arms tightened, my jaw tightened, my hands tightened. The rounds must not go through me. Of all things, my wristwatch stood vividly before me. How could I see my watch? I wasn't even looking at it. It was a gold, square-faced Hamilton that my grandfather had left me. The second hand had its own dial at the bottom of the face, and the hand was not moving. At that moment, I could have unbuckled, opened the door, walked around outside, had a smoke, and watched the flight frozen in the midst of the assault. I would be able to walk between the tracers and use one to light my cigarette. I saw the flight frozen there in midair. I saw myself braced for the impact of that shredding fire. It was almost funny. An explosive whoosh beside the cockpit caused the clock to run again. Smoking rockets followed the tracers to their source. They stopped, just like that. A Duke gunship had nailed that fucker with a rocket right down the stream of fire. I was saved. There was a lot more fire on the ground when we landed, but it was impotent. It didn't matter. I was saved. Back at the golf course, they told us that our first assault into Bong Sun was set for the next morning. This ends Side 1 of Cassette 6. The first assault would be to LZ Dog, to secure a base of operations for the grunts. The Navy had blasted Dog. The Army had artillery Dog. The Marines were landing on the beach ten miles away, and the CAV was sending a hundred slicks in to take the place. A flight of a hundred helicopters becomes a train of unconnected parts that bunches up and stretches out like the flow of commuter traffic. One minute you're trying to close a gap between yourself and the flight ahead, and the next second you're practically hovering to keep away. 
The villages we saw before we got to LZ Dog were islands in the sea of rice paddies. This was one of the most valuable of all Vietnamese valleys because of its bountiful rice crop. The people who lived here were sympathetic to Uncle Ho, as was 80% of the rest of Vietnam. The other 20% in the American-controlled cities was engaged in maintaining the colonialist system installed by the French and now run by the Americans. I knew this because Wendell had told me. He said, just read Street Without Joy and you'll see. But there weren't any copies of that book around here, and it wouldn't have made any difference anyway because I just didn't believe it. I didn't believe it because Kennedy and McNamara and Johnson and all the rest certainly knew about Street Without Joy, and they sent us here anyway. It was obvious to me that Bernard Fall was just another flake, the father of the dreaded Vietniks, who were attacking our country like so much cancer. And, of course, the proof of all this was that Wendell himself was still here doing everything I was doing. And even Wendell wasn't that dumb. Yellow one, you are off course. No answer. Yellow one, turn left 20 degrees. Yellow one, the lead ship of this monstrous gaggle, still didn't answer. Instead, he slowed down even more and turned farther away from our course. Nate and I, wrestler was away on R&R, were way back in the flight, the 40th ship or so. We were showing an airspeed of 20 knots. The whole gaggle was staggering and bunching up over some villages at an altitude of 100 feet. Yellow one, do you read? No answer. Yellow two, take the lead. Come left, 40 degrees. Roger. We had a leader again. Yellow one's radios were shot out, and he had been trying to hand signal Yellow two to take over, but Yellow Two just followed him as he tried to break away. Below us, the villagers were having a picnic, shooting at a lot of helicopters flying low and slow. At one village I saw fifty people just standing around, their hands shielding their eyes from the sun, watching the show. Somebody down there was shooting because the ships were calling in hits. I couldn't see any guns, just women and children and men watching the helicopter parade. As the gaggle crossed the next village on our flight path, many ships called in hits. Connors got his fuel bladder raked and had to break away from the flight. Another ship called in that a pilot was killed, and it turned back. Someone in that village was doing a real job, but so far he was invisible. Meanwhile, we still wallowed around, flying low and slow. One of the ships just ahead of us called in hit. At the same moment, I saw where the gun was. Among all the people, water buffalo, thatched huts, and coconut trees, an innocent-looking group of people stood bunched in a crowd. From the center of the crowd, I saw smoke and then the gunner. He had a machine gun. Before I got into the Army, they had asked me a question. They asked all prospective grunts. What would you do if you were the driver of a truck loaded with soldiers, traveling very fast down a muddy road, flanked on both sides with steep drop-offs, and a small child suddenly walked into your path? Would you try to avoid her and drive off to certain death, or would you keep going and kill her? Well, everybody knew the right answer. You kill the kid. And it didn't much matter because the kid and the situation weren't real anyway. So I had said... I'd stop the truck. No, no, you can't stop the truck. It's going too fast. Well, then I wouldn't be going so fast down a very bad road in the first place. You don't seem to understand. It's assumed that you have no choice but to kill either the little kid or you and your comrades. Since I have no choice, I'll go ahead and kill the kid. That's what we like to hear. Now the question was, how do you kill that gunner who has just killed some pilots, without killing the screen of innocent people around him. I see the gun, sir, said Rubensky, the door gunner. Shoot at the ground first. Scare those people away, I said. Yes, sir. Rubensky, one of our most accurate gunners, opened up as we drew closer to the gun position. The spectators were at the edge of their village, directly off our right side, a hundred yards away. 
The bullets sent up muddy geysers from the paddy water as they raged toward the group. The VC gunner was concentrating on another ship and didn't see Rubensky's bullets yet. I really expected to see the black pajamas, conical hats, and the small children scatter and expose the gunner. Were they chained in place? When the bullets were smashing fifty feet in front of them, I knew they weren't going to move. They threw up their arms as they were hit and whirled to the ground. After what seemed a very long time, the gunner, still firing, was exposed. Rubensky kept firing. The VC's gun barrel flopped down on its mount, and he slid to the ground. A dozen people lay like ten pins around him. The truck had smashed the kid. Twenty ships were damaged and five were shot down, killing two pilots and two gunners, while we floundered over the villages on the way to Dog. Dog itself was an ancient Vietnamese graveyard, and we took it without too much trouble. The ships landed in groups, dropped off the grunts, and returned for more. By that night, Dog was an outpost of Americans in a Viet Cong wilderness. Nate and I and three other ships were selected to spend the night there with the grunts as emergency ships for the grunt commander. It drizzled all night. Why didn't they duck? I sat in my seat, staring into the night. The VC forced them to stand there. How can you make people stand up to machine gun bullets? He would have shot them if they had run. But if they had all run, he couldn't have shot them. Not with us right there shooting at him. Obviously, they were more afraid of him than they were of us. That was it? They were so afraid that they would get killed that they stood there and got killed? Orientals don't think like we do. Firefights chattered all night, but I didn't lie awake because of that. I kept replaying the scene. The faces were clear. One old woman chewed betel nut and nodded weakly as the bullets boiled in. One child turned to run, chewed up even while he turned. A woman shrieked at the child, then she was hit too. The gunner kept firing. I saw it over and over, until I knew everybody in that group, and they all knew me and nodded and smiled and turned and whirled and died. At three in the morning the firefight got suddenly louder at the edge of the graveyard. A grunt ran up and told us to crank. Fifteen minutes later, the firing slowed, and the grunt came by and told us to shut down. The next morning, Nate and I flew fifty miles south to a place called the Rifle Range, where the rest of our battalion and part of the 227th had set up camp. We moved into a GP with Morris, Decker, Shaker, Daisy, Sherman, and Farris. Wrestler was still gone. My cot was missing, so I built a stretcher out of two poles and a blanket set across two ammo crates. We were camped on an old ARVN rifle range near the village of Phu Cat, next to Route 1. About a thousand ROKs from the Korean Tiger Division surrounded us as our security. That was nice, because the ROKs from Republic of Korea were devout killers. They spent their dawns beating each other up just for fun. After a quick lunch, Nate and I were back in the air in a flight of two squads going back to Dog. At Dog, we loaded up with grunts and set out on the mission. Farris led the flight. A command ship was to meet us en route and show him the LZ. Preacher Six, do you have me in sight? Roger, said Farris. Just watch me, I'm going in now. The ship dropped from 1,000 feet and set up an approach to one of the clearings below. I thought he was just going to fly over it, but he flared and hovered into the LZ. Rice plants rippled in a circle around him. Right here, preacher flight. It's all clear. That was the only time I ever saw this technique. It looked pretty good. Here was an LZ that really was quiet. The ship nosed over and took off to the north over a stand of trees. Farris called, Man your guns, and we pulled up nice and tight and followed him in. Pick your spots, radioed Ferris. The LZ was narrow, so I dropped back a little to land behind the number two ship. As we flared, spray from the rice paddy swirled around us. I decided not to land completely, 
but to hover with the skid lightly touching the paddy. The grunts jumped out before we touched, not because of the excitement of the assault, but out of habit, a routine landing to a cold LZ. We waited for thirty seconds while Farris made sure everybody had unloaded. Machine guns opened up from three points. They had us pinned with fire from the front, the left flank, and the rear. I could see the muzzle flashes in the tree line fifty yards away, which blocked our takeoff path. I pushed pedals furiously and wiggled the ship as we hovered, waiting for Farris. The only gun position I could watch was the one up front, and he was raking us at will. Our door guns couldn't swing that far forward, so the gunners concentrated on the flank attacks. As I oscillated left and right, I heard one tick. Then Farris took off just to the right of the forward VC gun with the rest of us hot on his tail rotor. As we crossed the trees, another VC gun opened up, showering tracers through our flight. I pulled up higher than the rest of the flight and made small, quick turns left and right. As we climbed out, all the guns below us converged on our eight ships. I just kept floundering around, believing firmly that Lease was right. Anything you can do to make yourself a bad target is to your benefit. Moments later, we were out of range. Six of the eight helicopters were damaged, and two gunners had been killed. Our ship had taken the one round that had hit us on the ground. Later, checking the angle at which the round had hit the ship, I found that it had hit while I was pedal turning in the low hover. The bullet had come up just beside me at chest level and lodged in the base of the tail boom behind me. I was convinced that my evasive tactics had saved my life. If you had not moved at all, the bullet would probably have missed you altogether, said Nate, back at the rifle range. That particular bullet hit me while I turned right. That means if I hadn't turned, it would have come into the cockpit. But you couldn't know that. It was just luck. Yeah, good luck. But just luck. What if you had turned into a bullet? The same technique could just as easily kill you. He was right, of course but I was convinced that I had actually dodged the bullet. But what about the takeoff? Everybody else got torn to ribbons, I countered. Look, Mason, if it's your turn to die, that's it. You can't control the odds. It just wasn't your day to get zapped. So you're saying I should just sit there and fly smooth and neat with the rest of the flight? I can't do that. I can imagine myself on the ground trying to shoot down a Huey. If one ship in the flight is going nuts like I do, I wouldn't even try to hit it. I'd go for the others. Nate nodded and sipped some coffee. I guess if it makes you feel better, you should do it. But I think you're just pissing into the wind. We learned that one gunner had taken a direct hit in the chest armor he was lucky enough to be wearing, and it had stopped the bullet cold. It reminded me of my near hit which would have got me in the chest, so I got pissed off about the lack of chest protectors in our company. After all the fire we'd taken in the last five months, we still had only a few. We just hadn't lost enough pilots yet. The VC fire in this valley was intense. This was their home, and they were thoroughly dug in. No matter where we flew, we were shot at. In two days, we had had forty-five ships seriously damaged in our slick battalions. The Chinooks in the 228th had been hit, which had not happened much at Yadrang, and had lost ten pilots. We thought the C-130 that crashed and burned at the Anke Pass the day before, killing eighty, had been forced down by ground fire. That night, Nate and I and Morris and Decker rode to the village down the road. I took some pictures of a group of smiling children. We all bought some candles and soap from the little store. On the way back in the rear of the truck, we complained about our lack of chest armor. Morris sat with his arms folded as we bumped along. I talked to a friend of mine, a battalion, he said. He says we should get a load of chest protectors any day now. The truck pulled up beside our mess tent, and as we got out, Decker said, Yeah, any day now. I wonder how fast he'd get them here if he was flying in this shit. The next day, January 31st, we launched another mission. This LZ was named Quebec. 
It was about five miles past Dog. Dog was now a very large staging area where the bulk of our troopers stayed. If any place was secure in this valley, it was Dog. As the twelve ships on this mission crossed the river for the approach, somebody on the right side of the formation took a hit from the friendly village. We hung around on the ground for about an hour, watching the Air Force phantoms as they hit Quebec with tons of bombs and napalm. I sat on the roof of my Huey and watched the show. At the bottom of their passes, the phantoms would mush, and they'd kick in their afterburners to power out. It was a pretty good show. I could have sat there and watched it all day. While all this was going on, I idly watched two grunts walk out to set up a claymore mine a hundred yards in front of us. I had gone through a demolition course in advanced infantry training, so I felt a critical interest. The Claymore mine is shaped like a crescent. The convex side is pointed toward the enemy. It's detonated remotely, blasting millions of small wire pieces that shred its victims. As I watched them anchor it in position, it exploded. Both men, one on either side of the mine, were thrown back, torn, lifeless heaps. What's next in this carnival, I thought. The phantoms finished prepping Quebec, and the air show stopped. We're up, let's go, yelled Williams. Eight grunts jumped on each ship. We cranked, checked in on the radios, and took off. Nate and I followed the number two ship, Morris and Decker. The smoke from the Air Force bombing drifted lazily at Quebec as we flew past to set up an approach to the south. Preacher 6, Antenna 6, head south now. VC automatic weapons on your route. Antenna 6, the colonel, flew overhead. Preacher 6, Roger Wilco. Williams started his turn back to the LZ. Preacher 6, artillery is still preparing the LZ. Be careful. Roger. Preacher 6 now on short final. The LZ was a narrow strip of brushy, dry sand next to the foothills on the west side of the valley. Following previous instructions, we moved into a staggered trail formation. Preacher 6, receiving small arms fire from the west. That was Connors. Yellow flight, this is Preacher 6. Pick your spots. The LZ is rough. Williams was just off the ground in his landing flare. Morris and Decker were 50 feet off, and I was behind them, maybe a 100 feet. Preacher 6, this is Yellow 2. Captain Morris is hit. Captain Morris is hit bad. Morris's ship suddenly dropped fast from twenty feet and landed hard. Yellow Four is receiving fire from the right. There was nothing to see on our right except a long row of dead brush. Captain Morris is dead. Captain Morris is dead. Roger, Yellow Two. This ship is destroyed. I'm getting out. I saw Decker jump out of his Huey as we landed behind him. He leapt to the ground beside the ship, his sawed-off shotgun at the ready. He was faced away from the V.C. Nate called. Preacher 6, Yellow 3, we'll pick up Decker and his crew. Negative, Yellow 3, clear the LZ for the next flight. The grunts were off. Some of them scrambled toward Decker, under fire, and pointed him the right way. The troopers stayed low. Sand kicked up under the V.C. fire. Let's go, Yellow Flight. Williams took off. As I made the takeoff run beside Decker's still-running ship, I glanced into the cockpit and saw Morris sitting in the right seat with his head slumped forward on his chest. He seemed to be taking a nap. Tick. We're hit. Tick, tick, tick. The gunner that had got Morris was getting us. I pulled in a lot of power and climbed for the sky. I climbed much higher than Williams, and at about a thousand feet the engine quit. Silence. I bottomed the pitch. It was my first authentic forced landing, and I was extremely lucky. The spot I was aiming for was the spot I was supposed to land in anyway. It was secure. I skidded ten feet when I hit, and the rotors quietly slowed and stopped. The crew chief was already inspecting the damage before I got out of the ship. Four rounds through the fuel lines, sir. We wouldn't be flying that ship anymore today. Nate and I stood around while the flight returned to Quebec. I don't know about him, but I felt cold and clammy while we stood in the blistering heat. 
Battalion always had at least one maintenance ship on call for situations like ours. It landed in secure areas to determine whether or not a ship could be fixed on the spot. I heard the loud whopping of the Huey as it crossed Dog two miles away. How could anyone be taken by surprise by a flight of Hueys? The thudding slap of the main rotors grew quieter when the ship was a quarter of a mile away, replaced by the buzz of the tail rotor and the hissing whine of the turbine. It landed a hundred feet behind us, starting a brief sandstorm before the pitch was bottomed. The turbine shut off and the rotors spun down. Two specialists, mechanics, ran toward our ship. The crew chief showed them the damage under the engine cowling. They all stuck their noses into the Huey's innards. Leaving them to their work, I walked back to the maintenance Huey to see who was flying. It was Riker. Somebody hurt, said Riker. He did not know about Morris. I stood next to the skid and tried to word what I was going to say while Riker finished freeing himself from the straps. As I began to speak, a painful grin possessed my face. Morris was shot and killed. Riker's face showed a second of shock and despair before he too was possessed by the same animal grin. Really? Morris? Yes, just a few minutes ago, at Quebec. I spoke jerkily as I fought with the expression on my face. How could I be grinning? Riker was having the same problem. His mouth curved into a smile, but his face showed pain. He tried to break the spell by speaking of other things. How bad is your ship? Not bad. Fuel lines were hit. Your ship is okay? He said vacantly. Yep, okay. Where was he hit? Riker said abruptly. The task of maintaining his composure was beyond him, and his face jerked involuntarily into that horrible grin. I don't really know, but I think he got hit in the chest. Yeah? I think so. We were embarrassing each other, so we stopped talking and sat on the sandy grass and smoked a cigarette. The mechanics fiddled with my ship. Nate, who had been watching them curiously, walked over to join us. Bob tell you about Morris? Nate seemed brave and businesslike. Yeah. By the way, is Decker all right? Riker said. He's still in the LZ, said Nate. Really? Why didn't somebody pick him up? There was too much fire, and Decker jumped out and took cover on the ground. Besides, Williams wouldn't let us wait to get him. Why not? Well, he was right. The next flight was right behind us, and we probably would have just got someone else hurt trying to get Decker to the ship. It doesn't seem right just to leave him there. He'll be okay, Nate said. He's got his trusty old shotgun with him. Sir, the ship's not flyable, the mechanic called to Riker. Okay. We all stood up. You guys interested in a ride back to the rifle range for a new ship? You bet, I said. Can't wait to get back into the fight. Nate and Riker smiled at my false bravado. Then Riker said, You guys remember that model he made of the Croaton? Uh-huh. I wonder where it is now. An hour later, Nate and I were back in the air. We joined a flight taking more grunts into Quebec. Decker had got out on the next flight. Late that afternoon, after we had replaced two second lieutenants who had been killed and hauled reinforcements in and wounded out, the grunts finally took Quebec, both sandy acres of it. Two machine guns and ten rifles had been hidden in a long trench under that innocent-looking pile of brush. At twilight, we landed back at the rifle range. Decker was sitting on the end of his cot, elbows on his knees, hands on his cheeks, staring at the dirt. I was glad to see him back. Hey, Deck! Someone stopped me with a shake of the head. I nodded. Instead of walking by him... I went outside and came in through the back flap and sat on my stretcher. Nate, facing me on his cot, was pouring some old granddad into his canteen cup. Want some? Yeah, I think I will. I poured about two inches in my cup and stirred in some water with my finger. We sat there silently. Nate reread one of his letters and I watched Decker. 
Everyone else in the tent talked quietly, keeping a space around the mourning man. He was pale. He looked up once, and his face showed that sad child within. He shook his head and made a weak smile. He auto-rotated. We all looked at him, expecting more, but he was silent. Sherman broke the silence. Morris? Yeah. As he died, he bottomed the pitch for an auto-rotation. But we were too close to the ground, and the ship nosed in and sank up to the canopy. Decker squinted in pain and stopped talking. I was thinking, nosed in? There was nothing wrong with the ship. They'd hit harder than normal, but the ship was just sitting there running when Decker jumped out. Decker continued solemnly. The bullet came in through the triangle window and went through his flak vest like it wasn't there and through his heart. The flak vest stopped it on the other side. He pushed the collective down like he was making an auto-rotation and we crashed before I could stop it. He stopped for a moment. If I had been a little faster, I could have kept us from crashing. You didn't do anything wrong said Sherman. That's what you think. How would you feel if your best friend had just gotten killed and you couldn't even keep the fucking ship from crashing? See, he did the right thing even while he was dying. He set us up for the auto-rotation, but I just wasn't fast enough to save it. But Decker, Morris was already dead. It doesn't matter about the landing, Sherman said. Decker stood up suddenly. He's dead and it's my fault. He grabbed his shotgun and walked outside. Jesus, said Nate. I don't see why he's blaming himself, said Sherman. Morris was already dead, and besides that, the ship didn't crash. We all looked at Sherman. Of course he was right, but nobody wanted to be rational. It was so out of place. The old man said nothing about Morris except that we ought to get some money together for flowers for his wife, but Sherman took it upon himself to give a little speech that night. Well, we've been pretty lucky up to now. It was only a matter of time. The other companies have taken a lot more kills than we have, so it's our turn now. It looks like the overall ratio is one in five. One pilot out of five will get killed. We've only lost two guys, which puts us five away from the average. We've just been lucky. I hated Sherman. Now we were delinquent in our deaths. Running behind in our proper death ratio, were we? Well, we'll just see about that. Come on, you guys. Let's get out there and die. At dawn the next morning, a Chinook landed, dwarfing our Hueys. A deuce and a half backed up to the door ramp and men began loading chest protectors onto the truck. Hundreds of chest protectors. Chapter 8. Bong Shun Valley This country cannot escape its destiny as the champion of the free world. There is no running away from it. General Maxwell Taylor in U.S. News and World Report, February 14, 1966. February, 1966. The beach was slippery red clay. Connors claimed that it was better than the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, you can't slide into the water because of the sand. True. If you sat on this beach without holding onto a bush, you slipped into the warm red water. Stepping toward the center of the pond, your feet accumulated layers of adhesive clay that made it seem like you were touching bottom when you weren't. When I was chin-deep, I stopped to watch the others. Banjo ducked under and disappeared completely, an act of great courage in this slime, to reappear several feet away. Man, how can you stick your head under that shit? said Kaiser. Kaiser, like me, wouldn't go under for anything, but stood chin-deep, soaking in the relative coolness. Banjo only laughed and ducked under again. An old Vietnamese lady laughed at him while she weeded the fields around the pond. Four or five women and two men watched us skinny dip in the buffalo watering pond. The women grinned self-consciously. These naked foreigners were clearly making fools of themselves. 
We interpreted their smiles as friendly approval. An ROK road patrol guarding a bridge a hundred feet away laughed too. I found out later that the Koreans were forbidden to undress around the Vietnamese because it was a sign of vulnerability to be thus exposed in front of your enemy. Nate was sitting on his clothes on the beach, sunning himself, when a cola girl materialized. When he noticed her, he modestly crossed his legs. Cola girls were ubiquitous. They arrived at our loggers carrying cokes in plastic netting. Fifty cents, G.I., by croca crawler. They were inevitably young and cute, so I never bought a Coke. I was convinced the soda was poisoned. Hey, Nate, I can see your pecker, yelled Connors. Nate glanced at him while he declined the Coke and tightened his legs. I'm trolling, wise ass. Hey, so that's how it's done. But the bait is so small. Everyone laughed. I don't know where you get off, Connors. You could play a record with your cock. So you're going to do it? I said. Yeah, you ought to think about it too, said Kaiser. Air America. Who are they? Well, they're supposed to be a civilian helicopter service, but it's a CIA front. How much do they pay? I asked. That's the good part. They guarantee 20000 and the average is 35 Plus you get PX privileges, an airline discount, and 10 days of R&R every month. 20000 I was paid seven. Yeah, and you can join them right now before you get out of the Army. You doing that? Well, I've only got two months left in service, so I'm going to finish up and move to Saigon as a civilian. Kaiser slapped an envelope against his hand. Got the letter today. It's all fixed. What do you think, Mason? You want me to give you the address? Nah. I think I'd rather fly crop dusters in Florida than sneak around with the CIA in Vietnam. You're going to be a CIA agent? Nate said to Kaiser. Not an agent, a pilot. You know, Air America. So you like this line of work, do you? Shit, they never fly assaults. They mostly do courier work and fly radio teams into Cambodia or pick up downed pilots where the army isn't supposed to go. We take a lot more chances than they do, and we do it for peanuts. So why do you think they'd let somebody as stupid as you even get close to their operation? Not all of us are morons, Nate. You'll see. In two months, I'll be pulling in 20 thou for doing a lot less work and for taking a lot less chances than you. Nate set a record on top of a box. In one corner of the box, there was a fold-out tone arm. That's a record player? I said. Yeah. Neat, huh? My wife sent it for Christmas, but it just got here. Music played. You're kidding me, said Kaiser. Puff the magic dragon? I'm sick. He got up and left. Eat your heart out, Kaiser. Nate hummed along with the song. Barber, Wendell's buddy, ducked in through the flap. Mason, you seen Wendell? No. I have. He's over toward the mess tent digging a hole, said Nate. Thanks, Barber left. What's he digging a hole for, I asked. He keeps saying we're going to get hit. I think he's beginning to take Hanoi Hannah seriously, said Nate. Puff the Magic Dragon was making me uncomfortable. It was the saccharine song that had inspired the naming of the murderous Gatling gun-armed C-47s. I couldn't listen. I'm going to check out Wendell. It was twilight, and I could see a small pile of dirt next to the other platoon tent. When I got closer, I saw what looked like a cap sitting on the ground. The cap moved, and Wendell's smile brightened under the brim. Hi, Mason. Hi, Wendell. Nice hole you got there. You think I'm crazy, don't you? No. Really? Wendell tried to hold his chin up at the edge of the five-foot shaft, while his shoulders strained low to reach something on the bottom. A large tin can full of sand squeezed up between his chest and the tight walls. He dumped it on the pile around him. The V.C. love mortars and we have no protection, he said. They say we can't dig holes. We're supposed to use that big gully over there. That gully's too wide. If a mortar round went off in it, you'd have hamburger. That's why I built this like I did. 
I'm below ground level, and I present the minimum target. Pretty smart. Not really. It just looks smart compared to what the morons told us to do. He was referring to the calves' no-digging policy, which was still in effect to keep us from disfiguring the landscape. Sometimes I think this war is being run by a gardener, he added. I walked over to the maintenance area and took a time exposure shot of Reacher and some other guys working on a Huey in the glare of floodlights. Thousands of moths flitted around the lights while Reacher and Rubensky, armed with wrenches and screwdrivers, worked to get the ship flyable for the morning. They did it every night. Our ships were parked in a long row, nose to tail, along with eight or so other Hueys at the rifle range. The rest were invisible in the moonless night. The music was off when I returned, and Nate was asleep. I stripped to my underwear and crawled under my poncho liner. I could not sleep. Why couldn't I be more like Kaiser? Get a job with Air America and get out of all this? Imagine $20,000 a year. Patience had been complaining in her letters about our money problems. We were paying for the new Volvo, a much too expensive bed and dresser set, life insurance, and high rent at Cape Coral. Twenty thousand would sure be a whole new world. But it would have to be in this stinking country. Anything was better than that. A mosquito pierced my arm, but I didn't flinch. A guy I knew in another company was still in Japan living in a hotel while they treated him for malaria. I was jumpy, worried. My nights were getting harder to bear. I thought of jerking off, but it seemed like too much trouble. You had to be very careful because the slightest noise or creak of the bed might cause some wise ass to yell, Hey, I hear somebody fucking his fist. That would cause a few moments of cat calls, which masturbating men use to cover their last quick strokes. So far, I hadn't been discovered. I knew it was only a matter of time. Invariably, my thoughts turned to a problem I had devised when I first arrived. I was mentally designing a clock to be made of bamboo. I had now determined how many gears I would need, how I would slice the bamboo to make the gears, how I could rig an escapement, almost everything I needed. I reviewed the plan, looking for errors. That put me to sleep. Boom! Womp! Womp! Wham! I awoke sitting upright, but not understanding. Very heavy, ground-shaking explosions came from the direction of the rifle range gully. Mortars! Someone yelled. Mortars? Shit! I grabbed my pistol belt and stuffed my feet into my boots. People ran by. Rounds were exploding beyond the sand berm next to the gully. Men were packed into the bottom of the trench. I didn't go in. Wendell was right. If a mortar went off in there, it would be mass murder. I decided to hide somewhere else. I had my pistol out in front of me as I ran. The unlaced boots kept sliding off my feet. My cock kept swinging out of my underwear. Our mortar batteries began shooting back. I heard frantic calls for the pilots assigned to evacuate the ships to get going. I wasn't part of that, so I kept looking for a place to hide. Finally, I rolled under a truck and watched the explosions. They were terrifyingly powerful and random. So far, no rounds had hit inside our compound. I was under the truck for a few minutes before I realized that if a mortar did hit it, the truck would explode, shredding me. I rolled out from under and lay in a shallow depression in the sand. Flares cast swinging shadows around the compound. Fifty caliber tracers seemed to cruise slowly overhead, coming our way, so it must be the V.C., I heard the Hueys running for a long time, but they didn't take off. As the flares went off over the ROK positions, I noticed Wendell's helmet moving around in the middle of his pile of sand. Why was he always right? I heard the sounds of machine guns blasting out of the darkness overhead. Our gunships were on station, shooting streams of tracers into the foothills beyond the ROKs. Still, no mortars had come past the berm next to the gully. Our ships still idled, not taking off. After fifteen minutes, the mortars stopped. Only the familiar sound of outgoing rounds was left. I stood up and tried to dust the sand from my sweating body. My hands shook, 
and I cursed the Viet Cong, the mortars, and the army. The evacuation pilots were returning from the flight line. Listen, asshole, I was assigned 227. What the fuck were you doing in my seat? I heard someone say. The major told me I was supposed to fly it, numbnuts. The ships hadn't got off the ground because too many men tried to squeeze on board. The weight of the pilots and crew chiefs stuffed inside the machines kept them grounded while they argued about who was supposed to be flying. The Koreans had sent out their Tiger teams. They came back with mortar tubes, base plates, and severed VC heads. The Koreans also complained that our gunships had killed some of their men. We came off as a bunch of amateurs compared to the ROKs. For the rest of the night they kept snapping awake as though something were happening, but nothing was. This ends side two of cassette six of Chicken Hawk. Chicken Hawk, cassette seven. Preacher Six, there's a machine gun position on your takeoff path. The guns swooped back and forth in front of us, chattering. Williams was up against the tree line in front of us, so he had to pull the guts out of his Huey to make it over. The gunships were in front of us, circling like sharks, firing down into the jungle. Preacher Six, turn left. You're heading for the machine gun. No answer. Turn left. Turn left. The gunship pilot was losing his cool, as he watched us take off right over the position he'd warned us about. It was a single gun. As we crossed above it, it raked us in the belly. Sir, one of the grunts just got hit, said Miller, the crew chief. The grunt, a black guy, had taken a round in the ass. I heard our gunner, Simmons, yelling incoherently over the noise of the ship. Sir, it's Simmons's brother, Miller said. Preacher Six, I called. We have a wounded on board. We're going to the aid station first. Roger. We landed next to a MASH hospital pod that Sky Cranes had lifted in from the golf course. The medics ran out and loaded the man onto a stretcher. Simmons ran around from the other side of the ship, crying, and hurried alongside the stretcher into the pod. We waited. He came back a few minutes later, his cheeks wet, but he was smiling. The doctors say he'll be okay. He'll be going home, he said to the crew chief. Ah, the proverbial million-dollar wound. Then I remembered that Simmons had discovered another brother at the bottom of a pile of bodies at Play Coup. Neither brothers nor fathers and sons were supposed to be in the same combat theater at the same time. I knew of two people in Vietnam who didn't have to be there. I talked to Simmons after we got back to the rifle range. Yes, sir, I know, he said. So why don't you tell the C.O.? He'll get you out of here. You've lost one brother, and another was just wounded. Your family has done enough. He smiled and said, No, I'm staying. Why? Someone has to do it. He really said that. I thought I was in a movie. Maybe he did, too. The fighting had progressed from the valley floor near the village of Bong Shun north to the narrow An Lao Valley, surrounded by steep mountains. We landed on the valley floor in the rice paddies. The grunts jumping out of the Hueys found themselves slogging slowly for cover next to the paddy dikes. The paddies were tricky. If we landed and loggered for a while, the ships sank up to their bellies in the quagmire, anchoring them. Lease had demonstrated the proper technique for takeoff from such places months before in Happy Valley. You can't just pull up hard and race out of here, he had said. First, you bring the nose up to start releasing the skids, then level the ship and pull up slowly, very slowly, until the skids slide free. If you don't, one skid will leave first, leaving the other still stuck. Then you'll flip over and go crash. Wrestler, having just returned from his R&R, &R, was with me. We landed in a paddy in An Lao to await grunts on their way to our position to be extracted. Once on the ground, each Huey became a kind of island in the rice paddy lake. The heat was sweltering. The humidity was as thick as the mud under us. Helicopter pilots, like cats, were finicky about getting their feet wet. 
That was one of the reasons they were pilots. Grunts got dirty, pilots didn't. So the story went. Anyway, Wrestler and I crawled over the seats, sat in the shade on the cargo deck, and picked and pawed at the sea ration boxes for snacks. When the pace of the action was broken by periods like this, we sometimes compensated by indulging in what the army called grab-ass. That is, we tried to make each other laugh. Hey, how are we going to heat the water for the coffee? asked Wrestler. Here, give me that can. I'll make a stove. Oh, yeah? How are you going to get to the fuel drain? You're right. Let's make Miller get the fuel. No, said Miller. Oh, come on. You want us to be alert, don't you? What if we fall asleep and crash? Wrestler coaxed. You ain't going to fall asleep, and I ain't going to go slogging that shit for the fuel. I looked at Rubensky in the pocket next to his gun. Rubensky, grunts are supposed to love mud. Will you go get some JP4 for me? No, and I ain't a grunt. I was a grunt. Now I'm a gunner. What's the difference? The difference is that a grunt would go get the fuel for you, and I won't. Good point. I glanced up and saw a tin can stove burning on the dike next to the Huey beside us. Hey, you guys, I yelled. Give us some coffee, huh? Get bent, yelled Nate, grinning. Hey, have a heart. I'm nothing without my morning coffee. You're nothing anyway, Mason. Shit, I can't take this whining. I'll go get some fucking fuel. Rubensky jumped out and sank to his knees in the leech-infested bog. Now that's what I like to see. The true determination of an American grunt, I yelled. Gunner, Rubensky yelled back as he slogged heavily toward Nate's ship. When he was just about there, we heard, Crank em! from up front. God damn it! Rubensky turned and slogged back through the morass. Fuck! We cranked and checked in on the radios. The grunts were coming across the paddy, laboring at each step. They were tired and torn, unshaven and grim. Ammo cases clunked wearily on the deck. So did rifles and canteens and helmets. With eight of them in the back, the surface of the deck disappeared under mud and pieces of rice plants. The flight leader gave us the word to go. One by one, the ships wriggled loose from the slime. I rocked the ship back and forth and from side to side as I pulled the pitch. It was especially sticky stuff. The ship in front of us, an attached ship from the snakes, had a new pilot, or an old pilot in a hurry. He jerked up through the mud and promptly flipped over. The rotors hit the paddy, exploding into pieces. The mast came off. Parts flew everywhere. When the Huey stopped kicking, men started climbing out the cargo door, now the top of the bent and muddy fuselage. The command ship overhead told us to leave. He would get them in. When we circled back toward the valley ridge, I saw the command ship and a light gunship land and evacuate the men. I grinned while I imagined what the pilot who had crashed was thinking. We chased Charlie around his valley for more than two weeks, flying too many hours every day. Observed or reported movements of the enemy were immediately countered with air assaults to the spot. The Cavs' 3rd Brigade fought tirelessly and well in this hectic hopscotch war and was chalking up an impressive kill score. The Marines were being misused on the beaches northeast of the war. So far they had not made contact, but a Marine had hurt his foot on a beach assault. Things were getting better for pilots because we were shot at less and less in the secured areas. The big question was whether they stopped shooting because they had been defeated or because they just stopped shooting and became civilians. Colonel Lester of the 3rd Brigade probably wondered about this too. He decided to find out by putting the VC in a position where they would have no choice but to fight because there would be no escape. The VC always knew our exact positions by watching the Hueys. The first stage of his plan was to airlift nearly three battalions of infantry to a crow's foot of seven intersecting valleys, twelve miles south of Bong Shun. Nothing unusual about that, except that once the troops were dropped off, we would not return to support them. Instead, they carried several days' rations themselves 
and operated independently. For three days they deployed themselves throughout the crow's foot silently and without any helicopters flying near them, placing themselves in ambush position for the VC who would be coming their way. Part two called for convincing Charlie that we were landing huge forces on top of the ridges along the long valley that led to the crow's foot. We did this by flying empty ships for two days to normally prepared LZs along the ridge tops. We went in with all the hoopla of a standard air assault on every one of the fake LZs. On short final, the door gunners blasted the bushes. We landed and stayed on the ground for 30 seconds or so, and then left. Later, we'd fly out to resupply these units at regular intervals. We were in on the plan. And the fact that there was a plan was a novelty. So for two days, the VC watched the build-up and decided that things were getting too hot in the valley and began to drift south toward the trap. After the imaginary forces were placed on the ridges, real troops were landed on the valley floor to act as beaters. The beaters ran into occasional Charlie delay teams that sacrificed their lives so that their comrades could make it to safety. During the next few days, we supported these beater troops with hot food and new clothes and the phantoms with counterfeit visits. Life for the grunts in the valley was grim. In a few days, they were reduced to sodden, weary, leech-encrusted men. One company took a break at a particularly scenic spot on the river. A hundred and fifty men stripped themselves of their rotten clothes to bathe in the sandy shoals of the river, leaving a handful of men as security. Charlie was well ahead of them. No one felt the slightest threat of ambush at this delicate moment. Without warning, Charlie opened up. Naked men scattered in all directions as the bullets churned the water. The sentries couldn't see where the shots were coming from. For long minutes, the men were completely exposed. They got to their weapons. The tide of the battle changed abruptly, and Charlie was driven off. I landed next to the riverbank soon after the firefight, and the naked men were still laughing about it. Nobody had been seriously hurt. That was unbelievable, and therefore funny. We dropped off food and sat on the ground for a while, waiting for the men to eat. I'd spent the night with these guys several times. As usual, several grunts gathered around the machine. Some guys asked all sorts of technical questions. How fast can it fly? How long can you stay up on one fueling? Why don't you make all your takeoffs vertically? Do you get scared? Others would stand back and grin knowingly, as people do around race car drivers. Around us, the men were breaking open the boxes of clothes we'd brought. Their old sets, two days old, were literally rotting off their backs. One man pointed at a bullet hole in my door. Where'd that round go? I slid the side armor forward and showed him the crater where the bullet had hit. Damned if that wasn't lucky. Yeah, I'd probably be dead if it hadn't been there, I said. Somebody poked his head inside and exclaimed, do you really use all those dials and switches and stuff? Yeah, but not all at once. We check each one in a pattern. What's that one do? That's the artificial horizon, which shows you where the horizon is when you can't see it, like in bad weather. The soldier nodded and said, I'd sure like to fly one of these. What? You crazy, Daniels? His friend responded. You want to be a fucking target? It's better than being a grunt, asshole. You stay clean. Man, what does that have to do with anything? We get dirty, but we can at least hit the dirt when we're shot at. I mean, haven't you been on enough lifts to get the piss scared out of you yet? Coming into the LZs is the worst part of this fucking war, because you got no cover. If it weren't for the shit, I'd kiss the ground every time I got off one of these birds. Yeah, but I bet when you guys get back to base, those nurses really go nuts for you, don't they? Said Daniels. Our base? I started to tell them that our base was just a pile of sand at Fu Cat, and that I hadn't seen one Caucasian female since I'd been here. Yeah, it is good back at base. I mean, we're just regular guys like you. But it's true, the nurses do get out of control. See, asshole, this is class in case you can't see it. I mean, this takes brains. While we're out here eating mud and fucking fists, 
These guys are sleeping in soft beds and scoring all the nookie they can handle. His friend wasn't impressed. They can have the nookie. Look at them bullet holes. They got them up there in the roof, through the doors and the windshields. This thing is a fucking sieve. I'm staying here on the ground and nurse my poor aching cock back home to my waiting mama. Ah, fucking men, brother, someone agreed. To Daniels, I said. If you'd like to get on one of these ships, they are always looking for gunners. You can volunteer. Yeah, I guess I could. Daniels looked unhappy. But I made it this far like I'm doing. Six months and I'm gone. Well, if you change your mind. Yeah, if I change my mind. Rubensky walked up beside the cockpit. Just found my friend, Mr. Mason. He's in this unit? Yeah, this is my old company. I'm trying to get him to transfer to the 229th as a door gunner. What did he say? He said, yeah. Man, can you see the two of us on the same ship? We would mow, I mean mow, V.C. One of the gunners had to be a crew chief, like Miller. I told him this. Oh, it don't matter. Just having him in the same company would be enough. Him and me went through a lot together in Chicago, and we have plans for when we get back. You know, sir, with the stuff we're learning here, my friend and I could knock off even a bank. Knock off a bank? You're going to rob a bank? I guess that is kind of wimpy. Maybe even a bigger job than a bank. That's why it's so important to have him with me. We can plan the right job. He's the brains and I'm the muscle. I was really surprised that Rubensky was considering a life of crime when he got home. More likely, it was a daydream that kept him going. I laughed. You think I'm kidding? I laughed again. Wait, Mr. Mason. You'll see. Rubensky and McElroy. That's the names to look for, sir. The best. I'll be watching the papers, Rubensky. Great. That's all I ask. Watch the papers. Give us a chance. Rubensky turned around and noticed that the grunts were getting organized. Be right back. He ran toward a group of soldiers. The grunts were dressed in their new uniforms, back in business. They loaded the empty food containers on board along with two guys with minor wounds. When they moved away from our ship, I saw Rubensky hugging one of the grunts in farewell. He ran back to our ship as I cranked up. As the V.C. were driven southward, they moved toward the Crow's Foot in Kim Sun Valley. In that valley, one of the serpentine turns of the river looped back almost upon itself. The piece of land within the loop was the site of a large village. This is L.Z. Bird, Major Williams pointed at the map at our operations tent at the rifle range. North Vietnamese and Viet Cong units are holed up here, and in the jungles north of it. Our assault will be to the village itself. The approach path is across this high ground south of Bird, and there doesn't seem to be any ground fire along that route. Anti-aircraft emplacements are reported at Bird, but the LZ will be thoroughly prepped before we land. After the initial wave is on the ground, some of you will return to the staging area to pick up more troops and take them to the LZ. Good luck. Let's go. As we left to walk to the aircraft, Ressler said, Jesus, sometimes I get the feeling I'm in the middle of a war. What did you think? The war would be over when you got back? I was hoping. God, you should have seen Bangkok. Absolutely precious women, great food, strange sights, and best of all, no shooting. We approached our ship and threw our chest protectors and helmets up front on the seats. Gary did the pre-flight walk around, and I climbed up top to check the rotor hub and mast. Those girls look so cute and so shy. It's really a shock to find out that they love to fuck, he added. Give me a break, I said. The rotors were clean, showing no delaminations. Really? They practically fell all over me. Then I heard him tell the crew chief, Missing a rivet here. Of course, I don't see how it matters with that bullet hole next to it. The dampers were free, and there were no cracks forming in the hub. The Jesus nut safeties were in place, and there were no fractures visible. I climbed back down. Did you get any sapphires? I said. No, I can't tell a good one when I see it. Got laid, though. 
Gary, I will kill you if you don't stop. They've got the biggest eyes you've ever seen. Small, delicate features, small, firm breasts, and tight little pussies. Tight, I sighed, and juicy. Gary cackled and began to walk around to get in. God, I need to go to Bangkok, I muttered. How much? I called to Gary as he strapped in. Free. Free? Yep, and all you can handle. If you can walk when you leave, you weren't trying. Crank em, someone yelled. I climbed into my seat and strapped in. Tonight, wrestler, I will strangle you. He laughed so hard he cried. The fifty-ship gaggle cruised in the cool air on the way to Bird. Gary and I were twentieth or so. We did little talking on the way. It wasn't exactly fear that caused that tickling, queer feeling in my stomach at the beginning of the assaults. At least I wasn't conscious of being afraid. Instead, I concentrated on the radio chatter to see how it was going, shrugged now and then to relieve the stiffness in my neck and shoulders that always seemed to be there, and patted my pistol. As we crossed the ridge, the LZ was visible at the bottom of the bowl. Streams of smoke from the pre-strike drifted up to the top of the valley and blew away. The twenty ships in front of us formed a line descending steeply toward Bird, going down a staircase. Up through that line of Hueys, huge tracers from the anti-aircraft guns streaked silently by. The only sounds of battle came through my earphones as pilots talked. I could hear the chatter of their own machine guns. Crew chief, hit bad. I'm going back. Someone ahead of us radioed. PFC Miller had taken a direct hit in his chest protector, but the shrapnel from the bullet had ripped off his left arm. He would have bled to death if the pilot hadn't aborted. Roger, get him to the hospital pod. A wounded air crewman or great structural damage were the only reasons you could abort. If a grunt was wounded, you kept going. Gary flew. I chanced a few clicks on the camera around my neck while I lightly followed his movements on the controls. I didn't look through the viewfinder. I just hit the shutter a couple of times, shooting blind. I could never understand how tracers appeared to move so slowly. I knew they were going really fast, but they always seemed to be on a lazy flight. Unerringly straight, but lazy. The guys up front did all the work, took the chances, and lost two ships. By the time we got closer, the heavy guns were knocked out by the grunts, leaving only one still blasting away. We landed in somebody's sandy vegetable patch, and the grunts were off, bounding toward the tree line. Gary nosed over, and we were off, gone, away unscathed, back to the beautiful sky where small clouds played in the cool air. You got it, said Gary. I got it. We had to pick up some more troops and return. Gary flipped on the RDF, radio direction finder, and tuned in the station at Quignon. Nancy Sinatra sang, These boots were made for walking. Pretty good reception high like this, said Gary. Fuck you, G.I., fuck you, G.I., fuck you, G.I., came over the radio. Hey, Charlie's got our frequency, I said. Say again, Charlie? Gary broadcast back on the same channel. Fuck you, G.I., fuck you, G.I. Who's calling Charlie? yelled the command ship. Fuck you, G.I., fuck you, G.I., said the oriental voice. I spun the dial on the FM homer, and when the needle nulled, I had the general direction to the transmitter. Coming from the south. Gary called the command ship. We're monitoring a Charlie broadcast from the south. Roger. Fuck you, G.I., the high-pitched voice persisted and then stopped as a Huey turned off in his direction. Little Gook's got some balls, don't he? said Gary. Yeah, I bet they're bigger than he is. If all the Gooks were killed, I hoped that at least this guy survived. Every time I heard his emphatic staccato rendition of Fuck You, G.I., I laughed my ass off. Somebody else pissing into the wind. While the command ships tried to track down the VC radio broadcast, Gary and I flew back to the staging area and loaded more troops. The second landing to the LZ was uneventful. We sat down off to the right of the village compound in some gardens. We were told to shut down 
and wait to carry trophies captured in the battle. Chinooks were slinging in artillery as we walked over to the newly captured, destroyed village. Once swaying palm trees were now obscene sticks, standing awkwardly above the pall that covered the craters and burnt hooches. I saw no living Vietnamese. VC bodies were piled near a bunker. Some were missing limbs and heads. Others were burnt, facial skin drawn back into fierce, grotesque screams. A VC gunner was lying below his anti-aircraft gun with one arm raised, chained to his weapon. American soldiers were policing the dead for weapons and piling what they found in a growing heap. Most were smiling with victory. Wood smoke from the hooches mixed with the stench of burnt hair and flesh. The sun was hot and the air was muggy. At the river's edge, some grunts were playing with basket boats, woven boats six feet in diameter. The men kicked and splashed like kids. The villagers had used the boats for fishing. Now, of course, there were no villagers. Across the river, a giant water wheel still turned. It was about twenty-five feet in diameter, five feet wide, and built entirely of bamboo. Around the edge of the wheel, arranged so that they were always horizontal, long tubes of bamboo, closed at one end, filled with water at the bottom of the wheel, and emptied at the top into a trough that carried the water to the fields. The total rise of the water was over twenty feet, and it splashed steadily into the trough, oblivious of the fate of its builders. A grunt in the river grabbed it, trying to stop it. It pulled him out of the water. He let go ten feet up. Immediately another grunt grabbed the wheel and hung on tight. He was carried slowly up and over the top and back to the river. Two grunts tried it simultaneously, and the wheel slowed, almost stopped, but carried them up and over. When three guys tried it, the wheel pulled them all out of the water before it stopped. They cheered. Victory! I examined one of the basket boats. The weave was so tight and precise that it stopped water. There was no caulking between the flat strands, yet the boat did not leak. Both basket and wheel were built from material found growing around the village. I wondered how our technology was going to help the Vietnamese. Maybe after we had killed off the people, like these villagers, who knew how to live so elegantly in this country, the survivors would have to have our technology. That water wheel was as efficient as any device our engineers could produce. The knowledge that built it was being systematically destroyed. We stayed at Bird for an hour. I stared at the wheel and the men playing with it, wondering who the barbarians were. When we left, I could see where the water was being pumped, no humans walked the field that it irrigated. No crops grew. The water was filling bomb craters. Instead of going out on the assaults the next day, Gary and I were assigned to fly a special team of radio intelligence people to track down the VC, who were still broadcasting over our frequencies. Intelligence had determined that an NVA general was radioing messages to his men, uninhibited by our presence. The brass was determined to get this general. Special teams of troopers were on standby. The four men in the team got in the back with their huge tracking antenna. We flew courses up and down the valleys at their direction. One of the men slapped another on the shoulder and called me on the intercom. Okay, turn to course 180. We've got the little fucker. Troopers were launched, encircling the triangulated location. They found burning campfires, some miscellaneous equipment and food, but no radio, no VC, and no general. Okay, come back to course 270, said the head of the radio tracking team. Gary was flying, so I turned back around to watch them. They looked pissed. What's up? I asked. That gook general is broadcasting again, and he's laughing. They swung the cross-shaped antenna back and forth. We changed course a number of times before they once again had the general's location. While we went back for fuel, another team of troopers was sent in. Back in the air, we learned that once again the site was found empty except for evidence of a hasty departure. 
The men in the back were shaking their heads. One of them said to me, That's fucking amazing. That gook is a fox. After another two hours of crisscrossing the valleys, the general allowed himself to be discovered again. What in hell was he doing it for? Again, the team was sent in. Again, it discovered a hastily abandoned campsite. The mission was canceled at dusk and rescheduled for the next morning. The general played this game for two more days until it no longer mattered. A CAV infantry company captured an NVA colonel. He talked, revealing the location of the headquarters the general had been trying to save. The spot, called the Iron Triangle, was in the opposite direction. The general had been leading us away from the nest. He was never heard again. The Iron Triangle was taken after two days of fierce battles. Everyone thought that was it for Charlie in Bong Shun Valley, but the fighting continued. Soon afterward, Gary and I heard the familiar sing-song message from our old friend. Fuck you, G.I., fuck you, G.I. It was like trying to eradicate crabgrass. Kaiser stared ahead, his shoulders sagging. He could have been a player on a losing football team, but he was a tired pilot flying a helicopter. I smoked a Pall Mall and leaned against the door to rest my aching back. We had been flying assaults for more than eight hours, no breaks, and were headed back to the rifle range. Yellow two, Preacher six. Roger, Preacher six. Go ahead. Roger, come up on two six niner and do whatever you can for the man. Roger, I replied. Kaiser shook his head while I tuned in the grunts. Yellow two, Wolverine one six. We're under heavy mortar attack and we've got some serious wounded to get out. Roger, we'll be there soon. What are the coordinates? The lieutenant read off six digits, and I plotted him on my map. He was only two miles away. I pointed to the map, and Kaiser changed course without saying a word. I leaned against the door and flipped my cigarette out the window. Maybe it would clear the jungle. It was easy to find the guy for all the smoke that filled his clearing. Other than the smoke, I couldn't see any action. Yellow 2, we are clear. I repeat, we are clear. The mortars have stopped. Roger, we're coming in. Just like that. Neither of us thought about the fact that the unit was trapped and circled. The mortars could start again any time. Neither of us cared. We approached the clearing in the shadows and Paul, with the setting sun ahead of us. Even while Kaiser brought us over the tall trees, I felt no adrenaline. I sat up and squared my shoulders, put my hands on the controls, but I felt no anxiety. Rubensky fired suddenly into the trees to our right. Get him? I asked. I don't know for sure. That's nice. Kaiser brought us to the ground with scarcely a bounce. The clearing was a miniature meadow surrounded by tall trees. The grass was short, like it had been mowed. I stared out the canopy. Across the lawn, ten men lay dead in a neat line. One man's abdominal cavity was emptied around him, his remaining arm buried under his own guts. Another man seemed to be sleeping unscathed in the shady meadow. I stared at him while the grunts scurried toward us carrying five men. Ah, I thought, as I noticed the pale gore behind his head. Not sleeping, brains blown out. Two torn men were loaded on the back before the mortars returned. As the mortars struck, the grunts hit the dirt, carrying their wounded with them. Oh, shit, I thought. Another delay. I noticed that there was a lot of orange light inside the explosions, silhouetting clumps of black dirt at the bottom of the funnel of expanding gases and shrapnel as mortars exploded a hundred feet away. The grunts must have been as tired as we were. After the first few rounds, they got up and loaded the three other wounded while the mortars continued bursting ahead of us. I looked back as the last man was lifted onto the deck. He was missing a leg below his knee. A tourniquet kept the blood mostly stanched. Rubensky blasted the tree line on our right flank. How long had he been doing that? That's it, Yellow Two. Watch out for a machine gun ahead of you. Kaiser lifted the collective. I radioed. Roger. A mortar exploded at two o'clock, fifty feet away. 
Kaiser pulled the ship's guts so hard that the RPM warning siren screamed in our ears. He let off enough pressure to silence the alarm and turned left to avoid a machine gun the grunts had warned us about. As we crossed the edge of the meadow, I heard Rubensky's gun blasting away, and then tick, tick, tick. Ah, must be another machine gun. I nodded to myself. Three rounds passed harmlessly through the sheet aluminum and lodged in the hell hole. It was peaceful again. I lit another cigarette and watched the sunset. You guys really impressed that grunt commander, said Nate, back at the rifle range. I heard he's putting you in for a DFC. Wrong metal, said Kaiser, already drunk. It should be the I don't give a crap metal with a V device for valor. After we dropped off four wounded men at LZ Dog, Banjo and I, Daisy and Gillette, found ourselves returning to the rifle range at night. Daisy led the flight and decided to climb to about 2,500 feet and have the radar at Dog vector us back to the rifle range. I had used radar vectoring only once or twice during the instrument training phase of flight school. I wasn't familiar enough with it to want to use it. It wouldn't even have occurred to me to do anything but fly a compass course back. Daisy was nervous about flying into a mountain, but if we stayed away from the ridge to the west, we were well clear of the mountains. So Banjo flew in formation with Daisy as he climbed up in a spiral above Dog. Preacher flight, take up a heading of 170 degrees, said the radar station. This station was a four-by-four-foot box on the back of a trailer. It was olive drab. Daisy turned to the heading, and Banjo skillfully turned with him. We found it easier to fly very close, so close that we could see the red cockpit lights of the other ship. At this distance, you can hear the buzz of the tail rotor beside you. Preacher flight, called the radar guy. I have lost you. Lost us? We had been on course for all of two minutes. At the same moment, we lost sight of Daisy's ship as we flew into the clouds. It really was dark, no up, no down. Which way was Daisy flying, left, right, up? Yellow two, I am breaking off to the left, called Daisy. Roger, Banjo said. He turned to the right. I watched the compass. We were turning right on around to the north, then to the west. West was where the mountains were. Hey, Banjo, we don't want to go west, I said. I know. Okay. I waited for him to change course, but he didn't. Instead, he was diving. The airspeed indicator was up past 120 knots. The vertical speed indicator, VSI, showed we were going down at over 1,000 feet a minute. Banjo, we're diving. I feel fine. Look at the airspeed. He did, and the ship slowed back to 90 knots, normal cruise. The VSI was showing a slight climb. Where was Daisy? Yellow two, yellow one. We are descending to get out of the clouds. Recommend you do the same. I could just see it. Daisy wallowing around in the muck, trying to find the bottom of the cloud bank that ends right where a mountain begins. I could see the two of us trying to do this together and colliding before we hit the mountain. Banjo, don't do it. Keep climbing. We'll pop out at the top and shoot for Quignon. Daisy says to descend. Daisy doesn't know shit. Descend into what? Where exactly are we right now? Over the valley? Or are we over the mountains? Okay, we'll climb. Do you want me to fly? No, I'm okay. Then could you come back to a south heading? Banjo began a turn in our featureless world. You can feel changes while flying in the blind, as when Banjo started his turn but after the bank is established, you can't tell it from straight and level flying. Banjo was staring straight ahead into nothingness, and the ship was diving again. Banjo, the VSI. He said nothing, but he stopped the dive and began a climb again. I watched my set of instruments, monitoring Banjo. I wished that Gary was flying, or that I was. Banjo had gone through flight school years earlier, when helicopter instrument flying was not taught. Gary and I had completed instrument training at Fort Rucker in the Huey. Banjo was an old salt with lots of time. In his mind, I was still the rookie. 
we were diving again. Banjo, if you keep diving like this, we'll get into a world of shit. The ship rocked back as he stopped the dive, but he was now turning to the west. Compass, I said, sounding like my old instrument instructor. Compass! He stopped the turn but started to dive again. Airspeed! The airspeed indicator will tell you immediately if you're climbing or diving. If the airspeed increases, you are diving. Obviously, Banjo was too proud to say he didn't know what the fuck he was doing, especially to me. I had to talk him through this. Ninety knots, I said. That airspeed would keep us in a climb. Now he was turning again. Compass, he corrected. It's true, I thought. The FAA had tested experienced pilots in flight simulators to see if they could somehow fly seat of the pants with no visibility. A hundred percent of them crashed. God, I would love to see something. What if the cloud goes to twenty thousand feet? Can't go higher than ten or twelve thousand without oxygen. Probably it's clear over the ocean. Yeah, go over the ocean and come back under the stuff. Banjo, head farther east. The altimeter read four thousand feet. Jesus, it's got to end soon. Mason, what if this shit doesn't end? said Banjo. I think we should drop back down like Daisy. No. What do you mean, no? I'm the aircraft commander. No, don't let down. You don't know where you are. Just a few hundred feet to go. I'm sure of it. Airspeed! We had lost 500 feet while we talked. Banjo wrestled with the Huey for a minute while I coached. Soon we were back in the climb, passing 4,000 feet for the second time. I'll take it to 5,000. If it's not clear by then, I'm heading back down. I said nothing. The idea of letting down blind over mountainous terrain put me into a panic. It is correct to climb, I told myself. Airspeed! I shrieked, letting some of the panic come through. Damn it, Banjo! Watch the airspeed! Keep us climbing! Then I calmed myself and said, Banjo, you sure you don't want me to fly this last little bit? No, I'll fly. You just watch the instruments. Okay, I'll watch the instruments. Five thousand feet and more nothing. I'm going back down, he said. Wait, I yelled. Keep climbing. We're almost there. Besides, we're heading for the sea and the clouds end there, so we can't lose by climbing, but we can lose by descending. You understand? God damn it, said Banjo. He maintained the climb. I blinked. Spots before my eyes? Stars? Yes, stars. At nearly six thousand feet, we broke through. The crew chief and gunner cheered. We all cheered, even Banjo. The universe was back, warm and twinkling. We could make out the jewels of light from Queen Yon. By the time we landed, we were very angry at Daisy. He was the one who'd got us into that shit. Had we just flown a normal contact path back to the rifle range, We would never have been put into instrument flight. Banjo would not have been found lacking. I wouldn't have had to talk him through the weather. We saw Daisy as we walked in from the flight line. He had a sandwich from the mess tent. Banjo walked up to him. You dumb shit, he yelled. Daisy jumped back. You almost got us killed. Captain attacked by chief warrant officer. He backed away. Look, Banjo, all you had to do was descend to the valley like I did. Brilliant, Daisy. No one ever descends over mountains in weather, you dumb shit. I knew where the valley was all the time, said Daisy. You liar. I walked past them into the tent. Ferris wanted to know what all the excitement was about. Daisy decided to have the radar at Dog vector us back and led us into a cloud bank. So what's the problem? The radar lost us in the clouds and Daisy told us to descend. So? So neither of us knew where we were, over a valley or a mountain. So what did you do? asked Ferris. Banjo and I climbed until we broke through at six thousand. So why are you mad? I'm mad because if we had followed Daisy's orders, we could have bought it. It pisses me off to have leaders like him running loose. So you found out that even leaders make mistakes. Yeah, I guess that's it. If you classify Daisy as a leader, I'm more inclined to call him a moron that happens to be a captain. Farris nodded and gave me an understanding smile. 
Well, I'm going to finish this letter. See you in the morning. As I tried to sleep, I kept wondering why I felt so miserable. I kept jerking suddenly awake for no apparent reason. It seemed like I did that all night. This ends side one of cassette seven. I kept hearing ricochets and ducked every time I did. Farris saw this and smiled. Farris did not duck. What the fuck is that? I said. It's nothing. Don't worry. Nothing doesn't ricochet. I wasn't exactly worried. I was mostly irritated. We were in the middle of another long lager in another ruined garden. Twenty bored helicopter crews sprawled, hunkered, or wandered around the machines, sweating their brains out. When the whining bullets sounded overhead, faces tracked them across the sky. Adjacent to our lager was a village. From where we were parked, you could not see the huts for the trees, over a hundred feet tall. A trail led into the dark green lushness. I decided to follow it. In just a few steps, I was in another world, dark and cool under the canopy of green. The well-worn, clean path led to a kind of courtyard and stopped. A hundred feet above me, a small circle of light broke through the trees. I turned to look behind me for the inevitable bunch of people, the Hey G.I. You crowd. No one anywhere. I stepped up on a kind of sidewalk that connected the hooches. I looked in the door of the first hooch. Nobody was home. I leaned in cautiously. Somewhere in my brain a voice warned me to watch for booby traps, and saw that the cooking fire at the back of the hooch was glowing. I looked around outside again. Nobody. I walked to the next door, leaned inside and met a face that had been hiding against the wall next to the door. The face was a woman's. She was smiling, her forehead wrinkled in worry. From behind her black pajama pants peered a small boy. She bowed slightly and said something to me and then called out to someone. I stepped back outside nervously, wondering why the fuck I was here alone. The woman and boy followed me out, smiling and bowing nervously. Behind me I heard another voice. I turned quickly and saw an ancient lady in black limping across the courtyard. She smiled, showing black teeth. I didn't remember any words in Vietnamese except numbers. I didn't know what to say except, You Viet Cong? Suddenly the three of them pointed outside the village. Viet Cong! I wanted to ask them where their men were, but I didn't know the words. Finally, I did the American thing and took their photograph. I began to feel self-conscious with the three of them huddled fearfully on their sidewalk. I explained to them that I was just looking around and that I was going on along the trail. I waved goodbye. The trail led to another identical courtyard. No one was home here either. I found some cooking fire still hot, but everybody had obviously beat a hasty retreat. Alone in one of the hooches, I touched the wattle walls and sat in a net hammock. Above me, the exposed bamboo rafters and beams looked well made. The floor was clean, even if it was made of dirt. Not a bad place, actually. Certainly it was a lot better than the tent I slept in. It was not the average American home, but I doubt that the inhabitants paid much of a mortgage. I walked farther into the village under the trees, passing a suspicious pile of rice stalks that probably hid the entrance to underground bunkers and tunnels. I could have gone over and checked. I could have grabbed my pistol and committed suicide, too. They both would have amounted to the same thing. The last hooch I examined was the home of a master carpenter. I discovered his box of tools. Inside the box, about the size of a small suitcase, scores of tools rested in neat compartments. Yellow brass gleamed. Shiny steel edges glinted. Knurled hardwood knobs held planing blades tight in their handles. All manner of carving tools reposed in their own boxes. The wide selection and the quality of their tools told me that these people, or at least this person, were definitely not savages. I had never heard of a gook or a sloped or a slant eye or a dink who did anything but eat rice and shit and fight unending wars. 
these tools and that water wheel convinced me that there was a successful way of life going on around us. But all we saw were savages, backward savages fighting against the communist hordes from the north. Why were all the men of this beautiful village gone just when the Americans were right outside? Wouldn't people under attack by the communists welcome the men who were there to save them? Or was I seeing the wrong way? Maybe the only people who wanted us around were the Saigon politicians who were getting rich by having the Americans here. This village was a long way from Saigon, and the people weren't rich. They were just people. The carpenter had made a bench whose parts fit so well that it didn't need any nails to hold it together. It was so precisely made and so in tune with the materials that made it that it held itself together without aid. I saw this as an enlightening symbol of the true nature of the Vietnamese people, so I stole the bench. I carried it on my shoulder back up the trail, past the rice stalk pile, past the two courtyards, past the still smiling women, and back out into the sunshine of the sandy garden. I walked over to my helicopter and put the bench in the shade of the rotor, sat down and said, Look, no nails. I shifted back and forth to put strain on the bench to show that it did not move. Kaiser came over to see. See, they put this together so well it doesn't need nails, I said. That's because they have to. Dumb gooks don't know how to make nails, said Kaiser. We had been away from the golf course for more than a month when it was hit in a mortar attack. Several people were killed, fifty or so were wounded, and several Hueys were shredded. But that didn't interfere with the scheduled appearance of Ambassador Lodge, who showed up the next day to dedicate our division compound officially as Camp Radcliffe. It was too late. The name had become the golf course, and we were stuck with it. Don't worry about McElroy. He can take care of himself, said Rubensky. McElroy's platoon had been encircled, and we could not get to them. Charlie had set up some anti-aircraft guns on the hillsides around the platoon, and somebody had already died trying to fly past them. We waited in the dark at dog for the Air Force to bomb the emplacements. Of course, I said. But what does being able to take care of yourself have to do with surviving a Viet Cong ambush? If you knew McElroy, you'd know he'll do just fine. Rubensky's scarred face brightened in a crooked smile. He once told me that he almost did not get into the army because of all the old fractures in his skull, part of the growing up process in Chicago. Listen to this plan, he said. McElroy's plan. Not the bank job idea. No, no measly bank job. That's the point. McElroy has a mind. So what's the plan? Lake Tahoe. Jesus. Wait a minute, sir. Give me a chance. You want to rob Lake Tahoe? Just listen. Then tell me if you see any bad spots, okay? Go ahead. I'm not going anywhere for a while. The target is a casino at Tahoe. Now, McElroy has seen this, but he doesn't know yet exactly how often each week they do it. Collect the take from the machines and tables. We'd have to case the place for a while to get the times straight. Anyway, they collect all the loot in garden carts and haul it outside to an armored car. They got guards all around, but for a minute or so, millions of dollars is just sitting there waiting to be scarfed up. So, all you have to do is walk past a bunch of guards. Wait, sir, let me tell you, Rubensky said eagerly. We use gas, like we do here. Three of us wait in ambush and pop the gas when the loot is outside. Then, as we go into the gas to get the carts, you come in with a Huey and land on the road in the smoke. Me? How did I get into this plan? It's got to be you, Mr. Mason. I've seen you do stuff like this a hundred times. See, that's the genius of McElroy's plan. We take the stuff we learn here and put it to good use back home. You see? Yeah, I see you flying all over the place trying to figure out where to park a Huey load of money without raising suspicion. That's the best part, he continued. When we drop the CS, a vomit-inducing agent, nobody is going to stick around who doesn't have a mask. We also pop a bunch of smoke to cover the loading and the takeoff. 
We get off with everybody on board and head away low level. We fly for a hundred miles to a lake McElroy knows about. There's a cabin there where we can stash the money and where we can stay for six months while things cool off. Nobody's going to notice a Huey parked out on the dock? Oh, yeah. We take the Huey, stolen from the National Guard, out over the lake and ditch it. Then we hang around for six months thinking about how to spend over a million dollars each. Can you imagine? It's a classic plan, all right. I knew you'd like it. I didn't say I liked it. I said it was classic. The stars were bright enough to see a man running from ship to ship, a shadow. At the next ship, we could hear him asking for Rubensky. Rubensky called that he was here and jumped out to meet the shadow halfway. Some people had died in the ambush. McElroy was one. Rubensky came back and sat in the pocket by his gun and cried. Choking sobs filled the Huey. I stared out into the black night and shed tears for McElroy, too, and I didn't even know him. I can't believe anybody'd be dumb enough to walk into a tail rotor. I know. And a grunt who'd been on a bunch of assaults, too. We laughed. It was funny now, on the back of the truck, heading toward Quignon. But last night, when we returned from Dog, a grunt had walked right into the spinning tail rotor of the ship in front of me. I almost resigned. It was too much. I could not stand the idea that somebody could get killed by a Huey after the same Huey just saved his life. I was pulling off my helmet as the ship whined down when I saw the guy rush around from the side door of the ship. Before I could even think of saying stop, he was driven to the ground. The tail rotor had hit him on the head. Thud. Down. I didn't resign. There was a trick ending. The guy wasn't dead. His helmet saved his life, leaving him with only a bad concussion and some cuts. The dumb fuck is probably on his way home right now, said Kaiser. He deserves it, said Connors. Anybody that is still alive after that should get a medal and a plane ticket home. This truck ride was the first break in a month for the six of us. Other groups of pilots had got into Quignon, and now it was our turn. Whether by accident or plan, I was with the usual bunch. Connors, Banjo, Kaiser, Nate, and Wrestler. Farris was also with us, to make sure we came back. The twenty-mile drive from the rifle range at Fou Cat to Quignon took nearly two hours on a bumpy causeway through unending rice paddies. Every so often, an island village punctuated the causeway. You'd think the fucking army could squeeze one fucking ride in a Huey for a bunch of its ace pilots, said Connors. No ships available. Too many down for maintenance, replied Farris, the army spokesman. We parked the truck where the traffic got thick and hired a kid to watch it for us. Then we wandered down the street, looking to be entertained. Connors was stopped by an MP. Sorry, sir. You have to have your sleeves rolled above the elbow, said the MP. What? Connors said. Your sleeves, sir. You have to have them rolled up above the elbow. You're kidding, right? No, sir. Connors glared at the MP. We all did. None of us had our sleeves rolled up high enough. What if I like my sleeves just like they are? Then I'll be forced to arrest you, sir. You would arrest me for not having my sleeves rolled up? Yes, sir, those are my orders. Tell me, Connor said quietly, do you know that there's a war going on? Yes, sir, of course I know there's a war going on. Then why the fuck do you care how high my sleeves are? The MP flinched. I don't care, sir, but if I don't enforce the dress codes, I get my ass in a sling. Ah, you get your ass in a sling if my sleeves aren't rolled up above my elbow. Now you're making sense. Connors started rolling his sleeves. See, gentlemen, it's not this specialist's personal perversion that makes him look for sleeve abuse during wartime. It's the personal perversion of his rear echelon boss. Connors nodded grimly. Right, specialist? That's right, sir. Everybody looked pissed off, but we rolled our sleeves up. Damn, I keep forgetting that the army goes on like normal while we're away, Gary said, 
voicing our thoughts as we strolled down the bustling street. While we were still in sight of the truck, Ferris told us to meet him back there at 1600 hours, to which we reverently agreed. Kaiser had been here before. What we need to do first, gang, is to go get a steam bath so we won't repel the lovelies. Ah, the lovelies, Connors swooned. You'll need more than a steam bath, Connors, said Banjo. I love the lovelies. Like plastic surgery, Banjo continued. I had always liked the idea of a steam bath, but it wasn't what I expected. It was hot, way too hot to enjoy. I was forced to the floor to breathe the mythical cooler air there two minutes after I had closed the door to the steam room. This is fun. After two more minutes, when I was sure I was passing out, I practically crawled outside to the massage table. A middle-aged Vietnamese man positioned me carefully on the table, and began to wreak oriental vengeance upon my occidental body. Good, no, he said, as he slammed on my back. You will like this! I winced as he pulled my elbows beyond my head. He continued for some minutes. He leaned over quietly and said, You want blowjob? No, I said quickly, embarrassed. I can have girl come here give number one blowjob. I was relieved to know that it was a girl he was talking about, but I wasn't interested. No, thanks anyway. Yes, you do, Mason, I heard Kaiser's voice beyond the partition. You owe it to yourself to enjoy the best each place has to offer. The best this place has to offer is Nancy and her magic lips. The Vietnamese masseur nodded expectantly, but I said no. He shrugged and started beating me up again. We wandered around, shopping and drinking, more or less as a group, for a couple of hours. I began to lose track of my position. I was somewhere in the heart of Queen Yon, on a sunny street, off a sunny street. Four of us were sitting around a table at a wonderful little bar on the lovely sunny street, talking to beautiful little girls who wanted to fuck us blind. Kaiser belted back more booze while he tried to get a laughing girl to pay him for his services. Gary blushed and talked to an image of a sweetheart. Nate became a sober intellectual as he discussed world affairs with a nodding woman. I drank and watched everything that happened in this sunny, wonderful bar. I never knew just how good bourbon could be. Secret? I said, alerted by the words and face of a girl who had become my confidant. Where? She pulled me to her to whisper the secret. Laughter broke out when Kaiser's girl compromised and announced she would fuck him for free, just like he had said she would. Ah, it's so wonderful here with all these lovely people. But if it's a secret, why are you taking off your clothes? Aha, be witty and she'll love you, the girl grimaced as her pants caught her foot. Haste clouded her face with worry. Magically, my clothes were gone too. She flinched once when I entered her, but maintained an admirable state of concentration while she waited for me to finish floundering out my months of pent-up lust. She didn't have to wait long. Soon I was being led back to the bar, where I raved about how wonderful it was to get laid by these wonderful sunny people. "'Ain't it the truth?' slurred Kaiser. "'Ain't these little honeys the best little honeys there are, huh?' "'It's the truth!' said Nate, hitting his forehead on the table for emphasis. From this point the events grow faint. We spent the rest of the afternoon wandering the streets and drinking. By the time we remembered Ferris and found our way back to the jeep, we were an hour late. We got lost, Kaiser explained. Right, let's go, Ferris said brusquely. Unfortunately, after the two-hour drive back to the rifle range, I was stone sober. We bounced along the causeway, watching village after village go by, until finally a sandy, greenish tent city appeared. Ah, I thought, home at last. Chapter 9 Tension Army infantrymen, marines, and helicopter crews suffer highest losses in Vietnam. 
U.S. News and World Report, March 21, 1966. March 1966. I stood with thirty enlisted men on an apron at the airport at An Kay. Sweat dripped down my sides, staining my khakis. We watched airplanes move around the airport, trying to determine which one was going to take us to Saigon. A silver C-123 transport had taxied out to the center of the field and then shut its engines off. An army caribou taxiing toward us locked one brake and swung around, bathing us in a hot breeze that evaporated the sweat. This was our plane. The rear end of the silver C-123 opened. Four men got out and walked toward us. The rear end of the caribou opened. The crew chief walked down the ramp, eyeing us, the eager groundlings, suspiciously. Up through the fuselage I could see the pilots in the cockpit. One of them noticed my wings and nodded hello. The men from the silver plane got close enough for us to see they were brass. One army, three navy. The crew chief started to tell us to get on board. The pilot waved to him. He carried his clipboard up front to confer. The brass were closing fast. The one up front was very tall, very big, wore stars, and had his arm in a sling. I racked my brain. Who is very big, wears stars, rides around in silver airplanes, and has his arm in a sling? Isn't that Westmoreland? A private behind me asked. Right. Westmoreland, the ruler of Vietnam, was only a hundred feet away, heading for us. I turned around, looking for a lieutenant or a captain to take charge of this mob and call attention and all the stuff you're supposed to do when the fucking general shows up. My search revealed that I was the ranking person there. Octant! Hut! I yelled. A wall, overnight, bags and laundry sacks hit the dirt as the mob dropped everything to come to attention for the general. He liked that. When I turned around, Westmoreland was nearly on top of us, still marching, smiling, probing for eye contact with the skinny warrant officer who just then flipped a perfect salute. I held the salute until he stopped and returned it. The general and his admiral friends stood facing me and thirty grunts. At ease, Mr. Mason, the voice boomed. He stood close enough to read my name tag, so close that he seemed much taller than he already was. What other rank could they make a guy like this? He had to be a general. Mr. Mason, he began in a conversational tone. My friends and I are on important business, and my airplane just broke down. His airplane? All the airplanes were his airplanes. Also, all the helicopters and all the ships... Westmoreland owned everything, even the cannon fodder he was talking to. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Thank you. Well, Mr. Mason, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take this airplane of yours so I can get these important gentlemen back to their ships on time. The admirals smiled at the joke. If it's okay with you, as he said it. Yes, sir, of course. Absolutely. My plane is your plane. Thank you, Mr. Mason. He smiled a straight smile in a square jaw, while a knowing glint flashed in his eyes. Now, if you could move these men out of the way, we really have to get going. Yes, sir! I turned around and gave the command. Move out of the way! There was some confusion as the men grabbed their stuff and backed away. The admirals walked up inside the plane and sat in three of the thirty-five seats. Westmoreland turned back to say, Thanks again, Mr. Mason, and I hope this doesn't make you too late for... Where was it you were going? R&R, sir. Ah, R&R. There'll be another plane very soon. Times, recent man of the year, walked inside to join the admirals. The four men sat in the cavernous interior of the caribou. The crew chief, looking like he had just been given a couple of grades of rank, pushed the button that raised the ramp and sealed the ship. The prop wash hit us, and the airplane moved away, got smaller, and leapt into the sky. Behind me, the dusty mob spoke. Gee, I hope they ain't crowded in there. You can't mix enlisted and brass too close, you know. Why the fuck not? The vapors from the enlisted men make them tarnish. 
I considered myself very fortunate indeed to be on an airliner cruising smoothly toward Taiwan. My sweat had dried in the air-conditioned plane, and I nursed a drink served by a stewardess. As I stared out the window at the sea, I knew that Ressler and the rest of the gang were at this very moment trying to get rid of the rat turds and mildew in our GP. I had to smile. We had returned from Bong Shun just two days before. The VC had suddenly given up or disappeared. After forty-one consecutive days in Bong Shun Valley, high body counts were announced. Victory was ours. Let's go home. We couldn't just fly back casually after forty-one days away. We had to do something dramatic. We were, after all, the first team. The hundred Hueys moved into trail formation at the Anke Pass and snaked around the sky, trying to spiral to a landing at the golf course. The guys on the ground said we looked really impressive. They couldn't hear the chatter, everybody yelling about how fucked up the formation was, how we were bunched up, fussily worrying about how we looked to the rest of the cav. The hundred ships landed, causing a storm at the golf course. The crews walked to their tents. Once again, the rats had prevailed. Their turds were lined up in comfortable disarray, which bespoke rats truly at home. Mildew coated everything. Black shapes with shining eyes darted for cover as we reoccupied the tent. We've got to kill these fucking rats, yelled Connors. I was smiling stupidly when the stewardess asked, Care for another drink, sir? Huh? Oh, yeah. Connors's exasperation always delighted me. Once, when he came back from a night out, he drunkenly explained that the tent flaps should be down, not up. He sat in the dark on his cot and loudly enumerated the faults in leaving the flaps up. Then he pulled the rope near him that released the flap. It had filled with water. When it unrolled, gallons of water poured over Connors and drenched his bed. He launched into a series of curses, filled with rage and fury. He also lent me a hundred dollars for my R&R. Just before our assault the day before, Connor said, Mason, be real, real careful, okay? I always am. Yeah, but you've never been worth a hundred dollars to me before. By the time we landed in Taipei, I was feeling very good. Uncle Sam, in his great wisdom provided all necessities for his warriors. Just follow the line. In Saigon, we had lined up for various cities, Taipei, Bangkok, Sydney, others. The attraction of each city was the same, drinking and fucking, or fucking and drinking, depending on your morals. As we deplaned, a smiling government employee directed us to a bus. The bus cruised the streets while a man gave us a rundown of various hotels indicating prices and location. I elected to stay at the King's. When the government dropped us off at the hotel, the Chinese civilian half of the team swung into action. A kindly, knowledgeable Chinese man about town latched onto us as we stepped off the bus. Okay, boys, you have come to the right place, he smiled warmly. Come right this way. I'll help you get your rooms, but we must hurry. There is so much to do in Taipei. I tossed my bag into the room. A man named Chuck had the room across from mine. Chuck was in his mid-forties and was a captain back at work. In the hallway, he wore a tourist costume much like mine, chinos, checked shirt, and loafers. We had just introduced ourselves when Danny, the guide, came rushing toward us. Come, come, gentlemen, we must hurry. There is much to do in Taipei. Danny hurried us down the hall to the elevator. Remember, gentlemen, you are here to enjoy yourselves, and I am here to help you. First, we must go across the street to a fine, high-class bar and have a drink to discuss our plans. You must tell me what you want to do, and I will be your guide. Danny walked a little ahead of us, almost walking backward as he talked to us. He was so excited that you might have assumed that he, too, just got in from Vietnam. Danny showed us through the door of the bar. I noticed thirty or forty women sitting along one wall, side by side. He herded Chuck and me toward the beginning of the line. Martha, 
So good to see you tonight, he said to the first girl. She nodded warmly to Danny, and then to us. Hi, I said. I'm Bob Mason. Martha looked very pleased to meet me. We moved up the long line of girls, saying hello to almost everyone. At the end of the line, we went up to the second floor and settled around a table where drinks were already being served by some of Danny's friends. So, gentlemen, which one do you want? You mean, which one of those girls? I asked. Of course. Tell me which one you prefer, and she will be with you like that. He snapped his fingers. Well, I did see one girl I kind of liked, but I didn't get her name, I said. Where was she sitting? I think she was about the tenth girl. She's wearing a violet dress. Ah, Sharon, you have very high-class taste, Bob. Thanks. Chuck described the girl he remembered, and Danny got up and excused himself. I will be right back soon. Drink up. Immediately after Danny disappeared down the stairs, the girl in violet, Sharon, appeared and was escorted to a table at the other end of the room. She sat down across from her escort, facing me. How could I feel deceived by someone I didn't know? Of all the girls I had met in the lineup, she was the one whose eyes had locked on mine. As I sat there watching her, I realized that I absolutely loved her. There was something familiar about her. She was smiling gently as she met her escort, but her expression changed slightly when she looked up. She did not look away, and I knew she loved me, too. Danny came back up behind two women. They were both dressed very nicely and carried evening bags. They sat down across from Chuck and me while Danny introduced them. Linda, this is Bob. Vicky, this is Chuck. He stood back for a moment, grinning at the happy couples. I must go see about your drinks. Before he left, though, he leaned over to me and whispered, Sharon was already. I nodded quickly. Linda leaned across the table and whispered, It is so sad that you could not get the one you loved. Do you wish me to leave? Yes, I did. That girl, Sharon, seemed to be an oriental version of patience. Patience looked at me the same way when we first met. But there wasn't enough whiskey in me to cause me to become callous. The fact that Linda was willing to leave, to be rejected, stirred what remained of my sensibilities, and I said, No, of course not. She is more beautiful than I am, said Linda, fishing for compliments. In fact, Sharon was more beautiful than Linda, but I reminded myself that neither of them would be near me if I wasn't going to pay. In four days, it would be over. Don't be foolish. You are more beautiful. Thank you for saying so, she smiled. Sharon still looked at me occasionally. I wondered why. I have dim memories of the insides of many different clubs, singing in the streets and bright lights and taxis. I even woke up in a different hotel. My companion for ten dollars a day was Linda. She showed me the sights on the island in between servicing my desperate horniness. We ate at different clubs and restaurants every night, never visiting the same place twice. Occasionally, as we toured, I would see Sharon watching me familiarly. In moments, the four days were spent. Surprisingly, girls crowded outside the bus as we arrived at the airport. As we got off, reunions were formed by the departing soldiers and their Chinese girlfriends. The girls were actually crying. Why in the world? Perfect strangers five days ago were now sobbing tearful farewells. I climbed down out of the bus, but there was no Linda. I moved past the hugging couples to follow a roped path to the terminal. Five steps away from the door I heard my name called. I looked up and saw Sharon. She was smiling broadly, but tears flowed on her cheeks. She held her arms out, and I instinctively hugged her. I could not understand why she was doing this. Please be careful, she said. A nearly hysterical feeling of fear hit me as I stepped off the plane at Don Kay. The fear welled within me, changing to a prickly, cold terror in the moist heat. 
I shivered slightly and forced the demons to the background while I looked for a field phone. I shivered in the dark tent while I waited to be connected to my company. "'Welcome back, Mr. Mason,' said Sergeant Bailey. I calmed immediately at Bailey's voice. "'We'll send a jeep over right away.' It was gray outside, overcast, humid, incredibly hot. I fired up another Paul Mall and waited. In a few days I succeeded in almost totally suppressing my fear. We were not taking many hits out in the mountains where the calf was currently fishing. The closest thing to real action was when one of our gunships shot down a slick. Major Astor, the replacement for Captain Morris, was a tall, sturdily built man with short blonde hair, more like the stereotypical Marine than an Army pilot. He joined us right after Bongshun Valley. He saw only our pleasantly boring missions in the local boonies, which led him to erroneous conclusions. They let us go pretty much where we want to go, Major Astor said to John Hall. How much longer can the VC last if we've got control of the air like we do? We don't have control. They do, said John. Yeah, I've seen how tough they are. Actually, though, what could you expect them to do against our helicopters? Astor grinned. You've got it wrong, Major. The little people have just decided to take a small break for a while. John was drinking whiskey, the Major, beer, and I was listening. We were at the bar of our soon-to-be-opened built-by-our-own-hands officers club. There was no bartender yet. People just brought their own bottles. You call them little people? Sometimes. Makes them sound like elves. Well, sometimes you'd think the little bastards were carrying around some fairy dust or something, the way they can be exactly where you don't want them to be. Connors and Banjo walked in. Connors' shirt was stuck to his sweaty body, and sweat ran down his face. Banjo looked dry in comparison. Bartender! Connors yelled. Beer! Give me beer! There is no bartender, Banjo said. I know that. I'm just practicing. Connors looked around and nodded to the new major. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mr. Connors. I just found out that you're the company's IP. Yes, that is true. I am an ace with a helicopter. Just don't get near him when he tries to tie one down, said Banjo. Fuck off, Banjo. Ever teach at flight school? Astor said to Connors. Not yet. That's probably where they'll send me after this bullshit, though. Why? Are you an IP? No, said Astor. I just graduated. I was impressed by the training program at Rocker. Army helicopter training is the best there is. When you leave, you're almost safe. Almost safe? Astor laughed. That's right. Any new pilot is still dangerous. They know just enough to get themselves in trouble. After another 500 hours of practical flying, learning how to use the aircraft, I'd say they were pretty safe. If you're still alive at a thousand hours, you must have it down pretty good. That's stateside time. Over here, you pick things up quicker because of the pressure of being shot at. Connors grabbed the beer that Banjo put in front of him. Well, I thought it was a damn good program, said Astor. And after flying over here a while, I'm even more impressed at how good the training is. Yeah, it is good. But don't judge the action here by what you've been seeing since you've been here. When you start making your approaches to that tight LZ in formation, with the VC shooting at your ass, then it starts to get tough. Even so, if you fly like they taught you and don't panic, you ought to do okay, said Astor. What can I tell you? You got the big picture for sure. Connors turned to me and Hall and rolled his eyes. Here's to Army Aviation, Astor raised his beer. Huh? said Connors. I left the club to write my daily letter home, mentally totaling my flight time. By Connors' definition, I was a little better than pretty safe, with 700 hours. Connors himself had nearly 3,000 hours, almost all in Hueys. All of this proved to me that I was becoming a professional, a helicopter pilot. When I got back home, I could start my own helicopter company, all I had to do was get back home. Later that night, I heard the shrill screaming of a man gone crazy. I ran outside, goose flesh rising on my skin. 
God damn them! God damn them! The voice shrieked. Near the club, I saw four men carrying one of our pilots, a screaming, twisting, fighting Captain Fontaine. Fontaine hated Owens and White. I'll kill them! I'll kill them! Calm down. I will kill them! Fontaine's voice trailed into a high-pitched scream. He was a struggling pig going to slaughter, but the four men, one of whom was Connors, held him tightly and carried the writhing man up the short stairs to his hooch. And Fontaine was such a calm guy too. He went fucking nuts," said Connors. "I can see, but why?" I asked back in our tent, watching Banjo heat some coffee water next to his cot. Fucking Owens and White, Connors sat on his cot. Fontaine says he found out that those two have been faking their flight records. They've been logging a lot of combat time when everybody knows they don't fly at all. Anyway, he got into it with Owens. Owens told him he was just jealous. That cocksucker. He thinks everybody is as much an asshole as he is. Why do they want the time? Well, you figure a guy like Owens coming up soon for major. He needs the combat time on his records. He might even try to get some medals with it. Coffee time. Sorry, guys. There's only enough for me. Banjo laughed. So why say anything? I'm not sure. I think it makes me feel better when I think I'm living better than you. Banjo laughed. How about a cookie? You're so generous, Mr. Bates. Not at all, Mr. Connors. Banjo bowed, smiling. Mason? No thanks. I said. I'm going to bed. When you put your mosquito netting down around you, you felt isolated, even in the crowded tent. You were still in plain view of everyone, but the feeling was that you now were private, separated. I settled into my poncho liner to sleep. Blackness surrounded me, and something formless pursued me. A presence dove into my mind and flooded my heart with overwhelming fear. I snapped awake, raised on my elbows. Through the gauze of the netting, I saw Connors looking over from the other side of the tent. I tried to remember what scared me, but I could not. Nothing was happening in the camp. I eased myself back down, feeling tired, and watched the top of my mosquito netting. This ends side two of cassette seven of Chicken Hawk. Chicken Hawk, cassette eight. The next day, Gary and I flew attached to Major Astor's platoon on his first mission as leader. Most of the day was spent flying sea rations out to resupply the various patrols beating the bushes for Charlie. So far, no Charlie. Occasional sniper hits were reported. Old campsites, new campsites, even a few captives. But for all practical purposes, the jungle and bush we scoured was uninhabited. Astor did pretty well at the beginning of the mission. He had the eight ships assigned to him split up, each one resupplying an area of its own. This made the work go faster. Resupply was considered tedious by most pilots, but Gary and I took these delightfully boring occasions to play with the machine while we did the job. Nothing malicious like buzzing MPs, but the kind of play that challenged our skills. It could be something like ticking a tree limb with the rotor in an LZ, just to see if you could pull it that close. That would be considered foolish back in the states. Here, that kind of judgment could save your life. I experimented with the Huey Tuck that day. If the Huey was nosed over too far on takeoff, the wind resistance on top of the flat roof would force the nose even lower. The ship would then try to dive into the ground as it accelerated. If this happened over level ground, you were trapped in a vicious circle. Pulling the cyclic back would not overcome the wind pressure on the roof. Pulling up on the collective to stay away from the ground only added power to the system, causing you to crash at a higher speed. If you didn't do anything but curse, you hit the ground at a lower speed. Either way, you lost. I almost got caught in a Huey Tuck once, and I wanted to know just how far over was too far. I found out by simulating a level takeoff from a pinnacle. I nosed over very hard and pulled enough pitch to keep the ship flying horizontal to the ground. 
I tested the cyclic, and the ship would not respond. I could feel it happening. Adding power only made it worse. When I could feel the trap and feel how I got into it, I knew I could never get into it by accident. I was experimenting with this over a valley, so all I had to do to recover was dive. Near the end of the day, Charlie decided to try to wipe out a platoon or two before dark. We were at a field command post where our ships were being loaded when the grunt commander called Aster over to his command tent. There were six Hueys in the logger. When Aster came out minutes later, he signaled for a crank-up, then walked over to Gary and me. There's a platoon coming under attack just a few clicks from here. We only need five ships to get them out. Aster zipped up his flak vest. I want you to stay here and monitor our frequency in case we need you. He trotted to his ship, which was already running. Pretty tough assignment, said Gary. We both climbed into the cockpit. Gary started up so that we could monitor the radios without draining the battery. Having to get a jump start in the middle of nowhere was something neither of us wanted to experiment with. I tuned the radios. Charlie One Six, Preacher Yellow One, Aster called. No answer. Roger, Charlie One Six, we are inbound. Throw smoke. No answer. On the ground, we could hear only Aster's side of the radio conversation. He sounded just like he knew what he was doing. Yellow One, they are on the other side of the tree line. That was John Hall's voice. Negative, Yellow Four. I see the smoke," said Aster. I started to fasten my straps. If they were that close to pick up, we would be in the air in minutes. Negative, Yellow One. The target is upwind of that smoke," said Hall. Yellow Four, I am in charge here," said Aster. Roger. Do you think we should get into the air?" asked Gary. "No, not yet. Wait for Aster to give us the word." "Yellow Four is taking heavy fire from the tree line," yelled Hall. Aster, possibly already on the ground, did not answer. "Yellow One, we are aborting. My crew chief has been hit." We could hear the machine guns on Hall's ship chatter while he talked. "We'd better go," I said. "Right." Gary brought the Huey up to RPM and made a quick takeoff. Yellow one, Charlie one six. I have you in sight. You're about five hundred meters downwind of us. It was clear to Gary and me that Aster had really blown it. He had landed downwind of the Grunt's secure position, following the drifting smoke, even though Hall had seen the correct position. I saw the flight and called Aster to say we were joining up. He radioed a curt Roger. We joined up and made the landing to the Grunt's clearing without incident. As the crews mingled after the mission back at the golf course, Aster separated himself and walked away quickly. That guy is an accident looking for a place to happen, I said. Yeah, he's a disaster, all right. Hey, major disaster, said Gary. Everybody laughed. He was christened. Hall met us at the tent. His crew chief Collins was dead. The ship had taken more than twenty rounds. Hall was shaking with anger. He had been right. Disaster had ignored his warnings. "I'm going to kill him," said Hall. "I know how you feel," I said. "No, I mean that I will actually kill him. You know, dead." Hall unsnapped his revolver holster and walked off toward Disaster's hooch. I thought he was just acting tough. But when I got to the mess line fifteen minutes later, I heard Disaster calling for help from inside his hooch. Hall stood tall and silent, his pistol at the ready, a can of beer in his left hand. He had taken a position midway between Disaster's hooch and the mess tent. About thirty men, getting their evening chow, looked on with interest. Hall, if you don't put that gun away immediately, I'll have you court-martialed. The voice came from behind the hooch door. You'll have to come out sometime, Major. You're crazy. You can't pull a gun on a superior officer and hold him captive in his own quarters. You're going to be in serious trouble if you don't put that gun away, right now. You killed Collins, Major. Now it's your turn. Hall raised his pistol to aim. Help! Disaster screamed when he saw Williams come near the mess tent. Williams looked up and saw Hall in the darkening twilight. 
Disaster peered hopefully out, then yelled again. Help! Major Williams, get this madman away from me! Williams nodded and rinsed his mess kit before he walked into the mess tent. Nobody came to disaster's aid. Once in a while we heard him yell. No one paid the slightest attention. Later that night Hall gave up the vigil. I heard him singing drunkenly on the path outside my tent. The next morning he was still so drunk that he could not be allowed to fly. That incident seemed to precipitate a series of conflicts among us as tension took its toll. Hall beat up Daisy one night, splitting his lip. He continued to harass disaster by throwing Montagnard's spears at him as he walked around the camp. Soon after, Captain Fontaine was carried screaming back to his hooch. Riker told Shaker very plainly to shove it when Shaker told him to go work on the club. Connors and Nate pushed each other around over where the laundry should be hung. Nate and Kaiser scuffled over a territorial dispute. The farewell party for Williams was very quiet. The major, an excellent air leader, was being transferred to brigade staff in Saigon. A move up. The party was restrained because Williams had never been close to us, like Fields had been. The next day, after an award ceremony to pass out air medals among us, our new CO, Major Crane, made his introduction speech. I think that everything around here is just fine, except for personal neatness, said Crane. This company has an impressive list of accomplishments in the cab. I'm sure you've been so busy that you just let things slide. He wore crisp fatigues and spit-shined boots. Even Williams, Mr. Hard-Ass himself, didn't worry about that kind of bullshit. Williams concentrated on our missions. Crane was already talking about the busy work. You may not think that wearing a shirt in the company area is very important. And by the way, the shirt must be tucked in. But I do. Sure, it's tough here. This is combat. But if we let just one aspect of our professional demeanor fall to the wayside, our overall performance will suffer. He paused, smiled. Just a regular guy doing his job. So from now on, we will conform to standard army dress codes at all times. That means tucked-in shirts outside the tents, bloused boots, and clean uniforms. It's our own fault, I thought. We spent so much time making this place look civilized that this guy thinks he's back at Fort Benning. While I'm talking about keeping yourselves clean, I may as well announce a bit of good news, he smiled. Starting tomorrow, we will be digging our own company well so we can have our own showers. He waited. I think he expected some cheers here. We were silent. Captain Sherman will be the project leader, and I want you all to give him your fullest cooperation. Dismissed. My aching fucking back, said Connors back at the tent. I was kind of getting used to cleaning up the way I do. Shit, how do you think you clean up? asked Banjo. Well, just like everybody else. I keep my uniform on until it becomes a second skin. Then when I peel it off, it takes all the crud with it. I would like to have a shower around here, said Gary. Yeah, I would too. I wonder how deep we have to dig, I said. Maybe all the way to Cincinnati, Gary said. Farris walked in. I have another announcement for you guys. He waited until we gathered around him. We need volunteers to transfer to other aviation units to make room for the replacements. Transfer out of the cav? Gary asked. That's right. When? Somebody asked. Sometime between now and the end of next month. This was my chance. Maybe I could get a cushy job at Quignon, flying advisors or something. I raised my hand. For the next few days, I flew local routine missions or dug the new well. While I filled buckets and watched them being hauled up on a rope, I daydreamed about my new assignment. A friend of mine from flight school had written saying that he was assigned to a Navy carrier with his own Huey. I knew there were better jobs than the CAV. Maybe a nine-to-five courier pilot in Saigon. Imagine, no more mud, tents, or boonies. 
At 25 feet, we struck rock. Sherman called in some guys from the engineers who said we'd have to blast. Gary and I flew over the Bob Hope show on our way to Happy Valley. While we flew ass and trash that afternoon, we listened to the most bizarre radio conversation I had ever heard. Raven 6, Delta 1, we have a target in sight. Delta 1 was a gunship. Roger, Delta 1. Do you see anything on their backs? Negative. Well, there's just no way to be sure. Go ahead and get them. Roger. What the heck are they talking about? asked Gary. We had just picked up some empty food containers and were sailing down the side of a mountain. Got me, I said. Raven 6, our guns just won't stop them. You tried to get them in the head? Roger. Use the rockets. Roger. Silence. Gary was setting up for an approach to the road patrol on our resupply route. Raven 6 Delta 1, that did it. We got both of them. Glad to hear it, Delta 1. I was beginning to wonder if anything we had could stop an elephant. Elephant? We're killing fucking elephants? Roger. Anything else? Of course, Delta 1. Go down and get the tusks. I'm sick, said Gary. Killing elephants is like blasting your grandmother. Back at the company, there was general outrage at the news that the ivory was delivered to Division HQ. It was okay to kill people in a war, but don't touch innocent bystanders like elephants. Any man who'd do that would come into your house and shoot your dog, Decker said. Get your camera, Mason, Sherman yelled. What's up? We're going to blast the well. Get your camera. I stood back along the trail to the well and pointed my camera. Everybody clear? Sherman yelled. Clear? Bonk. A small cloud of dust rose five feet above the site. I snapped the picture. Shit! I thought it would have made more noise than that, yelled Sherman. Yeah, did it go off? Is there water? Everybody went over to the well. Who fucking Ray, said Connors. We got more dirt under them rocks. We'll just keep digging, announced Sherman. Somebody had painted a five-by-ten-foot mural of LZ X-ray on the wall of our new club. I had a bourbon and water in my hand as I walked around. The furniture, shipped in from the States, looked foreign. The chairs were stained bamboo with tropical print cushions. The tables had bamboo legs and formica tops. The place was packed for the official opening. We all knew that the colonel was going to bring nurses to the affair. The colonel wasn't around yet. The hundred or so guys passed the time drinking 25-cent drinks in rapid succession. Nearly everybody from our company was there. Nate and Kaiser talked seriously at the bar, while Nate's hand kept time with a song played on the new stereo system. Connors and Banjo laughed from a table nearby. Farris nursed a seven-up, but smiled anyway. Hall sat in a corner, staring at the mural. Disaster shadowed Crane and talked business. Wendell and Barber watched the tape recorder work. Wrestler grinned like a child on his second beer. Riker's red face was bright as he drank more than he usually did. I stood by the bar, wondering whether I got the clap in Vietnam or in Taipei. You're not sick, I had said pointing to her groin. Are you? Me? Her face showed pain. Me? Don't be silly. I know sick. If there's one thing I can't do, that's catch the clap, I said. Well, she huffed, I'm almost a virgin. Just as I noticed the silence, wrestler shoved me. Bob, he whispered, the nurses are here. The colonel had come unannounced through the club's back door, escorting his promised nurses. They, I'm sure, did not know that they were the inspiration that had built this club. They did have a look of extreme self-consciousness about them. The entire club stared intently and silently as four elderly, high-ranking females from the medical corps took seats at the colonel's table, cause enough for their nervousness. The music played on. Two very plump lieutenants followed. 
I kept looking at the door to see the rest. That was it. After a long minute, that was clear to everyone. Talk began again. There must be some real nurses in this fucking division, snarled Connors. Banjo was laughing so hard that he was in tears. Those are nurses, said Ressler. You know what I mean, said Connors. You know, nurses, like with tits that come up here, he gestured. Not down here. Shit, my grandmother is more appealing. The colonel kept looking around while his aides talked to the nurses. Ladies, a drunken warrant officer walked over and bowed politely to the nurses. Gentlemen, he nodded to the aides. Sir, he bowed again. The colonel glared at him. The nurses laughed. When he turned to leave, the colonel relaxed. At a moment when the club was silent and while every eye was glued to the scene, the drunk released a fart that stopped hearts. The colonel, his men, and the nurses flinched at the report. The colonel grew red in the face and started to get out of his chair, perhaps to kill the drunk. Noise returned abruptly to the club and he hesitated. Everyone was laughing. It was as though everyone had delivered that fart and the colonel knew it. He sagged back in his chair helplessly. The nurses explained that they had to get back right away. Farris said, I think you men should stop drinking and go home. We have a big mission tomorrow. It wasn't a very big mission, just lengthy. Since I'd been back from R&R, the daily missions were in the mountains, 40 and 50 miles north of Anke. We started each day at 0500, picked up grunts at the golf course or the refueling area, flew them out to the mountains, placed them at various LZs, and picked up wounded and dead from the patrols already out there. This area wasn't too bad for the pilots. We weren't getting killed. The grunts, though not beaten, were suffering losses from constant sniper fire and devious booby traps. After a week of our carrying wounded and dead people, the deck and bulkheads of the cargo area got very rank. Dried blood caked under the seats, and miscellaneous pieces of flesh stuck to the metal. When it became absolutely necessary to wash out the gore and smell, the pilot would make an approach toward the bridge going to An Kay and land in the river. Washing out the Hueys spawned a new support industry among the Vietnamese around An Kay. As we came across the bridge, boys would scramble toward the shallow area near the sandbars where we usually landed, ready to work. The only thing we had to worry about was not getting the electronics wet. Everything else, up to deck level, was unaffected by water. I hovered around in the shallows with the skids underwater until I found a spot that was the right depth. It was safe as long as you kept an eye on the tail rotor. As soon as the engine shut down, the boys would grab buckets and brushes and begin scrubbing the ship. The crew chief usually took out the seats for the scrub down. I took off my boots and socks, stashed them on top of the console, rolled up my pants and made it to the shore. While I stood on a sandbar and watched, the crew chief supervised the project and the boys did most of the work. They even climbed up on the roof and poured water down the hell hole, which was industrious of them but completely unnecessary. Other forms of business prospered on the sandbars. One was the Coca-Cola business. The other was mermaids. The cola girls had exclusive territories. The girl in the area I usually landed was named Long. Because I flew to the sandbars a lot, she knew me pretty well. Long was about ten years old with waist-length black hair. Her eyes were black, and her skin was darker than that of most Vietnamese. She was a gorgeous and radiant little girl. Do you have a wife? she asked when we first met. I said yes. Is she tall like you? No, she comes up to my chin. Ah, very tall. Does she have hair on her arms like you? Not like me, like you. I brushed the peach fuzz on her arm. Oh, that is good, she laughed. She had never seen Caucasian women. We became friends over a period of months. Long usually sat beside me on the sandbar while the Huey was washed 
and talked about how nice it would be when the war was over. She believed that it would be over very soon. There was talk of peace overtures going around. She could not imagine how the V.C. could beat soldiers that marched through the sky. When a ship was rinsed out, the crew chief would normally want to let it dry a little. Then he would get undressed to go for a short swim. The inspiration for this healthy and athletic act came from the older girls, who pretended to be mermaids and beckoned sweetly from downstream islands. The mermaids showed up at the river the day after the general placed An K off limits as a result of the high rate of social disease. For months, while an American-regulated village of ill repute was being constructed just outside town, the mermaid business flourished. I never drifted down the river myself, but from what I could see, it looked very sweet indeed. Eventually, the ship would dry and the crew chief would come back smiling. Long would get up to say goodbye. Standing, she was only a couple of inches taller than I was sitting. Goodbye, Bob. Be well. She smiled and wandered off to sell her wares as other Hueys landed among the sandbars. When I flew a ship to the sandbars, I usually tried to teach the crew chief some basic flying so that he could take the ship in case a pilot got hit and get it to the ground in one piece. The results of this training were disappointing because there was never enough time to pursue it. Consequently, I never saw a crew chief who was able to fly even a rudimentary approach. What seemed to me the most basic of human skills, hovering a helicopter, somehow eluded even the most intelligent crew chief. But among the men I tried to train, Reacher was notable. I had flown with him so much that he was almost able to hover, and I believe that in an emergency he might have got a ship down on the ground in one or two pieces. Rumor was it was getting hot again in the Yadrung. While the first of the ninth was over there snooping around, we continued our ass and trash missions around the home base. The pilots were tired of this kind of flying, and the ships suffered the mechanical equivalent of lassitude and dishevelment. The flyable rate was less than 50%. On the same day that a Chinook was shot down, our company broke four Hueys from just sloppy flying. At the news of the four accidents, the general reaction was, four less Hueys to fly. Malaise had set in. A brand new replacement, Captain Hertz, was assigned to fly with me one afternoon. Nate flew with another replacement, and the two of us were going to fly to Quignon and back to check these new guys out. When the sky was a dull orange behind us, we crossed the Anke Pass heading east. Hertz had been flying since we left the ground. He was doing okay, flying on Nate. We talked a little in the air. He told me he had a lot of flight time in the States. A formation accident in the cav had killed ten people. We heard reports about other wrecks around the country. Night formation skills were critical. One guy, fucking up just a little bit, could wipe out a bunch of people if those rotors connected. As it got dark, Hertz began to drop behind Nate. I encouraged him to close up, because dropping back too far caused you to lose perspective relative to the lead ship. Move it right up close, just like a daylight formation. Hertz moved to about two rotor discs distance of Nate. Unfortunately, he also started to oscillate, swinging too far away, then too close. As he tried to adjust for the swing, he overcorrected. I said nothing. On one swing toward Nate, he scared himself and dropped farther back. You gotta keep it closer, I said. If we were in a regular formation, we'd be screwing up everybody. If Nate decided to make a left turn right now, we wouldn't know it until we were right on top of him. I was just dropping back for safety. I know, but believe me, it's safer closer. Okay. As he pulled back up into the slot, he once again began the oscillations. He was on a pendulum that swung out away from Nate and then back toward him. He either knew a real slick trick or we were going to blend rotor blades with Nate. At the last possible moment, when I realized he had no slick trick in mind, I grabbed the controls. I got it. I flared back abruptly and pulled back into position. Why? Because you were going to hit Nate. I wasn't even close.
said Hertz. You were close enough that I had to get on the controls. Well, I don't think so. Well, we're up here tonight for your benefit, not mine. Try it again. He set up again and again began to swing in and out. His trouble, I believe, was his fear of collision, which was rational but which wrongly affected his judgment. He overcorrected, compounding the error until it grew out of control. On a wild swing away, I asked, Are you okay? Roger, said Hertz. Then he swung in toward Nate, and once again I took the controls. I got it. This pissed him off. No one has ever taken the controls away from me, especially not a warrant officer. Ah, what we had here was a dyed-in-the-wool snob who hated warrants. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Captain, you should be thanking me for saving your life. I need night training like I need an extra asshole. When we get back, I'm reporting you for insubordination. Right. Well, it's turnaround time. Nate is going to fly on us on the flight back. You take the controls and just aim this thing back to the west. You got it. Hertz took the controls. We said nothing more on the flight back to the golf course. I did consider the possibility of a steep bank, flip off his belts, open the door, and assholes away, but that was impossible. Hertz made the approach to our area nicely. In fact, the only thing he had done wrong was the oscillating in the formation. I could have helped him on that if he had just relaxed. On the ground, he opened the door and stomped off. I logged the book, entering myself as the aircraft commander. Hertz says pilot. How'd it go? Gary asked as I dumped my gear on my bunk. Shitty. That new guy Hertz tried to kill me and Nate, and when I had to grab the controls, he got pissed off. Yeah, I heard him yelling at Ferris a little while ago. What did he say? I couldn't tell, but I heard your name a couple of times. Nate walked in, grinning. Mason, you really pissed off that new captain. I know. He said he was going to turn me in for insubordination. Maybe they'll send me home early. No such luck. Nate sat down on my bench. Ferris ended up chewing his ass. Really? What did he say? He said that regardless of rank, you were the aircraft commander. And he said, if Mason said you were too close, then you were too close. Really? Yep. Nate fiddled with a plastic chess piece on the board I'd left set up. Hertz has to apologize to you, too. Now I felt very good. Want to play a short game? Nate held up two pawns. Any time, I said. Part 3. Short Timer's Blues Chapter 10. Grounded And still the little men keep coming, with their awkward, sauntering gait, the mark of a lifetime of transporting heavy loads on carrying poles. Bernard B. Fall, in the New York Times Magazine, March 6, 1966 April, 1966 when a first of the ninth platoon landed near Chu Pong, they captured NVAs who said that there were at least a thousand more men in the area. Moments later, the platoon was under fire and trapped. While trying to get them out, two slick ships were shot down and fifteen men were killed. This was bad news to many of us. The strategy of attrition was an endless cycle of our taking and retaking the same areas. Why the fuck don't they keep some troops out there, said Connors. This is like trying to plug 50 leaks with one finger. Week after week, the magazines reported kill scores that we knew were inflated with villagers. There were quotes from generals who reported we had them on the run, and quotes from the leader of the posse, LBJ, that victory was just around the corner. The perimeter of the golf course was now mined, searchlighted, patrolled, and guarded. In seven months, the V.C. had been able to get only a few mortars over it and a handful of men through it. When the Eastern mind encounters such a hard obstacle, it is inclined to use a kind of mental judo to bridge it. The V.C. asked themselves how they could get the Americans to give them rides in their helicopters so that they could inspect our defenses. Mason, you and Ressler go over to the bridge and bring back some prisoners, said Farris. 
Gary and I lifted from row three and flew to a small field near the southeast corner of the perimeter. Here, a second lieutenant ran over with his M-16 held by the sights. "'Got two suspects for you,' he said. He pointed behind him to two kids, maybe twelve years old. They were smiling as the grunts gave them chocolates. One of them smoked a cigarette awkwardly. "'Those two? I asked. "'Right. We caught them wandering too close to the perimeter. "'Maybe they don't know they're not supposed to be here. "'No, they know all right. "'Our orders are to arrest anyone who gets too close. "'You're to take them to the cage.' "'Where's that?' I asked. "'You know where finance is?' "'Yeah. "'Well, there's a barbed wire pen in a field near there. "'You'll be able to find it easy.' "'Okay.' The lieutenant motioned the prisoners toward our ship. The two boys grinned with childish expectation and ran over. "'Do they get blindfolded or something?' Gary asked. "'Nah,' said the lieutenant. "'They're just kids.' One of the boys sat in the web seat and the other sat on the floor with his legs dangling out, like the grunts did, and Gary and I strapped back in. Coming back into the golf course, we went out of the pattern and circled around the division to re-enter traffic on the downwind leg. The boys were all eyes. The one on the floor punched the other and pointed at something. They both laughed. Gary told the tower we were going to the pen, and they cleared us to fly down row three and beyond. We crossed the northern perimeter, the trooper's garrison, the tube emplacements, the anti-mortar radar installation, the sky crane pad, and the long rows of Hueys. Beyond the heliport, we flew over the tent cities to a field. Two clerks on guard duty came over to corral the prisoners. The boys jumped off smiling and went where they were pointed. Five or six prisoners crab-walked around under the three-foot-high barbed wire ceiling of the cage. One of them waved to the boys. They called a greeting. It did not look like a good place to spend time, but as we were told, no one stayed there very long anyway. After we question them, we either send them back home or turn them over to the ARVNs. These two little fucks will probably be sent back home, said the sergeant in charge. Back in the air, I had the feeling that we had just been tricked. They had just done an aerial survey of the entire first CAV compound, and they didn't even have an airplane. The perimeter of tangled concertina, land mines, anti-personnel mines, trip wires, and observation towers was constantly infiltrated by the haphazard return of nature, that is, weeds. With the mines in place, no one could go out to trim the weeds. Weeds were not only messy, they could conceal the approach of the enemy. The solution was to have men spray defoliant chemicals out the doors of a hovering Huey. There was no way to get out of the minefield if the engine failed. To someone as nervous around explosives as myself, the chance that just the air pressure under our hovering ship might trigger a mine seemed possible. And what about the sticks and stuff that blew around in our rotor wash? The imagined dangers were endless. I never thought for one moment about the defoliant itself. For two or three days, Wrestler and I drew the job. As with most non-combat chores with the Huey, it became a game. Whatever you do, don't catch the concertina with the skids, said Wrestler. What do you think, I bought my license at Sears? We flew slowly along the rows of concertina, just missing the short iron posts that anchored it. A man used a long nozzle to spray a mist of chemicals that swirled into the wire and around the ship. At the end of a three-hundred-yard pass, we rose slightly, turned, and went back, paralleling the same route ten feet farther over. One of the men in the back of the chopper waved to the man in the observation tower. He waved back, and with his finger, traced a circular path beside his head for good measure. Guard duty is shit, but at least I'm not stupid. For three hours, Gary and I painstakingly covered every square inch of our assigned section of the perimeter with weed killer. The stuff swirled into the cockpit, but was odorless and tasteless. The men of the spray crew were protected only by buttoned-up collars 
and pulled down baseball caps in their never-ending job. One morning we drew the assignment of flying to Yadrang as a courier ship. We carried the courier, who carried a pouch containing important messages being sent to various field commanders. It was the kind of job I loved best. No formations, no hot LZs, no screaming grunts, and no red tracers. After crossing the Mangyang Pass, we flew to a small LZ somewhere south of Pleiku. The courier hopped out and asked us to shut down. We did, then wandered over to a group of brass who were interrogating an NVA. The man's arms were bound behind him. He shook his head quickly when the interpreter shouted sharp questions. A heavy-set colonel reacted angrily and asked again. A major stood behind the prisoner with a forty-five drawn but held by his side. "'Tell him to talk or we will kill him,' the colonel said. The ARVN translator grinned. "'Tell him!' The interpreter switched his face to stern severity and wheeled around and yelled piercing Vietnamese accented with gestures. The prisoner flinched at the words, but resolutely shook his head. "'Did you tell him we'd kill him?' "'Yes. I say you talk now. If no talk now, we kill now. Boom!' He smashed his fist into his hand. "'Good. Tell him again.' He did, but the prisoner stubbornly refused to talk. "'God damn it!' the colonel shouted. "'Major, put your automatic to the back of his head,' he said quietly, so as to not tip his hand. "'When Nguyen here asks him again, push the barrel against his head.' "'Yes, sir,' the major raised the weapon. The interpreter pounced upon the man, unleashing a torrent of threats, and the major prodded the back of his skull with the muzzle of the gun. The man flinched at the gun stabs and closed his eyes, waiting for the explosion. When the interpreter stopped screaming, he shook his head. No. The colonel brushed the interpreter aside and put his face in front of the prisoners. Listen, you slimy little gook, you talk! Now! He glared. I'll blow your slimy brains all over this goddamn jungle. He moved his face closer to the prisoners. Cock that gun, Major. Huh? Cock the goddamn gun and let him hear it. I don't think he believes we'll kill his ass. But we can't, sir. The colonel wheeled to the Major. I know that, and you know that, but he doesn't. Cock it. Yes, sir. The Major sheepishly pulled the slide back and let it snap. The loud click-clack made the prisoner flinch. He seemed to brace himself for death. He lowered his head. The major kept the gun at the base of his skull. Before the interpreter even asked the question, he began to shake his head slowly. No. Okay, okay. Let's take a break, said the colonel. God damn, gooks! He looked around to see the courier and Gary and me. What do you want? Dispatches from division, sir. The courier handed the colonel a fat envelope and saluted. Right, the colonel nodded. The fucking paperwork can find you no matter where you are. Yes, sir, said the courier. The colonel looked up from the papers. Well, I have to get a signature on the cover sheet, sir. You'll get it, you'll get it. While he patted his fatigues for a pen, he noticed the prisoner staring at him. Major, I want you to blindfold that slope and I want you to tell him that I've decided to execute him. Sir? That's right, tell him, tell him! The colonel shook his head wearily. Jesus, Major, this is basic stuff. I'm going away for a while, and I want the interpreter to talk nice and friendly to the gook, and tell him that maybe he can save his miserable skin, like if he decides to talk. Get it? Yes, sir. Here's your cover sheet. The colonel handed the paper to the courier. Nice day for flying. The colonel looked at me. Yes, sir, it is, I said. He nodded over and over as if agreeing to several things, then stopped suddenly and looked at me sternly. Well? Yes, sir, I said quickly. We're going. I spit out blood. I had quit smoking and was taking it out on the inside of my cheeks. I sat behind a table in the mess tent, trying to figure out how to make sense of a tall pile of papers that made up an accident report. 
My job, since I had caught a bad cold, was to be the scribe on the accident board. The company was out working the local area, but the word was in that we were going to the turkey farm in a few days. I had mixed feelings. The job kept me behind in the safety of the camp, but being left behind for any reason was hard to bear. What a stupid emotion. I'd rather do a mountain of paperwork than be out flying. So why did I feel so rotten? What am I, a lemming? Relax and take it easy while you've got the chance. Aircraft commander says he did not realize that the LZ was filled with hidden stumps, the report read. Aircraft was pinned to a large sharpened stump, causing the aircraft to be abandoned. Who cares? Why do we have to document every accident in this goddamn war? How can a pilot be expected to know everything? What do they expect, X-ray vision? Can I sit here, sir? Sergeant Riles sauntered to my table. Sure. He pushed a file folder aside and put his canteen cup on the spot. Got to take a break from the fucking supply tent, announced Riles. Yeah, it gets tough in there. I hated myself for being cynical with one of the stay-behinds. And this one was the company's genuine loser. Riles kept himself drunk by stealing whiskey from the crew's stashes while they were out. He had been a master sergeant once, but because of his drinking he was now a PFC. We called him sergeant because he grew very depressed with the word private. Well, not that tough, he laughed. If Riles is a stay-behind and a loser, what does that make me? A feeling of revulsion came over me. Like to talk, Sergeant, but I got all this shit to do. Right, don't mind me. Got to get back anyway. Got this order today that we got to get ready for an IG inspection. Uh-huh. I barely glanced over a form. Hate that shit. Ever do an IG? Never. Never will, either. Riles stood up and waited for me to say something. The silence spoke, and he finally slumped off. I wanted to call him back and apologize for my thoughts, but I didn't. This ends Side 1 of Cassette 8. While the convoy crawled along Route 19, I thought about the British marching resolutely into American ambushes. The cook had lent me his M-16, which now lay across my lap as I sat in the jeep. I thought of my rank insignia as the equivalent to the British red coat and turned my collar under. By virtue of my being grounded, I was the officer in charge of our first road convoy to play coup. Group Mobile 100 ran from Anke to play coup once, said Wendell. Who's that? I asked. They were French equivalent to the first cav, said Wendell. They ran around these same roads in long caravans trying to beat the Viet Minh. Group 100 was wiped out near the Mang Yang Pass. Thanks, Wendell. Great news. Well, it's history. You can learn from history, you know. How's that supposed to help me now? Well, if I were you, I wouldn't go to sleep on the trip. Have fun. The big difference, of course, was that we had patrols along the entire route. Knowing this did not suppress my fears. I had become very skeptical of secure LZs, roads, bridges, and camps. During the entire fifty-mile drive, I watched the elephant grass along the road, braced for explosions at every narrow pass, and sat lightly on the seat when we crossed each bridge. When we drove into the turkey farm, I immediately found the flight surgeon and asked to get back on flight status. Sorry, you're totally blocked up. If I let you fly, it'll only get worse. Check back in a couple of days. In a damp mist, a hundred men pulled the bulky GPs from the trucks and began setting them up while the ships were out on a mission. In less than an hour, the flat, grassy field outside Camp Holloway was transformed into a tent city. Water bags, called Lister bags, were set up on tripods. The mess tent was put together, and while the men stacked sea ration boxes around the sides, the cooks started the evening meal. While all this was going on, I wandered around and made sure that the baggage for our company got put in the appropriate tents. Then I had nothing to do but deal with my thoughts. 
I sat on my cot alone in the dank GP and drank coffee and smoked cigarettes. I was tortured by conflicting feelings. The Bobsy creeps were the only other pilots on the ground, reinforcing my misery. At the first sound of the returning ships, I went outside and watched. The Hueys snaked out of the mist and with increasing noise gathered on the field west of the camp. Huey after Huey hovered to a landing. The field became a complicated dance of whirling rotor blades, swinging fuselages, and swirling mist. The roaring rush of the turbines died, and the rotors swung lazily as the ships shut down. The crew wandered up to the camp. They all had come back. I felt like an abandoned child seeing his family again. Soon the tent was filled with the usual sounds. Hey, Nate, the next time you cut me out like that, I'll... Fuck you, Connors. If you'd been watching what you were doing, you'd have kept your distance. Jesus Christ, I don't know who's worse, you or the Kong. It was nice to hear. My ten days on the ground seemed interminable. Our battalion spent two more days at the turkey farm before packing up to go north to Kantum. Again, I rode in the convoy. We found an old French barracks that the Vietnamese had been using as stables and chicken coops. After a lot of cleaning up, this became our Kantum camp. I saw the flight surgeon each morning, and each morning he continued my treatment of drugs and no flying. Finally, after two days at Kantum, I was put back on flight status. Riker and I were assigned to fly together. As I walked out to the flight line, I felt weightless with joy. My work had become my home, and I was glad to be back. The ships were shadows in the early morning mist. We took off singly to join up out of the fog. Climbing over vague trees, we saw the earth disappear. Riker, who knew where we were going, told me to turn left. Just as I did, we saw the phantom of a Huey cross immediately in front of us. I lurched back on the controls, but that was not what saved us from a mid-air collision. Luck had been with us. The mission was to resupply the searching patrols. We followed three other ships thirty miles up to Dak To, separated and flew west to one of our patrols. We shut down while the grunts dragged out insulated cases of hot food. A sergeant came over and invited us to join them for breakfast. We did. Hot, reconstituted scrambled eggs, bacon, white toast, and coffee. We sat on the Huey's deck and ate silently. The mist was beginning to burn off, and the dark shadows around us grew taller, revealing themselves as mountains. The platoon leader, a skinny second lieutenant, came over and shot the shit for a while. Find anything? Riker asked. Just some old campsites. The lieutenant patted his blouse for cigarettes. I offered him a Paul Mall. Thanks. We hear that the VC don't want to fight the Cav. Can't blame them, can you? said the lieutenant. Every time they do, we clobber the shit out of them. Yeah, as long as we have helicopters, phantoms, and B-52 bombers, I thought. I said, maybe the war is almost over. Maybe. They keep talking about peace negotiations all the time. Johnson's got them in a bind up north, and we're putting the squeeze on them down here. They might just see that it's impossible to win. Yeah, said Riker. I don't see how the little fucks can go on much longer. McNamara says we're due out of here in less than a year. Some people say that we might not even serve a complete tour. Could end that quick. Might be, said the lieutenant. At least we know we own Dacto. We have a guy in our company named Wendell says that that's what they did with the French, I said. Did what, said the lieutenant. Made them think they're winning. Let them set up camps and stuff. And then bam, totally different war now. The lieutenant flipped his cigarette out to the dew-covered ground. The French couldn't get around like we can. He patted the Huey's deck. Machines like this make all the difference. How'd you like to be a gorilla trying to fight an army that can be anywhere, anytime? You got a point there, all right, I said. Wendell's a flake anyway. Sounds like it, the lieutenant said. Yep, said Riker. I can see it now. Get home early, get laid and then put the baggage down. 
Well, I'm back to work. Take it easy. The lieutenant smiled and walked back over to his men. Phillips, get some men to load those food boxes on the Huey. What's next? I asked Riker. We're supposed to go back and drop this shit off, and then we fly some refugees somewhere. Black pajamas, conical hats, pigs trussed in baskets, chickens that watched with upright heads on upside-down bodies, wide-eyed kids, crying babies, rolled-up rice mats, staffs, bundled firewood, and warped metal-clad boxes that stayed together by faith alone were packed into the Huey. What a menagerie, grumbled Riker. A pig squealed as the turbine whined. I turned around and saw a young mother with a baby's face pressed to her breast as she watched us with saucer eyes. I nodded to her and smiled. She nodded quickly and smiled back. God, they are scared, I thought. How would I feel if foreigners made me and my family get on a strange contraption to fly me from my home to who knows where? Winning their hearts and minds, I said. Ain't that a crock? said Riker. We flew north, past Dak Tho, and the border junction of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. The mountains were the tallest I had ever seen. Misty clouds blanketed this wet, green world. We were in our slot, one of ten ships, as the flight followed valleys to stay out of the clouds. Past a dark peak that lost its top in the whiteness, a red, freshly cut airstrip appeared in the valley below. New huts with tin roofs were clustered defensively within a sandbagged, wire-topped compound wall. Welcome home, I thought. Eyes in the back watched intently as the flight drifted out of the misty sky to land on the red earth. Little ARVN soldiers with slung rifles urged them out of the ship. A frightened mother looked back inside to two small kids. A soldier grabbed a pig and tossed it to a pile of rope-trussed belongings. It screamed noiselessly in our hissing and squirmed like a living sausage. One of the kids screamed tearfully. His frantic mom snatched him quickly off the deck to sit on her hip. He grabbed her blouse tightly as she ducked our rotors and stumbled to her things. I watched her as we left. She grew smaller as we climbed. Soon she was only a memory, confused and frightened, alone and far away from her family's ancient home. At that moment I hated communists and was ashamed to be an American. But then I had often been accused of being too sensitive. We continued relocating refugees all the next day. We were supposed to finish our sweep at this end of the Yadrong Valley, and then go home to the golf course. By dusk, though, we were landing the last load of people at one of the new villages. The old man decided to stay out and head back in the morning. Twenty ships landed on a grassy ridge in the gathering dark. The ridge was the site of a temporary ARVN camp. Two large tents were set up for us. Riker and I carried our sleeping gear over to the tents. We blew up air mattresses in the light of army flashlights. Dinner was seas eaten down by the ships. Riker and Ressler sat on the deck eating from cans while I twisted the opener around a tin of chicken. I was pulling the ragged lid away from the chicken meat when the silence was shattered. Whomp! And then ringing. The ringing came from my ears. Nobody announced the obvious. Mortars. Cans clanked on the deck and shadows scattered. I dropped my can and ran toward a shallow hole I had seen when we landed. It was only twenty feet away. Woom! I saw the bright flash of the round as it exploded a hundred yards away. Dropping to the grass, I low-crawled the rest of the way to the hole. Woom! It was occupied by two crew members from the ship in front of us. Woom! Woom! God damn, where am I supposed to go? Woom! Damn, real close! I got up and ran back to the ship. The ship was my security. It always got me out of trouble. Woom! My shadow flashed against the black U.S. Army on the tail boom. I dropped and rolled under the deck. My shoulder caught on the fuel drain spigot, and I tore it loose. 
My mind had long since left, and I was blindly scrambling toward the front of the ship, away from the fuel bladder. Woom! I reached the cross tube up front and stopped. God damn it! I screamed. Motherfuckers! Then I realized that the Huey was just thin aluminum and magnesium and plexiglass and jet fuel, and that if a round hit, I would go up and smoke with it. Get away from the ship, you stupid shit! I yelled to myself. I crawled in the foot-deep grass, pressing my nose in the dampness, my nose the runner, my head the sled. Ten feet away I stopped. Woom! Off to the right. No hard hat, no weapon. I cursed my stupidity and swallowed sobs. Silence. A bug crawled on my cheek. I heard a muffled woof and a pop. A flare dazzled and swung in the sky. Woof, pop, woof, pop. Huey shadows intersected and swayed wildly across the grass. A flare dimmed, then disappeared as it dropped below the ridge. Gray smoke made lazy trails in the light of the flares above. Silence. They stopped. After ten more minutes of lying in the grass, I heard voices. All over. Jesus H. Christ! How lucky can you get? I got up. My shoulder hurt where I had hit the drain valve. I believe in God. Really. I walked back to my ship, dropped to my knees, and searched the grass for an already opened can of boned chicken. The mist was so thick I could barely see the Huey from the tent. The distant mountains from the day before had disappeared. Wrestler had got up before me, and I could see a friendly orange flicker from his tin can stove next to our ship. I shivered. It had been a cold and sleepless night. Nobody had been hurt during the attack. No one could understand why the VC or the NVA, or whoever they were, had stopped when they did. Certainly it had not been because of any counterattack on our part. They probably just ran out of ammunition. Thank God for VC shortages. We had been sitting ducks. Want to use the stove? Wrestler smiled from his hunker. He stirred in sugar from a paper packet. The coffee smelled like life. Yeah, thanks. I leaned in against the edge of the deck and dragged the sea ration case over. Let me guess, scrambled eggs and bacon? Of course, it's breakfast time, isn't it? I think you're the only one in the company who eats that shit. All the more for me. I got a can from the box and a coffee packet. I poured some water into Wrestler's cookie can and set it on his stove. While the flames seared the wetness on the outside of the can, I opened the eggs. Inside was the familiar yellow-green egg loaf with small bits of brownish bacon. I spooned it out cold. Wrestler made an expression of revulsion as I munched. I spooned another chunk out and held it toward him. Want some? I don't eat puke, he grimaced. We went through this routine often. It was our morning ritual. I've never seen fog this thick before. I know. He checked his watch. It's already seven and it looks like five. I nodded. The Huey in front of us was a pale shadow, and the one I knew existed in front of it was totally obscured. ITO? Probably. When was the last time you did an instrument takeoff? Flight school? Me too. Ferris came swirling out of the fog carrying a steaming cup of coffee. Just talked to an Air Force pilot. Says our valley is filled up with this fog, but it's clear at the peaks. We nodded. We'll wait an hour to see if it burns off. He continued walking and disappeared behind us. Where'd you go last night? I asked. Over there. Wrestler pointed toward the GP. The tent? No. See that kind of ditch up there? Oh, yeah. Man, if they had kept it up. I know. One of these days, they won't stop. An hour later, Farris told us to put our gear inside the ships. He and Riker were going to take off with some other ships, and he wanted us to listen in on the radio. He'd tell us how high up the fog went. As I followed Wrestler down the slope, carrying my flight bag, I veered off to the left. Nothing very unusual, except that I was trying to walk straight. 
When I leaned to the right to change course, I kept going to the left. I didn't feel dizzy, just strange. I stopped for a minute and tried it again. I felt myself being tugged off track again, but was able to ignore it. When I reached the ship, the feeling had gone. I shook my head. I'm coming apart. I strapped in while Wrestler tuned the channel Ferris would be on. We listened while Ferris called the ships going with him. He asked if we were on the net. Roger, Gary answered. Six more ships waiting with us rogered in turn. There's no hurry, Ferris radioed. We're going back to Kantum to pick up some troops. You guys can meet us anywhere along that valley we followed yesterday. We should be back through in an hour. We rogered down the line. While Farris talked, I noticed something in the corner of my eye. Ten feet to the right of our ship, a gray mortar round stuck out of the grass. I punched Gary. He followed my finger and nodded. His eyes rose in surprise. I'll be damned. It's not as bad as it looks, said Farris. The fog ends about five or six hundred feet up. Just make sure you take off due west when you leave. Remember, there's mountains on both sides of you. Roger, Gary answered. Yellow one, there's a mortar round stuck in the ground next to us. Huh? There's a mortar round from last night stuck in the ground right next to us. Roger, call the ARVNs. They might have a demolition squad here. I lit a cigarette and stared at the round. It was just about where I had been lying last night. Gary raised the liaison officer, an American who stayed with the ARVNs. Roger, we'll take care of it. Don't try to move it yourself. We both burst out laughing. Lucky he told us, I said. I was almost out the door to defuse it. As courage gathered in each of the seven ships, one would announce he was leaving, and we'd hear him fluttering up into the mist. Gary and I decided that the round wasn't going to explode, since it hadn't, so we waited. Neither of us felt entirely confident about the ITO. If we had the time, why not wait to see if the fog burned off? The last ship left. They radioed back that the fog was still about five or six hundred feet deep. Guess it's not going to burn off for a while. Guess not, I said. Want to go for it? Yeah. I looked at the mortar round. Let's get the fuck out of here. I stared at the round as Gary cranked up. Would it be sensitive to the rotors when they started to thud? I guessed I'd never know if it was. Top-notch demolition crew them ARVNs have. You see him coming? No. Oh, yeah, top-notch. Gary set the artificial horizon low for the takeoff. Okay, Bob, you double-check me on the way out. Right. Everybody on board? Roger, answered the crew chief. So are you sure we shouldn't wait a little longer? Relax, Sergeant. We got this thing under control. Roger. He didn't sound convinced. Gary looked over at me and smiled. I nodded. When he pulled in the power, I glanced at the round. The grass around it was pressing down in the rotor wash. Did it just move? The ship drifted off the ground. The round disappeared along with everything else. There was no sensation of movement. The artificial horizon was right where it was supposed to be, and the airspeed was picking up. Gary let it accelerate to about forty knots and held it there. Turn and bank was fine. Needle, ball, airspeed was the slogan we learned in flight school. I checked the instruments in that order. Gary was right on the money. White nothingness extended in all directions. The ship hummed, the instruments said we were moving, but the senses said we were parked in some strange void. So far you've got a double-A ride, I said, referring to the grading on the check-ride sheets our instructors used to carry with them. Don't fuck it up. No sweat, said Gary. The whiteness grew brighter. It blazed. But still you could see nothing. Without reference to the inside of the cockpit, you would swear you were blind. The bright white grew bluish, and we saw a dark green peak off to our right. Yay! I said, cheering. Great flying, sir!
The crew chief was now a believer. I looked back. The misty sea beneath us hid the valley where midnight mortars lurked. The mountain tops were bright islands at the surface. I felt a shudder of relief and smiled to myself. It had been a bad night, but the sky was bright ahead. Chapter 11 Transfer I don't think the elections will result in a communist or neutralist government, but if they do, we will fight. I don't care if they are elected or not. We'll fight. In Guyan Cow Key, in Time, May 13, 1966. May 1966. Riker and I sat together in the sling seat of the C-123 as it droned to Saigon. My feet rested on the flight bag that contained everything I owned. I was not coming back. Riker was on his way to an R&R flight to Hong Kong. Since I volunteered to transfer out, I wondered why I already felt homesick for the cab. You see wrestler break 881, Riker said. He didn't break it, the new guy did. Yeah, but it was wrestler's ship. I'd said goodbye to Gary as he walked out to the flight line with the new guy, Swain, in tow. Gary was checking him out to see how well he flew. Probably won't see you again, said Gary. Probably not. At least not if I see you first. He laughed. Yeah, well, it was fun, even if we did argue a lot. No problem. I always won anyway. He grinned and extended his hand. Gotta go check this new guy out. I've got your home address. I'll write you after our tours are up. We shook hands. Yeah, do that. Let's keep in touch. I nodded and let go of his hand. See you. He smiled and turned toward the ships. See you. I watched him walk away. I decided to watch him take off, so I sat on some sandbags in front of the operations tent. Where are they sending you, Mason? Captain Owens came out and pushed his cap back. A place called Fan Rong, 49th Aviation Company. Owens nodded. Never heard of them. Neither have I, but they're not the cab. Gary and Swain climbed into their ship. 881, the oldest Huey in the company. Ha! Not the cab is right, Owens grinned. Nobody's the cab. Gary's ship was running now, so I got up to leave. Well, good luck in your new company, said Owens. Thanks. They were in a hover, backing out of the slot, when everything came unglued. The ship vaulted backward over its own tail. The rotors hit the ground and the transmission and drive shaft came off. The fuselage slammed into the ground. Pieces flew everywhere. Jesus! I yelled and ran down the path. The fuselage was crumpled, lying on its back. I saw the crew chief scrambling out of the wreckage, pale and wide-eyed. I humped to get there, visualizing Wrestler as crumpled as his ship. Then I saw him squirming out through some twisted metal. He was scared but smiling. You all right? I yelled. Gary brushed himself off and began laughing. Swain was out walking around in circles. The crew chief was on his knees, trying to pull the gunner out of the pocket. Jet fuel dripped in puddles near him. Come on! The crew chief yelled, pulling. Freed, the gunner was bleeding from a gash on his temple. Gary was wandering dumbly toward the operations tent. Then he stopped and came back to the wreckage. You okay? I ran over to him. Sure, he laughed. Sure I'm okay. Why'd you ask? Why'd I ask? Look at the ship. He laughed again, a giggle from a pale and confused face. Bad landing. Some people walked the gunner up to the med tent. He was the only injury. I relaxed. It's only a bad landing if you don't walk away from it. What happened? Gary's question was broken by spasms of laughter. You don't know? Shit, the last thing I knew, I was locking my belts, then wham! Swain was flying. Yeah, I didn't think he could fuck it up getting out of the slot, you know. Hey, Mason, the jeep's waiting to take us to the airfield, Riker yelled from the tent. Shit. Hey, I gotta go. Again, you're okay? Sure, why'd you ask? 
Riker dug around in his bag looking for something. The vibrations from the cargo ship were putting my ass to sleep. You know, Riker, every time I go to Saigon, you're with me. That's right, you lucky fuck. I've got to get a room tonight because my R&R plane's not leaving until tomorrow. Want to share a room? Why not? I've got two days to get to my new assignment, I said. Riker nodded in loud droning. I looked across the deck, through a window, and saw the plane was banking, probably getting close. Then we hit some bumpy air. It reminded me of the flyby for the general. We had practiced for two days, and the weather couldn't have been smoother. A line of Hueys, Chinooks, Caribous, and Mohawks, even some little H-13s stretched for two miles, looped to the Anke Pass and back toward the golf course. Keep them tight, said the colonel. We did. Wrestler sat co-pilot, and I flew because our position put my side closest to the ship we were flying on. You don't have to go that close, you know, Wrestler said. These guys know what they're doing, I said, referring to Connors and Banjo in the ship we followed. I'd feel okay overlapping blades with them. Fucking daredevil. I grinned, liking the label, and moved closer. I knew I should have kept my mouth shut said Gary. I moved the rotor tips so that there was no more than three feet between us and the other ship. I held a vertical clearance of three feet to allow for any rough air and the surges it would cause. Ever overlapped blades before? Never, never will either. I kept the three-foot vertical space and moved gently in, my left hand on the collective jerked up and down, keeping our blades above Connors and Banjo's. Banjo was watching. He grinned from only a few feet away and raised his fist, thumbs up. Then he waved me closer. The smirk on his face said it was a dare. Okay, flight looking good. Remember to keep the turns very, very wide. I don't want to see any bunching up, said the colonel. Not in the turn, Mason. I nodded. I saw only the vertical space between our rotors. The rest of the world did not exist. When their ship bounced up in an air pocket, my hand flicked us up at the same time. I saw I could hold the space, so overlapping would be easy. I moved slowly in as we began the turn. Okay, okay, you did it. Now get back, said Gary. Connors knew what I was doing and flew as smooth as silk. We made the whole turn with our rotors overlapped by two or three feet. As we came out of the bank, I slid away and breathed again. I can't believe you like to do shit like that, Gary said, disgusted. What's so funny, Riker said, inside the C-123. Nothing, just thinking about the flyby. Fucking waste of time that was. Yeah, I said. But I was already thinking about the assault we did in Bong Shun. When we got back from our sweep around Dak To... Our company was sent over to Bong Shun to help the 227th. The VC were retaking the valley we had won two months before. During the briefing at the rifle range, the officer in charge said, So make sure your gas masks are working okay. We'll be using CS and tear gas on this assault. There were murmurs in our crowd. Gas masks? What gas masks? Outside, the CO had a quick inventory done and found that we had enough masks for exactly half the men. One pilot in each ship and one of the gunners would have to go without. Why don't we just go back and get some more? Somebody asked. Not enough time, said the CO. Wrestler and I and our two crew members stood next to the ship looking at the two masks. Wrestler produced a coin. The crew chief and gunner flipped. The crew chief won. Heads or tails? Wrestler grinned confidently. He never lost. Heads, he flipped. Heads. As it turned out, the gas was diffuse where we landed, and we took only one round as we left. But I remember Wrestler sitting on his side of the cockpit, grimacing, tears flowing, yelling on the intercom. Shit! God damn! The plane banked hard. Out the window, I could see the outskirts of the big city. About time, said Riker. You really enjoyed this flight. You've been grinning the whole way down. Yeah, I guess I have. 
It's just that I'm so happy to be leaving the calf. Yeah. Of course, you don't know what kind of unit your new one is yet. The hotel we got to was a place Riker had heard of. I don't remember its name or where it was. That's partly because we had had a good meal and several drinks that night and got to the hotel after dark. The hallway was narrow and the ceilings were twelve feet high. The place was dark and dingy and the clerk uninterested when we checked in. The Vietnamese were getting used to us, it seemed, and they didn't like what they saw. The clerk gave us a key and pointed down the dark hallway. Some joint breaker. Guy I know says it's a great place. Big rooms, low prices. The windowless room had two beds and a dresser and a small wooden table. The tall doorway, which occupied one corner, had a glass transom above it. I flopped on my bed with a copy of Time. Riker stripped to his shorts and wrote at the table. An article mentioned the transfer of General Kennard, for whom we had the flyby. Hey, I announced. They've written up Kennard's transfer in Time, and there's not one word about mine. After the flyby, I had had to take a ship over to the river to wash it out. Long sat with me on the sandbar as usual and talked. I am sorry to see you go, she said. Her English was improving every time I saw her. She was a self-taught genius. I'll miss you too. Will you give your wife a present from me? Sure, but you don't have to give me any presents. Not for you, she giggled. For your wife. She removed her gold wire earrings and held them out to me. No, I shook my head. You can't afford to be giving me gold earrings long. I'm the rich guy here. I'll pay you for them. I reached into my pocket. She suddenly looked hurt, genuinely hurt. She was really just being nice. Okay, okay, no money. I'll give them to patients. She smiled brightly and handed them to me. I wrapped them in a piece of paper from my notepad and put them in my shirt pocket. Thank you for the present. I'm sure patients will love them. She grinned. I patted my shirt pocket. Still there. Better mail them as soon as I get to the new unit. I wasn't reading the words I looked at, so I put the magazine down. In the meantime, Riker had got in bed. My grandfather's Hamilton said it was eleven o'clock. Someone knocked at the door. Yeah? I called out. No answer. Then another knock. Who the fuck could that be? I sat up. Probably the maid. I walked over to the door. Probably. If it was the maid, why was I afraid to open the door? I'm really coming apart, I thought. When I turned the knob, the door shot inward, slammed into my boot, and stopped. I reflexively pushed back, and as I did, I came face to face with a frowning oriental, only a few inches shorter than I. Hey! I pushed hard, trying to close the door. My boot slipped back as the door opened wider. I struggled harder. Altogether, I could see four or five men pushing, silently, grimly determined. Hey, Riker, get over here! There's a bunch of gooks trying to bust in here! Riker paused for a second until he saw I wasn't kidding. What the? He got up and ran over. My boot slid back farther. The opening was almost wide enough to squeeze through. Come on, goddammit! Push this fucking door shut! I yelled. My boot jammed under the door was the only thing that was keeping them out of the room. Riker pushed, stretching his long legs to the foot of my bed and his back to the door. When the door closed a fraction, I moved my boot ahead to lock it there. Then they pushed with a surge, and the pressure on my toes grew until I thought they would crack. Hands came around the edge of the door and grasped air, trying to reach us. The only sounds were grunts and heavy breathing. Riker and I dripped sweat. As the heavy door groaned and thudded, the space was slowly getting smaller. Unbelievably, we were gaining on them. A hand grabbed the edge of the door as it got close to shutting. I smashed it with my fist. It held. I smashed it over and over until it let go and struggled back through the narrow crack of the door. As the fingers slipped out, the door slammed shut. Fumbling, shaking, wet fingers latched the lock and the extra safety bolt. 
Riker and I looked at each other in amazement. We were sharing a nightmare. Then we heard the thud of a body slamming against the door, and the door seemed to bend inward. The thudding repeated itself rhythmically, like a heavy heartbeat. Call the fucking desk, said Riker. I ran over to the night table and picked up the phone. Riker dragged the dresser across the room. It made a splintering sound as the veneer split against the tile floor. The desk phone rang. Are you calling them? Riker yelled as he struggled to get the dresser against the thudding door. Yeah, no answer! I wiped sweat from my eyes. They don't fucking answer! After fifty rings, I knew they would never answer. We sat across from each other on the two beds and watched the door moving with each animal thud. Your derringer, get out your derringer! Riker brightened at the prospect. I sold it to Hall. You sold it to Hall! I thought that was your fucking last-ditch weapon. Don't you think this looks like an emergency? I nodded and shrugged. The gun was still sold to John Hall for twenty-five bucks. If that ain't the dumbest thing I ever heard of, I nodded sorrowfully. Crack! We both jumped at the new sound. They were throwing something metallic against the glass transom. Crack! Then chips of glass fell inside. The transom window had wire mesh embedded in it. At the center of the window, a section the size of a fist was now bare of glass. Try the phone again, said Riker. I listened to a mechanical switch click and cycle a burst of ringing noise, then click, recycle, then noise. Riker took his bed apart. Under the mattress were hard wood bed slats. He smashed one down on my bed. It made a formidable club. I shook my head when he looked at the phone. Then I hung up. Bastards! Riker yelled. At 2 a.m. the thudding stopped. Riker was asleep, proving that you can get used to anything. I sat up against my pillow with one of his bed slats on my lap. When the thudding stopped, I tried the phone again. There was another small window near the ceiling at the other end of the room. While the phone rang, I looked up to see glass spraying in from it. Riker jumped up at the new sound. What the hell is going on here? Riker pleaded. I didn't know. I'd been sitting on my bed for two hours, listening to the door being smashed, asking myself the same question. They are trying to kill us, aren't they? Why didn't they just blow up the fucking door, or use an axe, or fire, or some fucking thing besides bodies? Maybe we should let them in and smash their brains in with our clubs. A quick no sounded in my head. I felt pretty brave at the controls of a helicopter while people tried to kill me, but trying to smash five darting orientals with bed slats was just not me. I waited to see what developed. Soon the fuck-up at the desk would return from someplace and hear the ruckus and call the police. There were police in Saigon, weren't there? Or the people next door. They would get somebody. But the thudding went on and on. I wanted to scream at the utter unreality of the situation, but I could not scream because I was a soldier. That thought made me laugh out loud. G.I. Joe would have never let a bunch of dirty nips get away with this, I said. Then I visualized the myriad ways in which G.I. Joe would murder this mob. Of course, they were all centered around the fact that he always had a weapon stashed somewhere. I clutched my bed slat and waited. What I needed was a flamethrower. The windowless room showed no light at dawn. My watch said it was six. The thudding had stopped. I woke Riker. We pulled the glass-covered dresser away and cautiously opened the door. There was some debris outside, but no people. Quickly, we grabbed our gear and entered the hallway. All clear. As we walked toward the desk, we almost had cardiac seizures when we saw the clerk staring at us. Where the fuck were you last night? We both yelled. Sir, I do not work at night. A man named Tew does. Well, where was he? I said. He was here all night, sir. He certainly was this morning when I came to work. Bullshit! I yelled. The clerk flinched a little but said, Was there something wrong with your room? Some people tried to break into our room all night long, you fuck, said Riker. Really? That's strange, said the clerk. Did you call the desk? 
Yes, over and over, I said. Well, possibly the phone is broken. Even if the phone is broken, I explained, our room is at the most fifty feet from here. Nobody could have not heard that commotion last night. I will inform the manager of this, said the clerk. He looked at us quietly. His eyes told us he knew exactly what had happened last night, and we could yell and scream and complain until doomsday. He was never going to admit it. We hoisted our bags and left. This ends side two of cassette eight of Chicken Hawk. Chicken Hawk, cassette nine. Phan Rang is near the coast, about 160 miles south of Quinyon, and 160 miles northeast of Saigon. But that's not where I went first. First, I signed in at the 12th Aviation Battalion's camp near Nha Trang. Then I waited in a bar in a sweltering sea-level village and talked to a depressing, sallow, and lumpy engineer who worked for one of the many American companies in Vietnam. I hate it over here," he said. "Why don't you go home? Money's just too damn good." He swilled the last of his beer. "Besides, there's no poon tang at home like the stuff that lives over here. I got a bitch waiting for me back home." It all fit. Anyone who lived with Mister Darkness had to be a bitch, and the only place in the world he'd get the poon tang he wanted was where he was transformed into the rich American engineer. I nodded but said nothing. He told me more about his job, his hooch, his lady, his stereo, his growing bank account. I almost fainted from boredom. At a lull in the drone, I announced, "Gotta go." The engineer nodded hazily and turned his snout back toward the barkeep. He tapped the mug on the bar and pointed sternly to it. "More," he said. The Huey landed on the sandy patch where I waited. The crew chief ran past me carrying a sack of mail to Battalion HQ. I threw my gear on board and fished out my flight helmet. "You're Mason," said the pilot. I nodded. "Good." We'll be leaving as soon as he gets back," he pointed to the retreating crew chief. I climbed into the idling Huey and smoked. It felt good to be back in a helicopter after wallowing around in Air Force transports. The crew chief returned, and the pilot lifted off through the swirling sand. As we moved forward, the wind felt cool against my skin. Kam Rong Bay was the halfway point on the flight to the company. As we flew by, I saw scores of Navy PBYs, seaplanes, anchored in the harbor. For the rest of the flight, I had daydreams about owning a PBY and flying cargo in the Bahamas or running a cross Canada lake to lake touring business. When I saw the concrete buildings at the Phan Rang Air Force Base, I felt a moment of happiness. I was finally going to get to live like a human. But the Huey flew by the barracks and landed on a grassy field, a mile across the runway. I saw a familiar collection of dirt-covered, sagging GPs that I immediately realized was my new home. The sun was red in the west and the ground was soggy. We squished across the field and left our chest protectors in a tent. The two pilots named Deacon and Red escorted me to the club. Well, well, the major grinned endearingly. Our second calf pilot in two days, tall, dark-haired, and smooth-faced, he came over to me and shook my hand. Welcome to the prospectors. I'm the CEO, and as you'll find out, when I'm not around, the boys call me Ring Knocker. The boys, about fifteen of them, sat around some tables in the bamboo-paneled, tin-roofed bar, their company's club, and laughed. I nodded nervously, never having met a CEO who was friendly. Pleased to meet you," I said. "You looked me right in the eye when you said that," he grinned. "That's good. Shows you're not afraid." He turned around to the boys. "That's good," he said. They nodded. I wasn't afraid, but I was suspicious. What did he want from me? First things first," said Ring Knocker. "Hey, Red, take Mason over to your tent. He gets the empty bunk there." I started out the door with Red. When you get your gear organized, come on back. Chow will be served in about a half hour, and then we can talk. Yes, sir. He beamed. 
The tent floor was rolling red dust, but there was a plywood platform next to my cot. I sat on the cot, which was already made, and looked around. Red was smiling at me from his cot. God, they don't even have a floor, I thought. Why do they call him Ring Knocker? I said. He's a West Pointer, wears a class ring. Ah, I had never met one before. Now his aggressive, cordial manner seemed appropriate. Seems like a nice guy. Yeah, he is. A lot better than our last CEO. Nobody liked that prick. That's why he woke up one night with a knife sticking out of his chest. Red announced this as though that was the typical way in which incompetent commanders were dealt with. You're kidding. No. He was black and an asshole. We still don't know who stuck him. He was killed? No. We got him to calm wrong just in time. Red grinned. It all turned out to the good, though. The replacement CO was Ring Knocker, and he's a natural leader. You know what I mean? Though I had never met one, I thought I knew what he meant. The club I had been in was one half of the tin roofed building. The other side was their mess hall. Dinner was served by Vietnamese waitresses to groups of four sitting at cloth topped tables set with clean napkins and bronzeware. During the meal, Red told me that everything was paid for out of club dues and the meal tickets. But don't get used to it. We're never here anyway. Before we finished, I heard guitar music coming from the club on the other side of the bamboo partition. The building shook as a phantom F-4C hit its afterburner on takeoff. This was an Air Force base. The runway was a quarter mile from the prospector's camp. The prospectors were a little band of gypsies camped in a vacant corner of the walled city. A voice wailed from the club as Red and I walked in. Army aviators sing this song. It won't be long for the Viet Cong. The sky troopers sail through the air to set our traps like catching bears. Man, that's horrible, said Ring Knocker. We can change it, but it's a start, said the singer, a captain named Daring. Haw, you can take that ditty and flush it, Daring, you asshole. A pink-faced cherub of a man yelled from the bar. He was Captain King, otherwise known as Sky King. Okay, okay, goddammit. Daring glared at Sky King. Let's hear what you got. What I got goes squish, squish between Nancy's legs. Right, Nancy? Nancy, a Vietnamese girl of twenty, had special permission to work at the bar until eight o'clock. All other Vietnamese workers had to leave at dusk. No, you bad man, she blushed. To my knowledge, Nancy never cooperated with any of Sky King's vulgar requests, or anyone else's either. She was beautiful, neat, efficient, and an excellent barmaid. To all advances, she announced that she was married. Hey, Mason, Ring Knocker leaned back from his table when he saw me. Do you recognize your comrade here? He pointed to a heavy-set man sitting beside him. No, sir, I don't, I said. Ring Knocker waved me over. This is Mr. Cannon from... He looked at Cannon. Delta Company 227th, announced Cannon. From right around the corner, I said. Nice meeting you. Cannon just nodded, looking worried. Yep, Cannon flew guns in the cav, said Ring Knocker. But in our company, we assign pilots to the guns by their weight. You know how weak those B models are, especially loaded up with ammo. So all our gunship pilots are skinny fucks like you. A shock hit my body. That's why Cannon looked so worried. Ring Knocker was making him fly slicks, and he was going to make me fly guns. What's the matter? Ring Knocker said, reading my face. I fly slicks. Yeah, and I fly guns. Cannon interjected. Ring Knocker lowered his eyebrows to a more official level. Well, my policy is skinny guys in the guns, fat guys in the slicks. Besides, I don't know what you're worried about, Mason. Guns are a lot safer than slicks. Most of our hits are taken by the slicks. In the guns, you at least have something to shoot back with. A phantom roared on takeoff. Daring changed a line. Sky troopers sailing through the air. I have flown 600 hours of combat time as a slick pilot. All my experience is in slicks, and I'm still alive. I don't want to change anything I'm doing at this stage of the game. That goes for me, too, said Cannon. 
I'm still alive, and I don't want to change nothing. Six hundred hours. Ringknocker looked impressed. That's right. Shit, he said. The most anybody, even Deacon, has in our company is three hundred. Ringknocker tapped his ring on the table. Flew your ass off, eh? Yeah, and I understand slick flying. And I understand guns, said Cannon. Shit! Ringknocker looked dismayed. I have my policies, you know. Cannon sat back in his chair, looking pissed off. I was thinking another fucking bookman. Okay, okay, all right, fuck it, said Ringknocker. Fuck my policy. Cannon, you fly guns. Mason, you fly slicks. Ringknocker grinned. And that's an order. Yes, sir, I said. It's a deal, said Cannon. Setting our traps to catch them bears, droned Daring. No, no, no! Ringknocker suddenly leaned into the circle of songwriters. Horrible, horrible, horrible! Sky King dropped to his knees, holding his hands on his ears. I'm sick! He yelled. He humped over and retched loudly. Look, we get a decent song. We get invited to Saigon for two days in the sing-off. Ringknocker announced. You want to have two days to fuck off in Saigon, don't you? I sat there dumbfounded as Ringknocker explained, "A sing-off, song contest." Cannon, arms folded across his chest, looked at me and shook his head. These guys are strange. The songwriters argued. Then Daring strummed once more. This time, three other guys out of the twenty in the club sang along. While they sang, I noticed something moving on the wall. A human skull mounted above the bar moved its jaw, clacking along with the song. Sky King was pulling the string that led from the skull to the end of the bar. "Sing it, Charlie!" he yelled. "Charlie," I said to Red. "Yeah, Doc made him from a VC head we brought in." I nodded. "What else would you call a VC head?" The song ended. "Puke." Said Deacon, "You really think so?" Ringknocker asked with a worried look. Deacon was one of the two platoon leaders in the Prospectors. He was also the company's IP and part-time sage. He wore a graying flat top over a smooth and sincere face. Ringknocker trusted him implicitly. "Yes," said Deacon. "Well," Ringknocker shook his head. "We'll just have to keep trying." The prospectors left at dawn. I stayed behind with another warrant named Staglioni. We were to bring out a slick that was being repaired. Staglioni told me that four or five ships in the company were already out in the field at Non Co. That's what we usually do. We have some guys go ahead and set up camp while the rest of us come back here to take a break. Staglioni was tall and soft and dark. His accent was New York to me. Flatbush, that's in Brooklyn," he said. "So we just wait until the ship is ready and then fly out. That's it. Maintenance told me it should be ready tomorrow morning. We watched a flight of four Phantoms take off. When they hit their afterburners on the climb out, it was like thunder. Looks like fun," I said. "It is," said Staglioni. "I tried it once. You flew a Phantom? Yeah, you could too if you wanted. They come over here all the time." They like to trade flight time. They want to fly Hueys. Yeah, they're all the time betting that they can hover a chopper first time up. I bet they can't. You're right. None of them have so far. One of their pilots even flew a mission with us one day. He hated it. He felt like we were too close to everything, you know, right down in it. They really don't see much on their strikes. They aim at puffs of smoke in the jungle, drop their shit, and bam, they're back home. Their total time in the air from takeoff to landing is one hour and twenty minutes. It's a quickie. Then they hop in an air-conditioned van and cruise back to the club, and that's it for the day. A hundred missions and they go home. He paused for a minute while a phantom came in for a landing. Can you imagine a hundred missions? Shit, I'd be back home twice already. You guys log missions? No, not officially. I keep my own log. The last time I told one of the Air Force guys how many missions I'd flown, he said, "What do you expect? The smart pilots are in the Air Force." That fucker. I watched another Phantom take off. 
If I had stayed in college, I lamented, I would be flying those and living on the other side of the runway. It's true, I said. What is? The smart pilots are in the Air Force. The camp was a dirty fabric ghost town. The trail that led from the club past the row of ten GPs was completely deserted. Staglioni went to his tent, and I went to mine. I wrote Patience a letter to bring her up to date and give her my new address. A Vietnamese woman dressed in black pajamas ducked in through the tent flaps. She nodded as she walked by. She walked to the other end of the tent and began to sweep the dirt floor with a bamboo whisk broom, drawing neat parallel lines in the dust. When she got to me, she bowed slightly and then waited expectantly for me to raise my feet off the plywood platform. I raised my feet and she swept under them. Then she began making up the beds. There were four in the GP. When she got to me again, she bowed. Her smile was black from betel nut, and she waited for me to get up. I jumped up. Oh, I said. Ah, she said. She stripped the whole cot, remade it, and carefully rearranged my gear. Folded flak vest here, forty-five and its holster on top there, just so. She stood back and shared with me her artistic arrangement and nodded that I could place my ass back on the blanket. Thank you, I said. She grinned beetle black and ducked outside. So, even if the army had drawn the dreary side of the field and the dreary domiciles, Ringknocker had gone to some lengths, allowing some luxuries to brighten the dreariness. I hadn't seen anything yet. I walked back and forth in the tent for a while. I ducked outside to watch a phantom take off and nodded to a passing hooch maid. I wanted to go talk to Staglioni, but he had said he was in the middle of a good book. I remembered mine. I was in the middle of the second volume of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Gollum was slithering down cliffs head first as he followed Bilbo. I identified with Gollum and loved his voice. Yes, he said. I tried talking that way back in the cab. Yes, we likes to go on missions. But people thought I was developing a lisp. No one knew who Gollum was. The most popular books were James Bond adventures. While I read, something went wrong with my brain. Something had to be wrong, because instead of lying back with the book on my lap, the book was on the dirt floor, and I was reaching for my forty-five and saying, What? What? I roamed the tent, looking in corners. I looked outside. What? Something was very wrong. I was tense. I was ready. I waited. A dark head pushed through the flaps. That? As I drew my pistol, I saw it was Staglioni. Ciao, he said, and ducked back outside. He had not seen my gun. Abruptly, the feeling of impending doom passed. A danger was passed. What the danger had been, I didn't know, but it was gone. I holstered the forty-five and walked to the mess hall. I sat at a table with Staglioni and two Air Force pilots from across the base. All during the meal I kept worrying about what I had just done. There wasn't anything wrong. It's me. I'm going crazy. Want to try it? The Air Force lieutenant asked. Try what? Fly a Phantom. I fly slicks. I know. You want to trade a ride? He looked at me quizzically. No. The Huey was not ready the next day, or the next. Each day I waited, the routine was much the same. Breakfast, read. Lunch, read. Dinner, read, sleep. The routine was punctuated by moments of non-specific terror. I spent my nights hopping up out of bed looking for the source of my fears. One afternoon, while I read at a table in the club, I blacked out. One moment I was reading normally. The next thing I knew, my face was resting on the pages. That scared me into taking my tortured soul over to the flight surgeon on the Air Force side of the base. I have these dizzy spells. I keep waking up at night thinking that I'm dying, and yesterday my face fell into my book, I shamefully admitted. Take off your clothes, said the doctor, with sympathetic fascination. What does that have to do with anything? I'm going to give you a neurological examination. And he did. 
He poked me with pins, scraped my soles, tapped my elbows and knees. He had me follow fingers and lights with my eyes, stand on one foot, then touch my fingertips with my eyes closed. And when he finally looked into my eyes with his ophthalmoscope, he said, Hmm. Find something? I asked. Nope, nothing at all. All your circuits check out fine. So why am I having these blank spells and dizziness? I don't know. I sagged with disappointment. It could be a couple of things, he added hastily. You might have a rare form of epilepsy, which I doubt, or you're suffering from stress. I would think that with the kind of job you have, it's stress. But I suggest you check with your own flight surgeon when you get to see him. If you keep having the symptoms, they'll probably ground you. Four days after I had arrived, a week after leaving the CAV, I joined my new unit in the field at Non Co. The prospector's ships were parked in a narrow airstrip cut into the jungle by the French. The camp was up on a hill next to the strip. I carried my gear up and found Deacon, and he showed me to one of the twenty-six-sided tents scattered around the sandy, weedy dunes at the top of the hill. My tent mates were two warrants, Monk and Stoopy Stoddard. Hey, a new guy, said Monk. He looked up from filing magazine clippings in a shoebox. He had square jaws and a compact, sturdy body. But, he squinted in the glare of the light behind me, I'd say you're not new to Nam. He was looking at my belt buckle. The green tape that covered it was filthy and almost black, the mark of the veteran. That's right, I'm a transfer from the CAV. Really? said Stoddard. The CAV? That's a tough outfit. Stoopy was an overweight child of a man who said irritating things like gosh and wow and even neat. I nodded and said, Can I put my gear over here? I pointed to the back of the tent. Sure, said Stoddard. I threw my bag against the cloth wall and sat on it. Monk resumed filing his clippings. Ragged copies of Stars and Stripes, Newsweek, Time, and other magazines lay strewn in the dirt around his bedroll. He carefully cut each item with a Swiss Army scissors, then flipped through alphabetized index cards to find its proper place. Are you a writer? I asked. Monk, a writer? Stoopy giggled. His belly and fat cheeks shook. I noticed chocolate stains on his lips and then saw the chocolate bar grasped in a grubby hand. He thinks you're a writer, Monk, he laughed brightly. Monk shot him a glance that killed the laughter immediately. Stoopy blinked hard and sat quietly and respectfully. No, not yet, said Monk. I'm just collecting my material. Some day. He trailed off, apparently avoiding a touchy subject. That's an impressive amount of stuff you got there. I nodded at the shoebox. Thanks, I've got more. He pointed to four more rubber-banded boxes resting against the tent wall. Some day you'd be surprised to know what they're saying about this war. He nodded slowly and knowingly. I signaled agreement. Well, 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 look who's here, said a voice from the flap. Wolf! Wow, Mason, what a memory! We both laughed. Wolf was a former classmate. I didn't know you were with the prospectors, I said. I was one of the schmucks that set up this camp. I was out here when you arrived. Well, you picked a nice place. Thanks. Monk seemed irritated by Wolf's intrusion. He rolled a rubber band off his wrist around the shoebox and stashed it carefully with the others. Then he stood up and squeezed past Wolf without saying a word. Wolf ignored him as he left. Apparently they were not friendly. Wolf and I talked a while. He had arrived in country a month before. He was very impressed that I was a short timer with only two months to go in my tour. I told him I had been in the CAV, and that I had recently talked to some classmates of ours up near Kantum. We shared rumors concerning the whereabouts of the rest of the class, and agreed that probably most of them were somewhere in Nam. Somebody called that it was chow time, and Stoopy, whom we had completely ignored, leapt outside. As we emerged from the tent, we saw a monk balanced on his hands, walking up a small sand dune. That's pretty good, I said as we walked away. The guy's a jerk, said Wolf sourly.
That evening, I delivered a letter from the Air Force doctor to Doc Da Vinci, our flight surgeon. He agreed that it was probably just a stress reaction and gave me some tranquilizers to take. He warned me to use them only at night. I couldn't fly with them. I slept well that night. The next morning, I was back in the saddle in a Huey. The aircraft commander was my platoon leader, Deacon. We flew three missions of local ass and trash, single ship stuff. Deacon let me do all the flying. In four hours that morning, I landed in a clearing so small I had to hover vertically down, also landed on a tight pinnacle, carried two loads that were so heavy I had to make running takeoffs, and finally joined up with three other ships in a formation flight back to the airstrip. I had been thoroughly checked out. Damn good flying, Deacon said from the left seat as I landed behind another Huey back at the airstrip. Thanks, I replied. Coming from an IP, that was a real compliment. If you fly that good again tomorrow, I'll sign you off as an aircraft commander. The next day was also the prospector's last day at Nonco. So, at the end of another day of local ass and trash, we flew directly back to Phan Rang. Other ships brought the tents and gear back. I did fly well, and true to his word, Deacon signed me off as a qualified aircraft commander. On the walk to the company area, Deacon told me that Ringknocker was arranging another big party. We seldom get a break like this. We'll be here four days. Ringknocker likes to see the men enjoy themselves. I'd roll my bedroll up if I were you, Deacon said. Roll up my bedroll? Yeah, just roll your mattress up and tie it. Why? You'll see. It was nine o'clock and the party was in full swing. Doc Da Vinci sat next to me at the bar and explained how he had prepared the skull that now sang on the wall. He was drunk. The members of the songwriting team sat facing each other in a circle of chairs in a far corner, producing sounds that clashed with the Joan Baez tape. They were drunk. Sky King and Red Blakely Indian wrestled in the middle of the floor. Sky King held a brimming mug of beer, claiming that he would not spill a drop while he dispatched Red. I boiled it, said Da Vinci. In the kitchen? I asked, interested. No, no, they wouldn't let me do it in the kitchen. I built a fire out back and boiled it there. Boiled it a whole day. I glanced at the skull, clacking with Baez's words, admiring the clean, gleaming white of it. It's so... white. Not naturally. I bleached it after I pulled off the meat. I drank some bourbon and nodded. Of course. I put my drink down. Bleach. It's a fact, Da Vinci said. Clorox will give your skull a whiter, brighter look. They're coming, Sky King yelled. Everyone stopped talking. I could hear a siren wailing in the distance. You rolled your bed up? Deacon had walked up to me. Yeah, smart boy, he said. Who's coming? I asked, Doc. The ladies, of course. The siren got louder, then stopped. Somebody outside said, Back her up! In the light that shone through the windows, I could see the rear end of an army ambulance moving toward the open door. It stopped, and someone opened the back. Packed inside were at least a dozen smiling Vietnamese women. All the prospectors were standing, applauding, whistling, while the ladies were helped out of the ambulance. It's hard to say what happened next, except that once the women were all inside the club, they began to disappear. Men grabbed giggling girls and ran out the doors into the night. It all happened in minutes. I sat there on the bar stool, open-mouthed. I had just seen an ambulance back up, unload a bunch of whores, and they were carried away? There must be some kind of rule against that, I said. Hey, it's our ambulance, Doc said. If that happened in the cab, everyone here would be up for a court-martial. I shook my head in disbelief. It works great, said Doc. The security guards never stop an ambulance. Best damn thing we ever traded for. You traded for an ambulance? Yeah, Ringknocker got an ambulance, a deuce and a half, and a jeep for one Huey. A Huey? I shook my head. Yeah, a Huey. It was one of ours that got shot to shit. It was declared a total loss, and its number was taken off the registers. It was just wreckage when Ringknocker made the trade. 
Part of the deal was that our maintenance guys would piece it back together. It looks like shit, but it flies. That's incredible. I know. Ring Knocker has got a creative mind. It had been only fifteen minutes since the girls were carried off when one of them walked back into the club escorted by her partner. Next! he called out. Doc slapped my shoulder and nodded toward the girl. It'll change your luck, he grinned. No thanks. I'm still fighting a case of clap, I said. Inside I was awed by their style. These prospectors were out of a dream. You go ahead. Not me. Every time I try to examine them, they get pissed off. He blew a kiss to the girl. No, you, she said, shaking her finger. Doc laughed loudly. She left with someone, and two more came inside. Silver wings upon their chests, flying above America's best. We will stop the Viet Cong, and you can bet it won't take long. I had forgotten about the songwriters. They were still in their corner rehearsing their latest lyrics, apparently undisturbed by the intrusion of the lovelies. I left the party at one o'clock. The girls had been sent back out through the gates in the blaring ambulance, but the prospectors partied on. Okay, we're taking two ships. Deacon, you pick a crew. I'll fly the other with Daring. Ringknocker held a briefing at a table in the mess hall the next morning. Deacon and Daring nodded. I watched from the next table while I ate fresh scrambled eggs. The target is the repair and utility compound here. Ringknocker pointed to his frayed map. The R&U compound was a fenced-in field at another Air Force base, heavily guarded, surrounded by all sorts of security, where the civilian contractors stored their mountains of building supplies. Such things as tin roofing, lumber, air conditioners, refrigerators, sinks, toilets, everything needed to build a truly American base. Now I'm trying for an ice maker, but anything will do, Ringknocker explained. Deacon, I want you to fly cover while I go down. Keep me posted when the guards start moving our way. Deacon nodded. Okay, let's go. The group of men got up and left, dressed for a mission. Ringknocker's Huey came back an hour later carrying a huge wooden crate on a sling. He landed it on the back of his deuce and a half, which drove it immediately to the maintenance area. When they opened the crate, they discovered that it contained another refrigerator, just like the one they already had. Ringknocker was happy anyway, and by late the next day, he had arranged to trade the refrigerator to an Air Force unit on the other side of the base for a brand new ice making machine. For the next two months, wherever we went in the field, someone got the job of moving the 500 pound ice machine as part of our field gear. On the afternoon of the fourth day of the break, Deacon told me to take a ship up to our headquarters and pick up two new pilots. I flew with Sky King, who chattered during the entire 30 minute flight. He was a happy man and very likable. His total disregard for army formalities made me forget that he was a captain. We landed at the sandy pad at headquarters, shut down and walked to the tent with the mail courier. From a hundred yards away, I thought I recognized one of two men carrying flight bags on their shoulders. Those must be the two pilots, said Sky King. I nodded, staring at the distant, frail figure who sagged under the weight of a giant flight bag. I knew that walk. Shit, I said with a wide grin on my face. How far do I have to go to get away from you? The two men were twenty feet away. Damn, they told me there wasn't a chance you'd be in this unit, Wrestler replied. I helped him carry his bag back to the ship. Chapter 12 La Juerilla Bonita Neither conscience nor sanity suggests that the United States is, should, or could be a global gendarme. The U.S. has no mandate from on high to police the world, and no inclination to do so. Robert S. McNamara, in Time, May 27, 1966. June, 1966. It struck me as ironic that the prospectors, located 200 miles south of the Cav, were assigned to Dak To, the Cav's last hunting ground. Within a month of my transfer, I found myself once again scouring for V.C. in an area in which the Cav had drawn a blank. 
This time I flew with a different unit in support of the famous 101st Airborne in Operation Hawthorne. The VC had chosen not to fight the CAV, but apparently they thought they'd try their luck against the 101st. Our camp was west of the village of Dakto, in a grassy plain south of some low foothills. Our tents were set up in three straight lines, paralleling the red dirt airstrip. A mile from our camp, the 101st bivouacked and maintained security for themselves and for the prospectors. We spent a day filling sandbags to build low walls around our tents. On the morning of the second day, it was announced that we would fly a little mission for some ARVNs before we started direct support of the 101st. The best thing that could happen to you is to get a minor bone wound, said Wolf. He stood in the awning of the tent I shared with Wrestler and Stoddard. A bone wound? I feel weak just thinking about it, I said. I am saying that if you had to get wounded, that's the one to get. A bone wound will get you out of this fucking country. Deacon walked down the row between the tents. Let's go, he yelled. How about no wounds, I said. Maybe they'll just call the whole thing off. I reached for my helmet. My forty-five was already strapped on over my flak vest. I was ready. Fat fucking chance, said Wolf. Good luck. Gary ducked out of the tent to go to his ship. He and I couldn't fly together in the prospectors because they didn't let Junior Warrens do that. We felt safer together, especially since the pilot who replaced me back in the cab, Ron Fox, had been killed sitting in the cockpit with Gary. He had taken a round up through his chin. Gary said that his brains poured out when they removed his helmet. Fox's death was one of the reasons they had sent Gary on a R and R on the way to the prospectors. We'd both been working on Deacon to let us fly together, told him what a great team we'd made in the cab, but so far no dice. Good luck, I said. I left the tent walking a little way with Wolf. What do you get for a scratch? I said. A free cup of coffee. What do you think? You got to get something that takes time to heal but won't be a permanent handicap. Yeah, I see. I'll work on it. I saw Sky King waiting for me by the operations tent. See you after the mission. Good luck. Right. Wolf gave me a salute. Sky King smiled. Hey, this is my lucky day. I get to fly with a veteran. I feel so secure. Yeah, yeah. Spare me, please. No, really. Just being in the same ship with you makes me feel like everything's going to be okay. We walked toward our ship. One pair of pilots in a long, straggling line of helicopter crews, walking over the red dirt to their ships. You know, you can be a pain in the ass, sir. Ha! Sky King yelped. Got you. We walked up to our ship. You know, Mason, I like you, and to prove it, I'm going to let you in on a little business deal. I'll tell you all about it when we get back. Thanks. No, really, you'll love it. You'll see. One thing different about the prospectors, aside from such informal relations between officers and warrants, was that they had chest protectors up to their eyeballs. They had so many, in fact, that they kept the extras up in the chin bubbles. Seeing one of them at my feet made me feel guilty. For the lack of one of these, Morris had died. Maybe there was another pilot somewhere in Vietnam right now who was wondering why the fuck he didn't have one. Maybe one was dying right now. How did you get so many of these things? I pointed to the armor. We've always had them, said Sky King. He looked at me like I had asked a dumb question. Why? Just wondered. The weather was great. Puffy white clouds in a brilliant blue sky. A nice day for flying. Since I had been here once before, I knew that there were no VC around. I felt that I had retired from heavy action after leaving the cab. My only concern was the ARVNs. I kept hearing such bad stories about them. A prospector told me that an ARVN had turned and fired at his ship when he dropped them at an LZ. I had heard that before. We picked up eight ARVN Rangers wearing tight, tailored camouflage uniforms. They stared nervously, smoked cigarettes, and got aboard reluctantly. They did not bolster my sagging opinion of our ally. The twelve slicks in the mission were to fly the ARVNs a few miles up the valley from Dakto. 
There, we would cut across the eastern ridge and land two at a time on an eight-foot-wide ridge running to a small concrete fortress. While the flight stretched to get the necessary spacing, we heard on the radio that the VC were there, too. From a couple miles away, I could see a daisy chain of phantoms hitting the hill directly across the small valley from the fortress. Sky King and I were to be one of the second pair of ships to land. As the first two ships landed, they called hits. From several VC machine gun emplacements on the facing hill, tracers flicked out at the phantoms. The fighters swooped, releasing monstrous bursts of cannon during their blindingly swift passes. The tracers converged on them. I had the controls on the right side of the ship. Our buddy ship was taking a spot just in front of the fortress, leaving us the stark ridge nearest to VC guns. I set up the approach. The two ships in front of us took off after what seemed to be an awfully long time on the ground. With a hundred yards to go, our right door gunner opened up on some muzzle flashes. At the same time, a phantom began billowing black smoke in the middle of his strike. He climbed up sharply in an almost vertical climb, and we saw one man eject. As we landed, I saw grazing rounds kick through the dirt on the ridge in front of us. The emplacement was just a little higher than we were. The right door gunner blazed away, and I waited for the ARVNs to get the fuck out. When the crew chief hadn't called that they were off for what seemed to be an hour, I looked back and saw him trying to force an ARVN off the ship from his awkward position in the pocket. The other ARVNs kept ducking their heads in the gunfire, waiting with wide-eyed anticipation for me to leave. I shook my head and started screaming, Get off! Get off! and pointed at the door. They sat there. I heard a round go through the airframe. The old familiar tick. The crew chief pulled his forty-five and pointed it at the soldiers, waving it toward the door with murder in his eyes. When they saw I wasn't going to go anywhere and that the crew chief might indeed kill them, they began to get off. I looked at the fortress to see if we were getting any cover fire. No one in sight. No guns were in action. Everyone was on the dirt behind the walls. The black, billowing trail of the phantom disappeared in the jungle. A pearl-white shoot blossomed in the blue sky. Our buddy ship took off. They're out, yelled the chief. I glanced across the deck through the door to the ARVNs hiding on the low side of the ridge. I took off. As we crossed in front of the fortress, we saw the defenders lying low. Not one gun was in position. A half mile away it was over for us. That was it. One load to the ridge. I cruised the five miles back to the camp, steaming. I've never seen anything like that. How the fuck are they going to win this stupid war if they fight like that? Sky King nodded gravely and said nothing. He'd worked with ARVNs before. When we landed, I thanked the crew chief, Blakely, for using his brains and getting the ARVNs off. Any time, sir. Next time I'll do it sooner, he grinned. We all went around the ship to count hits. There was one. It was hard to believe that they had shot down a phantom and missed us as we parked on the ridge, but that was the way it was. Lucky, 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 said Sky King. Astounding, I said. We walked back to the ops tent and waited for the rest of the gaggle to return. Wolf just got hit, said Major Richard Ramon, the operations officer, as we walked inside. Friend of yours, isn't he? He looked at me. Yes, sir, a classmate. Well, he got his arm messed up. He'll be here in a minute. He shook his head. Hell of a way to start the day. I kept seeing ARVN asses glued to the deck of my ship. Daring's boys are out there now trying to get that gun position, said Ramon. And we had a slick and a gun out looking for the Air Force pilot. One? I asked. Yeah, your friend Wrestler picked him up. The other guy never got out. Poor bastard. Two more Hueys cruised in fast, low-level down the airstrip. When they landed, Wolf staggered out, helped by the crew chief. He held his arm across his chest, dripping blood down his pants. Doc Da Vinci met them halfway and walked them to the tent. Wolf was pale, as if all his blood had drained out of his arm. He smiled blankly at me as Doc used scissors to cut his sleeve away. Fuckers shot my smokes, exclaimed Wolf. With his arm down, we could see that his chest protector pocket was blown away. 
revealing the ceramic strata beneath the green cloth. The round had torn through his right forearm and blasted into his chest protector. Do you see that? The fuckers blew away my smokes. I nodded and handed him a lit cigarette. Can you move your fingers? asked Doc. Sure, Wolf puffed the smoke. Well, move them. I am. Doc looked at Wolf. I think you're going to get home on this one. I told you, Mason, a bone wound will do it every time. I raised a weak smile. You got it right. Doc wrapped Wolf's arm in a bunch of bandages, while Sky King and I went back out to the flight line to get the ship ready. We were going to fly him to play coup. During the flight, Wolf chain-smoked cigarettes handed him by the crew chief. When I dropped him at the hospital at Play Coup, his color was better, and he was smiling like a man who just won a lottery. He had landed right after me in the same spot on the ridge. I almost wished it had been the other way around. This ends Side 1 of Cassette 9. Later that day, Sky King and I flew out to lift a load of grunts from the 101st to rescue the ARVNs and back. We had experienced fairly heavy fire the second time out, but no hits. Meanwhile, Daring's gun platoon was swooping all around the hill, trying to get at the emplacement. It seemed impossible that the gooks could last through the Phantom Strike and a whole gunship platoon, but they had. When the sun dropped behind the ridge, the guns came back one by one. They had taken many hits. Two pilots had been wounded and were taken immediately to play coup. Where the fuck is 702? Major Ramon asked no one in particular. A group of us sat around in the operations tent listening to the radios. 702 was the last of the gunships out there. He had called five minutes before that he had been hit, but then there was silence. Let's get somebody back out there, Ringknocker spoke from the tent door. Maybe he forgot how to get back here. He frowned at his own joke. Then we all heard the familiar whopping of rotors, and in the dusky light we saw the ship skid across the dirt fast and slide to a stop on the strip. Fancy landing, somebody said. With a collective sigh of relief, the crowd began to break up. I stopped outside with some others because something odd was happening with 702. Nobody was getting out. The ship just stood there hissing. Its rotors swung lazily. Somebody ran over to the ship and started waving frantically, calling for Doc. All four people on board were unconscious from wounds. While they loaded the crew of 702 on a slick going to play coup, I walked back to the tent. Stoddard was showing Wrestler a six-foot section of a Huey tail rotor drive shaft tube. As I got closer, I could see a bullet hole in the tube. My first hit said Stoddard proudly. Ressler nodded agreeably but cautiously. Stoopy had taken the hit early in the day and had had the crew chief give him the ungainly trophy. Going to take this thing back home, said Stoopy. I was feeling kind of guilty for thinking that Stoopy was a jerk. He was just a little too exuberant or something. You're a moron, said Ressler. I laughed for a long while. So, this is the deal, Sky King talked as we sat in the mess tent. Ice. What are you talking about? Ice, man. Sky King's eyes gleamed in the light of the mess tent's bare bulb. Our generator grumbled and popped in a hole fifty feet away. This is the business deal you were talking about? That's it, Kimosabe. Ring knockers agreed. We start taking a ship down to Kantum every day and load it up with ice, you know, big blocks of ice. We bring it back here and sell it to our own mess, the company's beer tent, and the rest we unload to the grunts at the 101st. We'll charge the grunts enough to pay for our ice. Nice deal, eh? The prospectors get free ice. We have an ice machine. We do, but it only makes chipped ice, and just barely enough for drinks. We're talking about big 25-kilo blocks of ice to cool the beer. Besides, there'll be a profit, and we can use the money for the club. What do you think? What do you want me to do? I said. Just volunteer to fly down with me every day. Sure, why not? Exactly, partner. 
We couldn't land a Huey in downtown Khantoum to get ice. Sky King had arranged for a truck from a nearby special forces camp. The deal was that we could use their truck and driver if we let them use our Huey and a pilot. On the first day of the ice business, Sky King took the truck into town while I flew the special forces CO, a lieutenant named Bricklin, on his jungle patrol. We covered his normal route through the scrub and jungle at low level in 20 minutes. The same trip via Ankle Express took him and his Chinese mercenaries a full day to complete. Naturally, he couldn't see much from a speeding helicopter, nothing like what he could have seen had he walked, but he could honestly report that he had covered the entire route. This made him and his men very happy. Only 15 or 20 of the 200 men at this camp were Americans. The rest were Chinese mercenaries from Saigon. When we landed back at the compound, Bricklin pointed out the arrangement, indicating that that side was for the Chinese, this for the Americans. Bricklin was a tall and lean Montanan. He, like most of the special forces, was of the old school concerning the proper way to handle the war. Charlie was treated somewhat like a band of mischievous outlaws whose chances of actually taking over the country were non-existent. Bricklin believed that with the Americans dominating the Kantum area, the people would eventually come to trust the Americans and their ways, especially if the Americans educated their children and supplied medical care and other material goodies that even backward peasants come to crave when they are exposed to them. Bricklin had begun to point out the advantages of the patient method of converting the Vietnamese versus the so-called war of attrition when he saw the calves' horse patch on my right shoulder. The only trouble with those guys, said Bricklin, is they kill a lot of people that just happen to get in the way. Every time a villager or his water buffalo gets killed, the V.C. boys talk it up real big. See how much the Americans love you, they say. Killed old Mrs. Koa yesterday, and she was 75 and never hurt a bug. Of course, old Charlie had come through the same village and executed the honchos, but who trusts politicians anyway? These widescreen raids the CAV and other units are doing are wrecking everything these people have. Sure, they beat the NVA units and the VC units, but they're ignoring the stomping they're doing to the people we're trying to help. And this relocation thing is about equal to dying as far as the villagers are concerned. These people are born, grow up, and die, all in the same village, the village of their ancestors. That village is everything to them. So what do we do? We come marching through, burn it down to keep the V.C. from occupying it, and move the people out to God knows where and turn them overnight into refugees and welfare cases and honest-to-God American haters. The V.C. are winning because we're losing. Bricklin had said all that before he popped a beer inside the small metal building they called their club. Just show them by example. Show the V.C. how good the American way is and they'll come around. These people will go the way that works. Bricklin and I sat at a folding table in the small bar. I drank a cup of coffee while he drank beer. I had to fly. Everything about the place was easy going. Even the slot machine was easy. The machine's covers were off. You could see the gears and wheels and the money box. You could reclaim your losses by reaching into the back. Bricklin's philosophy got me into a political mood. Do you think we ought to be here in the first place? I asked. Well, that's another question altogether, isn't it? Fact is, we are here. To me, it's the question. You may be right, but things like this are real hard to stop once they get going. I think we're going to be here a real long time. Do you think we'll win? Not if we keep busting up the villages and killing the people we're trying to save, we won't. A lot of people say that if we had allowed the Vietnamese to have their elections, they would have voted for Ho Chi Minh, and there wouldn't be any war. Bricklin nodded. Yeah, I've read that too, and it's probably true. But like I say, we're here now. So why can't we just pull out? Do you think LBJ would ever walk out on this gunfight? No. You're right, Bricklin said, and smiled. The ice truck rolled through the gate and stopped by the bar. Sky King got out and pushed through the screen door. Man, the prices around here. 
He sat down beside me. Fuckers charged two fifty for a fifty-pound block. The same thing cost seventy-five cents at Fon Rong. Well, we had the Cav come through here a month ago, said Bricklin. Those guys paid whatever the people asked for. Ruined them for bargaining. They just don't understand the locals. He winked at me. Sky King had a beer and talked to Bricklin. He told him that the deal was working fine, and if it was okay by him, we'd be coming down every day. Just make yourselves at home, said Bricklin, and bring your Huey. We walked out to the ship as the last of the blocks were put on board. There was a total of twenty blocks, a thousand pounds of ice, packed wetly on the deck. I cranked up. Because of the extra weight, I couldn't hover up over the flagpole, so I turned the ship around and took off the way we came in. As we headed up the valley on the thirty-mile flight back to Dakto, Sky King smoked cigarettes, chattered about the business, and nervously watched the cargo melting in the warm hundred-mile-an-hour wind. Shit, we'll be lucky to get back with half the ice we bought, he said. How about we close the doors? He asked the crew chief. If we do that, sir, we can't get to our guns," said the chief. "Oh yeah," he turned to me. "Next trip, we got to bring a tarp to put over that stuff." He turned around, watching the cargo. "Shit! Look at it go! Each one of those drops is a fucking dime." "We're almost there," I said. "Thank God! Can you imagine getting back to the company with a fifty-dollar puddle? Ring knocker'd kill me." He laughed. I landed on the strip at a spot near the mess hall. A truck pulled out, and the crew began unloading the ice as I shut down. From there, it was trucked to one of our tents, where it entered a complicated distribution system that delivered ice to our company, the nearby engineers, and the 101st before dark. Being in the ice business gave me the trading material I needed to build a bunker. Both Gary and I were nervous about being mortared. The prospectors thought we were overreacting. They had never been mortared. We enlisted Stoddard's help. He was an energetic excavator. Within a day, with Stoopy doing most of the digging, we had a four by four hole six feet deep. While Gary and Stoopy filled sandbags to wall the bunker, I took a jeep over to the engineers and struck a deal with the captain there. He gave me three sheets of PSP for one block of ice. I took the steel planks on account and brought them back. We layered three levels of sandbags on top of them. It was a snug little bunker, and though we knew it probably could not withstand a direct hit, it might, and that gave us great comfort. Meanwhile, the prospectors laughed, but Gary and I knew better. That evening, Gary and I sat on our bunker. Quietly talking about going home, we were now short timers with less than seventy days to go. They say they're going to use short timers only on non-combat missions during their last month. Gary sipped his daily Budweiser. I heard. I think a great plan would be to take a leave ten days before that. When you come back, you're finished fighting. Just fly rice and stuff around back at Fan Rong. You going to? Yeah. Why not? We could both get a leave together. I found some great places in Taipei. I heard it's better in Hong Kong. It is, eh? Okay, Hong Kong. I've never been there. You want to take a leave there? Yeah. By the end of the first week, we had lifted companies of grunts from the 101st into positions at the north end of the valley. They were getting into firefights, but nothing big. We also established an artillery position in the foothills. Placed so that it controlled the semicircle in which the 101st fanned out, intelligence had reported that there was at least a battalion-sized NVA unit out there, and the 101st was eager to make contact. My schedule was always blank in the afternoons, and I continued flying the ice runs. After a few days, Sky King and I had worked out a procedure in which the one of us who stayed with Bricklin could drink. While the one who went for the ice stayed dry, so that there would be at least one sober pilot to fly back. This made the daily flights more enjoyable. I was beginning to like being a prospector. They might be eccentric, but they got the job done and had a good time doing it. And except for the six casualties we experienced on that first day, no one had been hurt, 
It was almost pleasant. Things seemed to be going well with the prospectors. Joviality reigned among them while the action lulled. But something was different about us when compared to the outside world, as we demonstrated the next day. Most people were in camp when a Chinook landed from Saigon. Ringknocker went out to greet four Red Cross girls as they stepped out of the back of the ship. Deacon joined Ringknocker, and the two of them escorted the girls back toward the camp. I was sitting on my cot, watching the party coming our way. Looking down the tent row, I noticed that everybody had disappeared. The place had suddenly become a ghost town. Gary peered out at the women and announced, Donut dollies, but stayed inside. As Ringknocker walked the girls down the company street, obviously looking for someone to introduce them to, he could find no one. The girls began to look nervous as they peered into the dark tents, occasionally seeing a shadowed face peering silently back. They walked down the line of tents and back. Ringknocker and Deacon escorted them back to the Chinook. Meanwhile, the crew of the Chinook had deposited a pile of cardboard boxes on the airstrip. We watched Ringknocker nodding as someone explained them. The worried girls shook Ringknocker's hand, looked quizzically around the deserted camp, and boarded their ship. Minutes later, they were gone. When the ship was safely away, the prospectors reappeared as if nothing had happened. Why did they do that? I asked Gary. Why did you do that? I don't know. I just couldn't go out and meet them. We all must be nuttier than we think. I mean, round eyes. Everybody talks about seeing round eyes again, and here they were five minutes ago, and we all hid? Gratuitous issue, Deacon pointed to the boxes. What's that? asked Gary. Free stuff from the Red Cross. We walked over and drew gifts of soap, combs, toothpaste, and cartons of cigarettes. And everyone looked guilty. They came bearing gifts, and we shunned them. Sky King ran out to the airstrip and cupped his hands to his mouth. Come back, he yelled. Come back! I watched the sagging top of my mosquito bar from inside. Wrestler kept the light on and wrote letters. Lying on my back, I noticed that I would have to find another place to put my electric shaver and assorted junk that I kept on top of the mosquito netting. It sagged too much. Stoopy was buried under his blankets asleep. One nice thing about the highlands, it was cool at night. Gary turned off his flashlight, and for a while I heard him wrestling with his cot and blankets as he tucked in the mosquito netting. Then it was quiet. From far away I could hear the occasional noises of battle. The 101st was getting more action every day. I could not sleep. I stared into the darkness and thought about how it would feel to be out of the combat assaults. Gary and I had requested leave to start in two weeks. If all went as planned, we would both be into our last thirty days when we got back. A barrage of artillery sounded in the distance. I felt tense. After nearly a year of unconscious listening, I could instantly tell incoming rounds from outgoing, even if I was sleeping next to the artillery or mortar positions. There was something ominous about the noise from the north end of the valley. The electric razor above me sparked. My throat tightened in fear. The booby trap? The sparks grew to a white blaze. From the intensity of a Fourth of July sparkler, it suddenly blazed to a blinding white flame. I rolled out of the cot onto the ground and stood up. Flickering shadows were cast by the intense blaze. The inside of the tent was brighter than daylight. Gary, fire! I shouted as I backed into a tent rope. The dazzling light flickered green through the canvas of the tent. When Gary said, What's the matter? The light flicked off. I stood out in the cool night in my underwear, sweating and shivering. Gary was beside me. What's the matter? His voice was calm. You didn't see a fire? What fire? In the tent. My razor blew up. You didn't see it? I didn't see anything. Come on, I'll show you. I walked cautiously back into the tent. Stoddard was still asleep. 
I used Gary's flashlight and shined it on the top of the mosquito bar. My razor gleamed in the light, intact. I touched it cautiously, then picked it up. It was cold. How can that be? It was burning, as bright as a magnesium flare. I saw it. Bob, nothing burned. Look, I've got spots from looking at it in my eyes right now. No one can see another person's spots. They're the proof. That razor burned. I stopped when I understood the words that I spoke. I had never seen anything more clearly in my life, but here I stood with Gary, in the tent, holding the razor. The razor had not burned and blazed and blinded me, at least not so that anybody else could see. I walked over to Da Vinci, who stood by our bunker, I told him exactly what I had seen in detail. He nodded as I explained. Here. He handed me a small pill. What's this? It'll help you sleep. I'll give you another one tomorrow night, too. Try to relax. I am relaxed. Or I was. Try harder. The next night we watched the sky over the north end of the valley fill with tracer tongues of fire from Puff. The NVA were overrunning the artillery position. Four ships from Daring's gun platoon were in the middle of it, flying back and forth in front of the artillery piece under attack. Of the four cannon there, that one was now separated from the others as the NVA concentrated on it. Puff, the DC-3 with the Gatlings, blasted unbroken tongues of fire from the black sky. Flares popped white, dazzling and swinging over the battle. The NVA kept closing in. The tube was depressed for point-blank fire. One of the gunship pilots told us that when the NVA swarmed into the gun position, the men were so mixed that they had to stop firing. The gun was taken. We were on alert all night. By three in the morning, when we still hadn't been called to do a night assault, I went to bed. Another little magic pill, and I slept. By dawn the next morning, the tube had been recaptured by the 101st, with the considerable help of our gunships. Captain John Niven came by early and said that he and I were going out. We were going to try to get some ammo to a trapped company. Niven said in a friendly way that I was a better pilot than he. As the aircraft commander, he chose to handle the radios and let me do the flying. Our first stop was the trapped company's HQ area at the 101st's camp. We landed there to get the exact coordinates and to wait. The company was under fire, too heavy for us to get in. We shut down next to a small rifle range inside the wire-strewn mined perimeter and waited. At noon, we were still waiting. We could hear the company commander, Delta Six, calling on the radio in a nearby tent. He had seven fighting men left. Thirty-eight more were either dead or wounded. He sounded bad, kept telling his HQ the names of the people he knew were dead, and also kept saying, It's still too hot for that ship. We may have to wait till dark. As I listened to this and waited, I wandered into the tent and got a case of forty-five caliber ammunition from a sergeant. I took the 500 rounds back out to the rifle range and proceeded to kill the rest of the afternoon by firing hundreds of rounds at beer cans. By three o'clock, even I was impressed by my accuracy. I was regularly hitting beer cans at a hundred yards. By four o'clock, some grunts had joined me, and I borrowed an M16 and shot a few clips with it. Another grunt let me try my luck with an M79 grenade launcher. As I shot, I became calmer. I realized how much I needed to shoot. Shoot something. Anything. Niven came out of the tent as I blasted a beer can again. We're going to try for it, he said. I slid the hot forty-five into my shoulder holster and went to the ship. I think I'll make a takeoff, said Niven. I could use the practice. Sure, help yourself. Two grunts climbed inside with us after loading the ship full of ammo cases. Niven cranked up, did a power check at a hover which revealed that we were just able to hover. He nosed over, a little too much, and took off over the concertina wire. Unfortunately, the ship was too heavy for the amount of angle he had set for the takeoff, so the ship stayed low. 
we felt something tugging as we crossed the minefield. I looked out my window and saw barbed wire caught on the skid, trailing back, dragging in the other wire. We're caught in some wire, I yelled. He realized what was up as soon as I yelled and reared back to level. What he did next caught me completely by surprise. Instead of staying at a hover over the minefield and backing out, he set the ship down. I lifted myself off the seat against the straps, bracing myself for the explosion. Niven forgot the mind perimeter. He remembered as soon as we were down. I looked at him as the ship idled. The sun shone through the plexiglass. Sweat dripped over his face. He looked as scared as I felt. There was no explosion. The grunts told us to stay put. Men who knew the layout of the mines came daintily stepping out to us with wire cutters and cut us free. Niven was so shaken he had me fly. As we drew near the trapped company, we saw gunships working the facing hill. Their efforts were frustrated by the exceedingly deep and dense foliage. In fact, the company itself was under a seventy-five-foot canopy of trees. "'Too hot, Prospector. Wait till dark,' said Delta Six. "'Roger,' replied Niven. We turned back, frustrated. The tension was building to a high peak. I had looked the spot over, and I could not see a safe approach." The company was trapped on a low, tree-covered knoll surrounded by higher ground. If the NVA were still there when we came back, we'd be sitting ducks. I landed back at the company's HQ and shut down. It was two hours till dark. We had chow and waited. There was no moon when we took off, and the sky was very dark. After a ten-minute flight up the valley, I switched off the position lights and began to descend. As we sank... The tops of the mountains, blacker than the sky, rose above us. I used the contours of the valley and the hills that I had come to know in two weeks of flying over and around them. It's possible to see ground contour from low level, even on the darkest night, even if there's no moon, even if there is an overcast. There are always enough clues to construct an image. I had learned not to stare at what I wanted to see, but to see it with my peripheral vision. So, as I moved slowly toward the knoll, I knew its treetops were lighter than the black hill behind them. Delta Six radioed that we sounded like we were on course. I had picked the right shadow. You're close, said Delta Six. Keep coming, slowly. As the ship dropped out of flight and into hover, the load became evident. The dim instrument lights showed that I was using maximum power in the hover. We drifted forward, six feet above the trees, at Delta Six's beckoning. Delta Six said, We hear some shooting. I saw muzzle flashes from the hill facing us. I think that's about right. Wait, I can hear you right over us, but I can't see you. We have wounded lying all around here, and I don't want them hit by the ammo crates. I hovered, not looking at anything in particular, just noticing the different shades of black. Muzzle flashes began to twinkle from the hillside. The low RPM warning siren blared. I glanced at the dial and saw the needle dropping fast. The ship was sinking into the trees. If we didn't drop that ammo, we'd go down. We've got to drop that ammo, said Niven. No, you're right over the wounded! Delta Six's broadcast was filled with the crackling noise of rifle fire. Were we or weren't we going to drop the fucking ammo? I moved a little farther to the right. The crew chief and the grunts had the boxes poised at the edge of the deck, but it was still wrong. A treetop rose up, brushing the nose. That was it. If we didn't go now, we'd be joining the men below us as pieces. The shuddering Huey resisted as I tried to move forward. The warning siren blared. It was on the verge of quitting. Moving forward was real effort. I heard a loud slap as the rotor hit a treetop. I couldn't climb. If anything, I had to descend to get the rotor speed back to normal. I turned to the right, getting a little power bonus that way, and dragged the skids across the treetops. Within a few feet, I was able to drop the side of the knoll into a black ravine. "'Now what?' asked Niven. "'I'm going down to the end of the ravine, circle back, and try it again. "'We're too heavily loaded!' Yeah, but I think I know where he wants it now. Niven called Delta Six. Thank you.
said the grateful voice. As I cruised slowly toward the knoll, the muzzle flashes began. Then a tongue of tracers flitted off to our left. Apparently we were hard to see, because we hadn't been hit yet. From the conversation during the first attempt, I had a feeling where Delta-6 was, and where he wanted us to drop the ammo. "'That's it!' he yelled. "'Hold it right there!' I stopped the ship. As she sank toward the trees, Delta-6 called, "'Okay, dump them!" With much scraping and bumping, the boxes were shoved from the ship. They dropped seventy-five feet through the branches and leaves. The ship gained power as it lightened. "'Great job!' yelled Delta-6. "'Nobody was hit. Great job. Thank you, Prospector!' I hit one more treetop on the way out, bounced toward the ravine, and accelerated. Ten minutes later, we were back at HQ, being credited with saving their lives. Delta-6 and his men had fired the last of their ammo to cover us. The next morning, Delta-6 had managed to push back the NVA, or the latter pulled back, and a Chinook hovered over the spot and hoisted out the wounded. Another Chinook pulled out the last of the living, along with the dead. The 101st was getting the action they had craved. Unfortunately, the territory was the enemy's home field. In some of the LZs, the grunts had cut on hilltops. The stumps were so close together that it was difficult to get the skids to fit between them. The American patrols hacked through the brush, struggling toward objectives, only to become hopelessly lost. Commanders constantly reported men missing in action who were in fact lost. You couldn't see a man ten feet away. While they fought the jungle, the NVA harassed them, attacked them, and sometimes overran them. When platoons and companies came under heavy attack, rescue units sent out to help them became lost, scattered, and surrounded. For days, the 101st had lost units looking for lost units looking for lost units. It was total confusion. In that confusion, many men died. In these conditions, our helicopters were the least effective in helping the grunts. We were constantly out trying to find men who cried for help on the radio, but who were totally hidden in the jungle. One company we tried to save was completely wiped out as we flew above the canopy trying to find them. Their radio went dead, and they were gone. Another company, led by a West Point football player, Bud Carpenter, became famous because Carpenter called in an airstrike on his position as he was being overrun. Sky King and I were in the air, orbiting Carpenter's position. Carpenter was trying to get to an old LZ to be extracted. We listened on the radio and watched the LZ, waiting for him to show up. "'We can't make it to the LZ,' radioed Carpenter. "'They're all around us.' "'What's your position?' implored Gunfighter Six, Carpenter's CO. "'I'm one hundred meters east of the LZ,' said Carpenter, calmly. Gunfire crackled with his voice. "'I see only six men around me.' he lamented. They're moving closer. I want an airstrike here, now. On your own position? asked Gunfighter Six. Yes, hurry. Two A-1Es were already on station. They got their instructions in seconds and began to hit the coordinates. They dropped napalm, bombs, and then strafed. Carpenter's position was covered in smoke. A long silence followed. That did it said Carpenter's tired voice. They stopped. Gunfighter Six said, If things don't work out to the good, I want you to know that I'm putting you in for the Medal of Honor. No reply. Also, I'm sure that when we get to you, we'll find a lot of dead V.C. All I can see are my own people, said the quiet voice. We're sending help, said Gunfighter Six. Moments later, Gunfighter Six called us, he wanted us to land at his position near the artillery emplacement. I can't understand it, he said. He sat on the deck of our Huey holding a plastic-covered map board. He looked gaunt and sad. He pointed to a circled spot on the green paper. I don't understand it. They've got to be here. He was talking about a platoon he was trying to send to Carpenter's position. But the platoon wasn't there because when the men fought in the direction he directed— 
They found nothing and became pinned down. Gunfighter Six was depressed. He had it all worked out on his game board, and the labels were all in the right place, but the men weren't. I want you to fly out and find this unit. He pointed to the map. Find them and give them an azimuth to hear. He moved his finger across the board to Carpenter's position. A major and a captain got in the back of our ship with a big radio. We took off. I flew slowly across the treetops, listening to the grunt's radio instructions. They could hear our ship. Using our sound, they directed us right over them. During the crisscross search pattern, the enemy did not shoot. But when I found and circled a unit, they opened up from the high ground around us. I heard one tick. I flew past the unit, turned, and came back over them in the exact direction they were to go. Go this way. Radioed the major from behind us. The unit rogered its orders. The major had us look for another lost patrol. Again, while we cruised back and forth over the jungle, right in front of the enemy's hillside, they did not shoot. But as soon as I circled, they opened up. The hillside was peppered with muzzle flashes. We were so close to one NVA barrage, we could hear the crackling rifle fire. I felt a thump in the airframe. And turned around and saw the major hitting the deck, not shot, but following his instinct to hit the deck under fire. It was kind of funny that he thought the deck was any protection. Bullets went through it like tin foil, but I didn't laugh. I turned and came back over the invisible men on the heading they were to follow. As we crossed them, Sky King radioed, two six zero degrees. The lieutenant below rogered. And we did it again, and again. In a couple of hours, we had redirected all the lost units, the ones who still talked anyway. They were converging on one spot to join up. Gunfighter Six was not only going to secure Carpenter's position, he was also getting his men together to pull out. He had had enough of this shit. It was time to call in the cavalry. We landed back at Gunfighter Six's position and watched while he told his aides what he had in mind. The plan amounted to this: he was going to have the first cav send out a battalion or so of troopers and position them north of the fighting, to wait on some ridge tops. He believed that if the Air Force bombed this area, and then the 101st went back in, they would beat the NVA up to the cav. The crazy thing was that he believed that the NVA would travel along the ridge tops, not in the valleys. Looking at the map, I could see a thousand ways the NVA could get away. But then I wasn't an infantry commander. I'm glad I wasn't. The briefing was interesting, but we were called out in the middle of it to rescue wounded men. Sky King told me later that he didn't believe we were going to make it. The clearing was a tight circle cut out of a stand of saplings, and the grunts had put too many wounded on board for us to hover. To top it off, we were under continuous fire. What I did was considered reckless. The solution was automatic. The ship lost RPM at a one-foot hover. I could not leave anyone behind because men were dying, and we were surrounded by fifteen-foot bushes and saplings. But we were on a hill. My instincts told me that if I could get through the barrier, the ship could dive down the side of the hill and we could fly. So, while Sky King advised me that we would have to drop at least one man, I shook my head. And headed for the thinnest section of the vegetable wall. Luckily, the rotors are so high above the ground that they had to cut only the thinner tops of the saplings. Our nose forced through the branches and leaves. The skids tugged on clinging things, and the rotors exploded into the stuff. It sounded like we were crashing. Men screamed in the back of the ship, but even as we struggled through the trees and leaves and bushes, the ground dropped beneath us. The rotors cleared the tops, and we dragged the fuselage through the last of the foliage. We burst out of the thicket in a swirl of debris, a turbine-powered brush cutter. I sailed down the side of the hill, picked up some airspeed, and then climbed out. Sky King said, "I don't fucking believe it." I laughed. I was surprised myself. By that evening, the scattered patrols, platoons, and companies consolidated themselves. 
It turned out that Carpenter had lost fewer men than he had thought. Only half his company were among the dead or wounded. The others had been separated in the tight brush. The jungle was the enemy's ally, and as long as he forced us to fight in its strangling hold, we would lose. Carpenter's heroic suicidal solution left him miraculously unscathed and had stopped the rout, but we lost the battle. The grunts were pulled back past the artillery position to wait for the CAV and the Air Force. The Air Force was sending B-52 loads of 1,000-pound bombs from Guam. The bombs were supposed to kill a lot of NVA. The survivors were to race up the ridges, pursued by the 101st, and the CAV, way up north, would smash them. The scope was too big. The delay caused by waiting for the Air Force was too long. Early the next day, Gary and I and the rest of the prospectors stopped in our tracks in the company area. A monstrous storm thundered up the valley from the south. The noise grew so loud you couldn't hear the voices around you. The storm was the monster gaggle sent by the CAV. The CAV raced up the valley, at least eighty ships, at low level and fast. The gaggle flew over us and continued north to their assigned objective. Minutes later, The last of their formation disappeared, and the roar silenced. Damn, I don't think I've ever seen so many Hueys flying all at once, someone said. I admit that I felt a sense of pride on seeing my old unit. They were, in this part of the world, the big time. The calves' image lost some of its gloss that same afternoon. The 101st fought scattered firefights among a hundred branching valleys. A CAV gunship company was borrowed to help out. It was to support a ground commander who had radioed that he wanted the CAV to pulverize a spot where he would throw smoke, yellow smoke. Near where the 101st wanted the CAV to strike, a radio operator walked along with his patrol. He carried several smoke grenades on his belt. One of them, of course, was yellow. At the moment, the grunt commander, a mile away from the radio operator, announced that he had thrown yellow smoke, a branch pulled the yellow smoke grenade from the radio operator's belt, popping the pin. The radio operator and his platoon were immediately swallowed up in the chalky yellow smoke. The CAV gunships happened to be only a few hundred meters away, looking for the yellow smoke that marked their target. The gunship rogered that they saw the smoke and attacked. They even saw people running around under the smoke and thought they were getting old Charlie. When the commander noticed that his yellow smoke was not being hit, that someone else's yellow smoke was being attacked, he screamed at the gunships to stop. It was lucky he did. In just a few seconds, they had already killed the radio operator's platoon leader and wounded twenty-one others, including the radio operator himself. It was a freak accident, but the cav was labeled clumsy. And after such a dramatic entrance, too, it ruined their image. The prospectors and the 101st felt safer, knowing that the cab would be way up north, somewhere as the anvil. We were the hammer. The following day, all the 101st units were pulled back in preparation for the bombing. The NVA were not dummies. They knew that something was up. They faded into the jungle. According to the hundreds of grease pencil marks on the maps, the NVA were surrounded, about to be driven along the ridge north, into the hands of the clumsy but mighty CAV. The next morning, the Air Force was due for its part of the squeeze. This ends side two of cassette nine of Chicken Hawk. Chicken Hawk, cassette ten. Sky King and I were assigned to carry a television film crew up and down a dirt road that marked the western boundary of the bombing zone. Pictures of bombs, especially gigantic bombs, going off have great PR value, everyone knows. The clouds sank into the valley, hiding the mountaintops. Sky King and I cruised nervously at 500 feet above the road. We had been assured that the Air Force did not miss, that it was practically impossible to be hit by a stray bomb. Our feeling was, bullshit, the Air Force misses a lot. 
At the exact moment the bombs were supposed to hit, they did. I had just turned back, heading up the road, when we saw the hillsides a quarter mile away begin to erupt. Intersecting concussion spheres, visible in the close air, suddenly expanded away from the ground. Circles in the heavily wooded hills became instantly nude. The thousand-pound bombs fell in rapid succession, systematically and devastatingly traveling along the ridges, in the ravines, against the hillsides, a visual staccato of overlapping blasts tearing the earth asunder. We heard oohs and ahs from the film crew. The pattern of destruction had started across the valley from us and moved closer. Somewhere, thirty thousand feet above the cloud cover, some very good bomber crews were keeping the bombs within the designated area. Charlie must be turning into hamburger. After a half hour of this, the bombs had reached the road. The concussion rings were not only visible, they were tangible. The ship rocked in the explosions. They were going off right on the road, so I moved off the track. One bomb exploded in front of us, past the road, and for a minute I thought we might be seeing just how well a Huey holds up to thousand-pound bombs when the bombing stopped. Silence. The valley swirled in stringy smoke. Leafless trees stood at bizarre angles. The ground was gray and charred between monstrous craters. No one could have survived that apocalypse. The end of the bomb run was the queue, and scores of Hueys flew in, dropping grunts all over the torn valley floor. It was the end of our mission, so I lingered only a little while before turning back to the airstrip. I was impressed. The film crew was impressed. The grunts were impressed. But the gooks were not impressed. They were gone. They did leave behind a few men, and these were captured, dazed but intact, something like twenty NVA. So now it was up to the calf. The calves searched the ridges and the valleys for two days, and then they closed back to the bombed valley. When the net was closed, no fish were found. The dumb little barbarians had got away, showing not the least respect for superior technology. They had used judo and bent with the force. But a bombing was a bombing, and fighting is fighting, and many men had been heroic indeed. The battle, though lost, had been impressive. General Westmoreland himself flew up from Saigon to pin on medals. Captain Carpenter was given a silver star and was put on Westmoreland's staff. Near the end of June I got very twitchy. Being a short-timer made life difficult. It would almost be better not to know when you were due to return. As the day drew closer, only fifty days to go, the possibility of dying seemed more imminent, like I had already used up my brakes and would be getting it any day now. Somewhere between now and the day I left was THE mission, probably a typical little mission, light fire, and just one little stray bullet would go through my forehead. Nights were hell, even with the tranquilizers Dr. Da Vinci gave me. I kept snapping awake at unseen dangers. Daytime was fine when I flew. The ice business also kept me busy. But when I wasn't flying, a few hours between missions or a day off, I grew morose. Nothing that I saw convinced me that we were doing the right thing in Vietnam. I even harbored a sympathy for the enemy, which made me feel guilty. The local war, the one I was in, went on every day. I was part of it. In the air, I did my job the best I knew how. I flew, as did all the pilots, into hot LZs, because in the middle of the confusion, the hazy principles over which the war was fought disappeared. Everything else was excluded. Even I was excluded. When Deacon finally let Gary and me fly together, our first mission was to resupply a small patrol in the jungle. We used off-course navigation to find them, a method that wasn't taught in flight school. Monk had told me about it. In standard dead reckoning, you corrected a plotted course for wind drift, but you never knew which way to look when you'd flown long enough to be at your target. 
The wind drift correction was a calculation. The actual track you'd made was off to one side or the other. But which side? In off-course navigation, you don't correct for wind drift. You fly the magnetic course you plotted on the map for the length of time you calculated, and then you know where to look, upwind. We found our resupply target without incident. After lunch, a firefight broke out close to the airstrip, near where we had left the ARVNs that first day. There were casualties, and the men needed ammo. Gary and I made it into a tiny clearing cut on a ledge. There was just enough room to squeeze the rotors in, leaving the tail hanging over space. The grunts threw some of their wounded on board, gunfire began crackling, and the grunts waved vigorously for us to leave. Take off from such a nook is backwards. As the nose and the rotors clear the obstruction, you push the right pedal and the whole machine pivots as it's flying so that the nose and tail trade places, putting you back to the normal posture. That's what we did. At the hospital pod, the medics had the wounded off in seconds. Gary and I took off to go back for a second load. Damn! They said this whole damn area was secure weeks ago, Gary complained. They must not have told Charlie, I said. That's the truth. The unit told us to wait. There was a small firefight going on. I circled high over the valley, out of small arms range. From the orbit we could see some smoke up in the north where we had worked that morning. To the west was more smoke from some 100 first units who were moving in that direction. The Americans were working a very large section of territory, but from up high it seemed very small. The sea of jungle stretched for hundreds of miles in every direction, and you could go anywhere you wanted under that canopy. Okay, Prospector, we're secure. Roger, we're on our way, called Gary. From the orbit I dropped toward the peak of the hill, dropped below it, and settled into a descent along a ravine that led to the nook. We had picked up a load of ammo on the way and could barely hover at this altitude. I had to time the approach so that I lost translational lift as the ship moved onto the ledge. When we were moving at maybe thirty miles an hour, with one hundred yards to go, our right door gun exploded. The gunner saw muzzle flashes. With fifty feet to go, the most critical part of the approach, the ground guide started waving me away. This was no place to stop. I kept coming. Then two more men jumped up and waved me away. At the same time, a voice on the radio yelled, Don't land! We're under heavy fire! This was a new one for me. Normally, I could just fly over the LZ if we had to abort, but this one was on the side of a hill, and closed on both sides by the ravine. I couldn't turn away either, but there was space behind and below us. I flared the ship to stop the approach. Since it couldn't hover, it began to sink. Nose high, the ship slid tail down into the ravine. As we fell, I used the right pedal to bring the nose around, but I let it continue to fall to get airspeed. I accelerated into the ravine. The airspeed came up to about seventy. Then we were a flying machine again, and I swooped up between some trees on the ridge beside the ravine. The grunts had seen us tumbling into the ravine. We disappeared as the ravine turned, and they thought we crashed. But lo, the Huey jumped out of the jungle to their amazement. We finally got back to the nook, dropped the ammo, and picked up the rest of the wounded. As usual with the last trip, some dead men also rode back with us. That afternoon, I took Gary with me to pick up the ice. Chapter 13 Tell Me You're Afraid I am sure we are going to win, and Guyan Cao Ki, in U.S. News and World Report, August 1st, 1966. A communist military takeover in South Vietnam is no longer just improbable, it is impossible. Lyndon Johnson, August 14th, 1966, after conferring with General Westmoreland at the LBJ Ranch. July, August, 1966. Sleep no longer gave me peace. I had escaped Vietnam with an R&R &R to Hong Kong, 
but I had not escaped my memories. Twenty-one men lay trussed in a row, ropes at their ankles, hands bound under their backs, North Vietnamese prisoners. A sergeant stood at the first prisoner's feet, his face twisted with anger. The North Vietnamese prisoners stared back, unblinking. The sergeant pointed a forty-five at the man. He kicked the prisoner's feet suddenly. The shock of the impact jostled the prisoner inches across the earth. The sergeant fired the forty-five into the prisoner's face. The prisoner's head bounced off the ground like a ball slapped from above, then flopped back into the gore that had been his brains. The sergeant turned to the next prisoner in the line. He tried to get away, said a voice at my side. He can't get away, he's tied! He moved, he was trying to get away. The next prisoner said a few hurried words in Vietnamese as the sergeant stood over him. When the sergeant kicked his feet, the prisoner closed his eyes. A bullet shook his head. It's murder, I hissed to the man at my side. They cut off Sergeant Rochi's cock and stuck it in his mouth, and five of his men, said the voice. After they spent the night slowly shoving knives into their guts, if you had been here to hear the screams, they screamed all night. This morning they were all dead, all gagged with their cocks. This isn't murder, it's justice. Another head bounced off the ground. The shockwave hit my body. They sent us to pick up twenty-one prisoners, I pleaded. You'll get them, you'll get them. They'll just be dead is all. The sergeant moved down the line, stopping prisoners who tried to escape. The line of men grew longer than it had been, and the sergeant grew distant. His face glowed red, and the heads bounced. And then he looked up at me. Forgotten events dogged my sleep. A wounded V.C. lay on a stretcher, one end rested on my ship's deck, the other end held by a medic. I don't think he appreciates this. I think he'd rather die, said the medic. The V.C. stared at me. His black eyes accused me. He lay in a black pajama top. The bottoms were gone. He had a swollen, stinking thigh wound from days before. He'd been hiding in the jungle. He's going to lose that leg, said the medic. The man stared at me. The stretcher grated against the deck as the medic shoved. The crew chief reached across from the other side and pulled. They slid the stretcher up against the cockpit seats. While they shoved and jostled the stretcher, he kept his eyes on mine. That fucker either has the clap or he's turned on by us. The crew chief grinned. He pointed to the man's groin. What looked like semen dripped from his penis and glistened on his thigh. I looked away, feeling his hate. I felt his exposure. I looked back to his eyes, and they stared black and hot. The scene stopped. I thought I was waking up. But then it was the human shield I'd seen during LZ Dog. The eyes blinked and wrinkles formed at their edges. The old woman with black teeth said something to me, then screamed. There was no sound. Her wrinkled hand held a child's smooth arm. The child hung lifeless and dragged the old woman down. She moved slowly like she was falling through water. The crowd around her gasped silently and flinched and fell. The machine gun stuttered from a distant place. The woman fell slowly to the ground, bounced, dying and dead. The old woman had been saying something. When I saw her lips moving, I knew that she had been saying, It's okay. The scene changed again. I sat in my Huey, waiting for the grunts to finish inspecting a napalmed village. It's okay. A man looked in my cockpit window. She's dead. They're all dead. It's okay. The crowd was gone. I sat in my cockpit while the man talked to me from outside. The place had been a village. The wet ground smoked. Scorched poles and mud-daubed walls and thatch smoldered. Charred people lay twenty feet away. The smell of burnt hair and smoldering charcoal sank into my lungs and brain. Why was there barbed wire in the village? Was it a pen? A defense perimeter? I couldn't see the scene beyond where the child stuck to the wire. 
This is wrong, I said to the man. It's okay, it's the way it is. They had their warning. Everybody else left the village. They're VC. She's VC? The man looked down. No, she's unfortunate. She was burned to the barbed wire. The wire was growing from the charred flesh of her tiny chest. She was bent over the wire, a toddler who had run away from the hell from the sky. The lower half of her two-year-old body was pink from intense heat. Her tiny vulva looked almost alive. This is not war. It's, it's okay. There's always going to be some innocent victims. The man talked on, but his voice became silent. The little girl's stark body, half charred death, half pink life, leaned against the wire, almost free. Suddenly I heard ringing. I awoke hearing my voice echoing off the far wall. The phone was ringing on the night table. Hell, I gulped. Hello? Your call to the United States will be coming through in fifteen minutes, said the voice. The call? Of course. The call to patience. Thank you. We wanted to make sure you would be here for the call, Mr. Mason. Yes. Yes, thank you. I'm here. The phone clicked off, and I held the buzzing receiver in my hand for a minute before setting it back on its cradle. I shivered as an air-conditioned breeze chilled me. The sheets were wet and twisted. I lit a cigarette with shaking hands and sat up to wait for the call. I was having these dreams almost every night. I began to feel better. I was awake, after all, away from the dreams. After four miserable nights, I decided to cut my leave short and return to Vietnam. The leave had been a disaster. Gary had come to Hong Kong with me, but he left the second day for Taipei. I had bragged about the women there too convincingly, and the call girls in Hong Kong were too experienced, too professional, and too expensive. Wrestler packed up and left. I was going to follow, but when I tried to get a ticket to Taipei, I was refused because I was a serviceman on leave to Hong Kong, and that's where I'd have to stay. I don't know how Gary slipped through the red tape, but I was alone. I had not the slightest desire to hire a call girl. I really just wanted to talk. I love you, over, I said. I love you too. Are you okay? Over, said Patience. Her voice struggled weakly through the hiss and whistles of the radio phone connection. I'm fine. They say I won't have to fly any more combat assaults when I get back. Over. No? That's what... The party has not said over, sir. Oh, said Patience. Over. That's what the doc said when I left. He said that the prospectors were going to put their last month short timers on ass and trash missions. Over. Oh, I hope they keep their word. Over. They will. These guys are not the calf. Over. I listened to the howl and echoes of interfering electronics, sorting out the words. Patience, my son Jack, and my family had become phantoms. They were dreams, too. When we finally stopped talking... When her voice melted into the static, the tenuous link to my home fantasies broke. Over, I said. And there I sat, on the edge of the bed, just like after every other dream. It was very similar to my hometown, Delray Beach. There was a beach, it ran north and south. There were palm trees, sandy roads, salt smells... Girls playing in bikinis and quietly rolling surf. It was late afternoon, almost dusk, and the sun glinted off parts of the heavy wire screen that surrounded the terrace. My table stood near the front of the terrace, allowing me the best view. Voices chattered quietly behind me. Vietnamese sounds lovely, even if you can't understand it. It did feel like home. Golden dolls wearing bikinis so brief they were ribbons of modesty strolled with pale G.I.s. As it got darker, the beach crowd broke up, drifting into the town. How are you? said the smiling waitress. 
I noticed her Vietnamese glance of nerves and felt comforted by familiar behavior. What would you like? she asked. I would like to jump you like a rabbit. I'll have another beer, please, I said. The girl prompted immediate lust. Perhaps I could find solace in solace. My conscience immediately began to pummel me with shots of raw guilt, delivered at high voltage. Monster, it railed. Married, short timer. And not only that, but you're just getting over the clap. It was mercilessly rational. I succumbed to its barbs. The waitress bowed and left to get the beer. I smiled as I watched my phantom flit naked from me to the girl to hump her happily while she leaned over the bar. She returned, beaming, friendlier, and served my beer. Her arm brushed mine, and I felt warm electricity flicker between us. My mind savored salty, sweet smells and orgasmic contractions, hearing her voice as an echo. Would you like... Her voice was obliterated by the sudden ripping, zipping howl of a stylus skidding across a record. She dropped to the floor and rolled under a table. At the sound of crashing chairs and breaking glassware, I turned and saw the Vietnamese taking cover. Five men crouched low behind the bar. I sat alone on the porch and took a sip of beer. The girl knocked over a chair as she crawled toward the back of the porch all because of a stylus skidding across a record? Damn, they were even jumpier than I was. I looked around the bar. Nothing was happening. There was no fight. People peered from behind the bar and tables, looking up front. It had just been the sound that spooked them. They had absolutely no confidence that their city was secure. They knew the facts. The V.C. were everywhere. Cowards, I thought. Anger flushed through me. I felt betrayed, revolted. They're really afraid. For five minutes I had complete quiet as I watched the surf foam glow in the gathering dusk. At the end of that time, the bar, the customers, the porch came back to life. I paid my tab and walked to the room I had rented. I sat against the wall on the bed thinking about the panic at the bar. The old question... Why don't the Vietnamese fight the V.C. like the V.C. fight the Vietnamese? Seemed very valid. Without the support of the people, we were going to lose. And if they didn't care, why were we continuing to fight? Surely the people who were running this fiasco could see this too. The signs were obvious. Plans leaked to the V.C., reluctant combatants, mutinies in the A.R.V.N., Political corruption, Vietnamese Marines fighting Vietnamese Marines at Da Nang, and the ubiquitous Vietnamese idea that Ho would eventually win. I stabbed a cigarette into an ashtray. Without American financial support and military support, the South Vietnamese government would have failed long ago, as a natural result of its lack of popular support. The whole problem settled on my shoulders. In a few hours, I was going to voluntarily go back into battle and risk my scrawny neck for people who didn't care. I stayed up and smoked cigarettes all night. I tried to sleep, only to jerk awake, sitting in bed, listening. I was back at Doc To, home, the next day. Here, the war was simple. We did our job well, beat the V.C. almost every time, and kept them on the run. Here, I was a member of the honorable side— the reluctant, cowardly Vietnamese were not visible to remind me that they didn't care. I could go on believing that simply by killing more and more communists, we would win. When I crawled into my cot my first night back, I fell instantly asleep. The next day, Gary and I sat on the deck of our Huey waiting for the grunts to finish eating. Their platoon was one of several that were pushing toward the west, Scouting for the V.C., we joked in familiar surroundings. "'You should have come, you know,' said Gary. "'I tried, asshole. They wouldn't let me. How did you get a ticket?' "'I just went to the ticket counter and bought it.' "'Well, you must have looked like a civilian because they wouldn't sell me anything.' "'It's really a shame. You missed Grass Mountain.' "'What's that?' "'Grass Mountain is packed with geisha houses. Want to know what it's like to go to a geisha house?' No, 
They start off with a bath, just you and two naked girls. They wash you first, then soak you, then massage you. Didn't you hear me? I heard you, Gary said. The two of them massage you so well you think you're going to crack. Then at the perfect moment, one of the girls sits on you and puts you out of your misery. I nodded my head with closed eyes, kicking myself for not getting laid when I had the chance. And that's just the beginning. Just the beginning? That's right. It takes hours to get out of this place. They give you more baths and tea and food and massages to keep you going. And then they pass you down the line to teams of two or three girls who work you over in different ways. Gary's face brightened at his memories. I never even heard of Grass Mountain when I was there, I lamented. Never heard of it? Where the hell were you? The next day I was flying with Sky King. In the middle of a lager, a grunt lieutenant came to our ship. We just had a newsman wounded. Will you guys pick him up? Sure, I said. The squad leader with the guy said it was a sniper. They say they've got the place secured. No problem. Where are they? The lieutenant showed me on his map. They were only a mile away. When I turned to get into the ship, Sky King and the crew chief were all ready to go. I strapped in as Sky King cranked up. Sky King flew at fifty knots heading for the place. Over there, I pointed to four or five soldiers standing around a prone man in a thicket of leafless trees. You see them? Got them. As we flew by, the men hit the dirt, leaving one man standing. He was aiming a movie camera at us. Great place for a landing, said Sky King. The base of the clearing was wide enough for our ship, but the scrawny branches, twenty feet off the ground, crowded over the circle, making it too tight to get in. Axel 1-6, I radioed. Can you move to a better clearing? Sky King circled, looking for a way to get through the trees. Negative, Prospector. We're still getting sniper fire, and this guy is wounded pretty bad. Sky King set up an approach and closed in. As he got to the treetops, it became obvious that he was going to hit branches with the main rotor, so he aborted. When the squad saw us heading across the LZ, they radioed, Can you make it, Prospector? Sky King shook his head. I can't get in there. You want to try it? I nodded and took the controls. While Sky King had approached, I thought I saw a way. We'll get in, Axel 1-6. Just hang on. The plan was simple. I would come in ninety degrees to Sky King's last try, and then turn sharp. I thought that in a bank the rotors could slip through the narrow slot that Sky King had shot for. I lined up on a tangent to the clearing and let down. I hit the turn fast, banked hard over, and as we slipped toward the ground, I saw that I was going to hit some stuff anyway. The main rotor smashed some dead branches, sounding like machine gun fire. I flared for the landing, and we were down. Great. Now how are you going to get out? said Sky King. I didn't answer because I didn't know how I was going to get out. The grunts grabbed the wounded man. He was unconscious, his fatigue blouse sopping with his blood. At that point I noticed the cameraman standing back filming the whole thing. The grunts were prone beside him, laying out cover fire toward the jungle. When I saw him aim the camera toward the cockpit, I sat a little straighter and thought cool thoughts, in case those two might somehow be recorded. The crew chief called that we were ready, and the cameraman jumped on board. In fact, there was no acceptable way to get out. There was not enough room to accelerate and bank back out through the slot. Some of the high branches hung over our rotor disc. By the book, we were trapped. But I had seen rotor blades stand up to incredible stress before, so I decided to take the brute force option. I picked up to the hover, turned the tail until it matched a slot in the overhanging branches, and then pulled the pitch. We climbed straight up twenty feet before the rotors smashed into cane-thick branches at nearly every point of their circle. It sounded like the rotors were being smashed to pieces, Seconds later, we cleared the treetops and I nosed over, accelerating toward the airstrip five miles away. Someday you're going to hit a branch that's just a little too big, Sky King said after a long quiet. What then? I asked. 
Then your ship's going to come apart, and you're going to kill yourself and everybody around you. Now that's frightening, I said. I think maybe I ought to quit this job and go home. This guy's still alive, sir, the crew chief's voice buzzed in my headphones. The cameraman says he's the president of CBS News. Imagine that. Ain't that a kick, Sky King said. I guess he got bored with his nice, safe desk job, the dumb shit. When we landed at the hospital tent at the 101st, the cameraman jumped out and filmed his boss being unloaded. He filmed Gary and me in the cockpit, then put the camera down and gave us a salute. I nodded, brought the rotors up to operating, and leapt off the pad. As I flew back to retrieve the empty thermos containers we left with the grunts, I recalled the cameraman's salute and felt slightly heroic. When we shut down that night, Sky King showed me the creases and nicks in the rotors and scolded me. Look at this. You've ruined them. Nah, they're fine. Just creased is all. No holes. Look at the bright side. The guy's alive. Yeah, but look at those rotors. During the second week of July, Operation Hawthorne began winding up. The patrols and reconnaissance companies were getting very little opposition in the battle zone. The NVA had slipped away. If they're gone and we killed 2,000 of them, we won, said Gary. What did we win? We don't have any more real estate, no new villages are under American control, and it took everything we had to stop them, I said. We won the battle. More of them got killed than us. It's that simple. Doesn't it bother you that it takes so much equipment and men to beat the NVA? If we were equally equipped, we'd lose. Yeah, but we aren't equally equipped, and they lose. Besides that, I have a month to go, and I don't give a shit. Unless they make you fly assaults during your last month. If they do that, then I'll give a shit. While the first calves slipped unceremoniously back to An K, the 101st decided to end the operation with a parade. There would be no spectators except for the news reporters. Unless you want to count the men in the parade as spectators, and, of course, they were. Hundreds of bone-weary soldiers gathered at the artillery emplacements and began the five-mile march back to the airstrip. They marched in parade step along the dusty road. Insects buzzed in the saturated air. No virgins threw flowers. No old ladies cried. No strong men wept. They marched to their own muffled footsteps. I bet they're pissed off, said Gary leaning against his door window, staring down at the column, especially when they look up and see all these empty helicopters flying around. We flew up and down the column in four Vs at 500 feet during the entire march. Supposedly we were generating excitement or underscoring a memorable event, but according to a grunt, we wanted to know why you fuckers wouldn't come down and give us a fucking ride. When the head of the column finally reached the 101st section of the airstrip, the band played, the Hueys whooshed overhead, and the general beamed. With all the troopers back in camp, noses were counted. Nearly twenty people were unaccounted for. It was presumed that these men were all dead. There would be a search operation to find their bodies in a few days. The next day, while the missing moldered, the 101st had a party for the survivors. Their camp was within walking distance, but our aviator egos demanded that we fly. After seeing too much death and injury, the survivors celebrated life. We had a boisterously good time to emphasize that we were still alive. Business was so slow during the next few days that Gary and I decided to follow up a rumor. Other than the daily ice flight and an occasional ass and trash, air operations in support of the 101st had stopped while loose ends were tied up. The rumor was that our old first cav company, the Preachers, was camped at Chio Rio, a hundred miles south of us. So we went to Ringknocker and said, Major, can we use a Huey to go visit some old friends of ours? The question sounded stupid as I asked it. I wouldn't have even thought about asking Ferris or Shaker for a ship in the cav. Helicopters were never, never used for personal business. 
Unless maybe you were bringing in a load of ivory and you outranked everybody else. Visit friends? Ringknocker stood in front of his tent dressed in shorts, on the way to the shower we had built. What kind of friends do you have in Vietnam? Our old company is camped down by Chio Rio, said Gary. Oh, those old friends. Ringknocker seemed relieved. Sure, go ahead. But, he smiled warmly, be home before dark. And that was that. I didn't even have to get the ice. Sky King agreed to take the trip for me. We had at our disposal a half a million dollar helicopter, two hundred gallons of fuel, a full crew, and nothing to do but drive south to visit some friends. It was like getting the family car. After lunch, we climbed up into the cumulus sky. Crossing Play Coup at three thousand feet, we changed course to one hundred forty degrees for the flight to Chio Rio. We'll get some storms out of those clouds this afternoon, said Gary. I nodded. I was flying at the base of the clouds, changing course now and then to thread between the gaps. Below, the clouds cast dark shadows on the jungle. The river beneath us changed from gleaming sparkle to dull black in patches. There she is. I jutted my chin forward. After nearly an hour of flying, we saw our objective. Ah, good old Chio Rio. I remember it well. Gary smiled. We'd camped here once with the prospectors. I let down and circled a field where I saw a bunch of Hueys parked. That's them. Gary keyed the mic to broadcast. Preacher Control, this is Prospector 042. No answer. Gary repeated the transmission. Of course they don't answer, he said. They wouldn't be using the old frequency anymore. Meanwhile, I saw a group of men shielding their eyes with their hands, staring up at us. It's them, all right. I can see Connors, I said. I rolled out of the orbit and let down. We landed next to one of the preacher ships, killed the turbine, and stepped out. In fucking credible, said Connors. Don't tell me. You were on your way to Saigon and you got lost, right? Wrong. We're on our way to Paris and we stopped for fuel, I said. I saw some more men walking our way. One of them was Ferris. Mason and wrestler, Ferris said. I don't believe it. What the heck are you two doing down here all by yourselves? Just visiting, Captain, said Gary. Really? Just visiting? Ferris was trying to figure just how such frivolity was possible. His first cav logic could not fathom it. They let you just visit people? That's the way they do it on the outside, Captain, I said. Farris shook his head in wonderment. Well, come on over and join us. The cook just made up a new batch of brew. All the way to the mess tent, Gary and I had our backs padded and hands shaken by friends we hadn't seen for two months. At the mess tent, we also saw a whole bunch of new faces. As a matter of fact, almost all the faces we saw were new people. They were breaking up that old gang of mine. I saw Major Astor walking out to the flight line. His nemesis, John Hall, was no longer in the company. Banjo was still there, and so was Riker. Kaiser had gone to work for Air America, and that was it. A few old faces, some rumors, were all that was left of the original preachers. The second shift was taking over. They were moving into An K, never realizing all the work that the original guys had done to make it the way it was. It was funny how the hardships that I hated the most became the core around which I built memories of camaraderie. We sat around drinking coffee and telling war stories. The preachers had been overrun on an overnight logger. Four new pilots had been wounded, and a month before a new pilot was killed in an assault. We told them about the gunship that had landed with everybody unconscious. It had become the phantom gunship about hauling the reluctant ARVNs to the fort, and how the NVA overran the 101st artillery position. But most of all, we bragged about how much better we lived under the reasonable leadership of Ringknocker. Ice runs, beer parties, Vietnamese labor to build bunkers, and ambulances loaded with party girls. Just a way of life with us, all right. As we listed these things, calculated to shock their Spartan sensibilities, Ferris began to look uncomfortable. That guy would be hung in the cav, 
he said with a knowing nod. He gets the job done, I said. Farris nodded, but I could tell he didn't believe me. If the calf wasn't doing it, it wasn't getting done. We had chow and stayed longer than we should have. The sun was low in the sky, leaving us an hour or so to get back. We said goodbye for the last time. Hang in there, short timers, said Connors. Yeah, it's not long now, I said. Don't forget, we'll have a party when all this is over, Connors called as we walked away. I called back. Call us when you get to town. The last missions we flew at Docto were to recover bodies. We dropped teams at various spots around the bombing zone and waited for them literally to sniff out the bodies, which had become very ripe during the few days we had been packing up the camp. We just had a party not too long ago, I said silently to a lumpy body bag. Someone tried to push down a knee that jutted awkwardly. The knee moved down but sprang back up when let go. The smell grew so strong that I gagged. You should have been there, I thought. On July 17th, we were back at our permanent camp at Phan Rang for a four-day rest. Next stop would be Thuy Hua. Gary and I had passed our 30-day-to-go mark on the 12th. Four replacement pilots had come to the company. We really believed that we would be staying back at the camp to fly admin flights for the battalion or the ARVNs. I'm sorry, but it just didn't work out that way, said Deacon. Ringknocker had been to some pre-mission briefings and says we're going to be very busy at Thuy Hua. We have to support two units, one being Korean. We're just going to need every pilot we have. I looked at Gary. Gary looked at me. We both looked at Deacon. So why has everybody been saying we'd be doing admin flights during our last month? I said. We thought that's the way it would be. Deacon looked unhappy. It was ruining his expectations, too. The last month program was fading to the dream that it probably had been all along. I know that both of you are getting pretty jittery. Just keep doing what you've been doing and hang on. You'll be home before you know it. If it helps, just remember the rest of us have more than six months to go. Well, Deacon, I hope that when you get short they give you some kind of a break. I'm telling you now that you'll need one. I do, I said. I know. I'm sorry. Deacon left the tent. Now I had to reset my clock. Every sunset had put me one day closer to getting out of here. My mental calendar had ticked off the moments until it believed that it had reached zero. Adding twenty-five more sunsets to the calendar was a real strain. Look, I said to Doc Da Vinci, I'm tired. I can't sleep at night. I have to take tranquilizers to function. I need a break. Can't you do something? I'd like to help you, Bob, but physically you're fine. I glared at him. Look at me. I weigh less than 120 pounds. I look like shit. Another three weeks of being skinny won't hurt you. It's not that I'm skinny. It's why I am skinny. I'm worn out. I'm frayed. I want to fly at min flights like hundreds of other pilots do every day. Well, if you tell me you're afraid to fly, I can ground you. If I tell you I'm afraid to fly, you'll ground me? Yes. Why is he setting me up like this, I thought. Why does he want me to say that I'm afraid? Why can't he just use his professional authority and put a medical restriction on me? I can't say that. I'm not afraid to fly. I just don't think I or Gary or any short-timer should have to fly combat assaults anymore. We have each flown more than a thousand missions already. Isn't that enough? Why couldn't they bring up a couple of Saigon warriors to take our place? They could use the experience, and Gary and I could finish off our tours flying VIPs around or something. I told you what I have to do. I can't do that. Well, just don't take the tranquilizers during the day, said Da Vinci. That was the end of the conversation. Gary and I sat at a table watching the prospectors whoop it up at the party that night. Neither of us could join in. The laughing skull was no longer funny. This ends side one of cassette ten.
We had camped on the beach at Tui Hua for one day when a storm struck. Seventy-mile-an-hour winds blew clouds of sand in horizontal sheets. Tents began to collapse. Hueys approaching along the beach had to fly sideways. The only direction their noses could point in was into the wind. Gary, Stoopy, and I had pitched our tent a quarter of a mile nearer the ocean than the headquarters tent. We got back from a mission in time to see Stoopy wrestling with the flapping canvas. Blankets, mosquito netting, and clothes were rolling across the dunes like tumbleweed. "'Jesus Christ, Stoopy, why did you let the tent collapse?' yelled Gary. "'This is just like a desert storm you see in the movies,' Stoopy grinned, shoveling sand into what he believed would be a protective berm. "'Shit!' I said. "'Let's get this fucker nailed down!' "'The wind keeps pulling the tent pegs out,' said Stoopy. "'So we make dead men!' I shouted in the wind. "'What the hell are you talking about?' yelled Gary. He had wrapped a towel around his neck and head to keep the sand out. "'A dead man is something you tie a rope to and bury,' I said, blinking. "'We can tie the ropes to sandbags and then bury them.' "'All right, let's do it!' Stoopy's shout barely rose above the wind. Stoopy filled sandbags while Gary and I went around the tent, tying them to the ropes and burying them. When we finished, the tent was concave on the windward side. It shook, but it held. We ducked inside to try to get the sand off our gear. The salty sand stuck to everything. My carbine gritted when I worked the bolt. I watched Gary slapping his cot with a towel, trying to dust about ten pounds of sand away. Stoopy lay on his cot, on a mixed pile of clothes, blankets, and sand, eating another candy bar. Stoopy, why don't you get that fucking sand off your stuff? I said. It'll just get sandy again. I shook my head in disgust. It will. I'll clean it up before I go to sleep tonight. You're a slob, Stoopy, said Gary. So, said Stoopy, somebody has to do it. Gary and I laughed. Stoopy's grin showed the chocolate stains on his teeth. With two weeks to go, I had very little tolerance for a person like Stoopy, but I realized that his intentions were good. He was friendly. He really wanted to be a good pilot. He wanted the Americans to win the war, and he flew into the assaults without showing fear. The problem was that he was a terrible pilot. Professional co-pilot, we called them. He was overweight, he was a slob, he was a juvenile, and he was downright dangerous. At Dock Toe, he had unloaded a parked flare ship by throwing the flares out the door. Unfortunately, the flare canisters were still attached by lines from their fuses to the deck. Normally, this allowed them to ignite automatically, as they were pushed out at 2,000 or 3,000 feet. But since Stoopy was unloading the ship on the ground... He was soon surrounded by a giant cloud of white smoke and blinding magnesium flames. Strangely, he was not hurt. He was also famous among us for not being able to keep himself in his formation slot. In just a few months he'd been with the prospectors, he'd become known as the Smiling Menace. Naturally, when Battalion requested that Ringknocker send his best pilot to Saigon to work for the VIPs, Ringknocker sent Stoopy. All the pilots had to vote for the best pilot, and he would be sent to Saigon. At the meeting, Ringknocker told us the rules. Vote for Stoopy. We have a terrible shortage of pilots already, so Battalion gets what I can afford, said Ringknocker. Stoopy Stoddard is what I can afford. You gentlemen will vote for Stoopy, and then we can get back to work. When I had first dealt with the Koreans at Bang Shun Valley, I was impressed by their zeal. When we drove by the Korean bridge guards, they jumped to attention with a shout. When we were mortared, the Koreans were the ones who came back to the camp carrying VC heads and the mortar tube. From the first time I saw them, I thought we'd be better off just giving the Koreans the country, if they could take it. They probably would have. At Tui Hua, we flew missions for the Koreans. At the pickup point, Gary and I watched five or six Korean rangers load our ship with food and ammo in less than a minute. Very few Koreans spoke English, so when the ship was loaded, a young soldier ran out to us and gave us a slip of paper with a list of coordinates written on it. The soldier saluted and left. We were to fly to these places, and they would know what to do. 
At the first stop, the ship was barely on the ground when a whole team of Koreans unloaded their portion of the load in seconds. No words were spoken. At the next stop, the same thing happened, and the next. By eleven o'clock in the morning, we had finished a resupply mission that would have taken us all day had we been resupplying Americans. All the Korean ROKs were hand-picked, highly trained volunteers. They were dedicated professionals who took the job seriously, and because they were performing under the watchful eyes of their original teachers, they were out to prove their abilities. They did. We flew almost every day. The missions were numerous, but I don't recall them very well. I was preoccupied. Gary had received his orders to leave Vietnam, but I hadn't. I sent letters to patients to contact the Pentagon. I checked daily with our admin section. I believed that it was possible for the Army to forget that I was even there. On a rare day off, I dragged a parachute canopy that Gary and I had scrounged from a treetop to the shore. I spread it out so that it made a circle of soft nylon fifty feet across. Carrying a towel, I walked to the center of the chute and lay down to sunbathe. I wanted to look tropical for patients. I was trying to be healthy. I had even stopped smoking again, on the chance that God would be moved to spare me. I heard someone clumping along the boards that led back up to the tent areas. My eyes were closed while the sun baked me. Hey, Mason, what are you doing? I looked up. Sunbathing, sir. Ringknocker grinned and began to step on my giant beach blanket. I had something. Don't walk on this. I quickly interrupted as Ringknocker put his foot on the parachute. What? Ringknocker stopped and stepped back. Don't walk on this. This is my beach blanket. People don't walk on other people's beach blankets, I said seriously. Ringknocker first showed a smile, but that faded to concern as he saw that I wasn't kidding. You're serious? Yes. Ringknocker nodded sadly and walked back up the board path. Behind him, I saw the maintenance ship take off carrying a damaged rotor blade attached to the sling hook. Major Steve Richards, the maintenance officer, had been hitching the rotor blade to his ship's cargo hook to carry it out to sea and drop it. He did nothing more dangerous in this war than to check out freshly repaired helicopters. When the blade had been attached to the hook, Richards asked if anyone wanted to go for a little ride. Five men, mostly mechanics, jumped on board. As the ship took off, it became obvious to the men on the ground that carrying a rotor blade dangling vertically beneath the ship was not going to work. It swung wildly under the ship as Richards gained speed. The maintenance sergeant ran after the ship, yelling, Major Richards, stop! Stop! The blade is swinging! I saw the blade whipping around under the ship at three hundred feet. Apparently Richards could not tell that the blade was gyrating under him. Before he reached the water, the blade slashed up behind the ship, knocked off a section of the tail rotors. Richards flared back, trying to slow the ship, but it was no use. As he flared, the blade knifed forward under the ship and swept up and hit his main rotor. The damaged main rotor flew off. Time seemed to stop, and I saw the ship nose down, invert, and then disappear behind some tents and smash onto the beach. It fell like an anvil. There was a brief moment of quiet after the crash, and then a whoosh. The flattened Huey burst into flames. Orange flames first as the fuel burned, then bright white flames as the metal ignited. Helicopters contain a lot of magnesium. People ran toward the ship, only to be driven back by the fire. Major Richards, his crew chief, his gunner, and three mechanics were incinerated. I was still alone on my precious beach blanket. I cried. That evening on the beach, six flight helmets were placed on stakes in a line. The chaplain conducted the service. My one comfort in the hell of waiting was that I had a companion. Gary and I flew together always. Then, with five days to go on our tours, Gary left for Fan Rang. Don't worry, Bob, they'll get your orders. I know. Really, it's just a minor fuck-up. Ringknocker's going to tell you tomorrow or the next day that you can leave. Really? I know. I'm okay. So, I'll see you back in Fan Rong in a day or two, okay?
of course, a day or two. See you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Gary ran out to the ship going back to our main base. After a few days of out-processing, he'd be in Saigon getting on a big bird for the States. Ops assigned me to fly with a new pilot, Lieutenant Fisher, the next day. Fisher and I flew to a place in the jungles west of Tui Hua to pick up a reconnaissance squad. When we flew to the coordinates given us, it was an almost circular funnel of a valley. The squad was at the bottom of the giant funnel. They told us on the radio that they were getting occasional sniper fire and that we should be careful in the approach. I took the opportunity to show Fisher how to get down to the bottom of this place without getting shot. I flew toward the funnel at 80 or 90 knots, heading on a tangent to the rim of the funnel. I'm going to keep us low level all the way to the bottom, I said. Fisher nodded from the right side of the cockpit. This was his first mission in country. For a second, I saw myself there, wide-eyed, riding with Lease on that low-level run in Happy Valley. I had been overwhelmed by the speed at which things happened, and I'm sure that Fisher was experiencing the same feeling. As I crossed the rim, I banked hard, putting the ship level with the incline. If we stay close to the treetops and keep moving fast, they won't get us. We spiraled down the funnel. The squad called and said that they heard many shots. Don't worry, I said to Fisher. They're shooting blind. There was a stand of trees at the bottom that would force me either to pull away from the tree cover or to go through the trees. Since the whole point of this approach was to maintain cover, I chose to go through the trees. Near the end of the spiraling ride, I leveled the ship and rushed for the stand of trees. The squad was behind them. As I leveled, I had also dropped below the trees out of sight of the squad. Because we didn't come over the top or to the side, the squad assumed that we had crashed. When they called us, I was busting through the trees. I had swerved off to one side of the stand and then swung back in fast. This allowed me to bank very sharply so that the Huey and its big rotor disc squeezed between two tall trees thirty feet apart. After hurdling through the trees... I flared the ship quickly to make the landing. The radio operator, who had been asking where we were, said, Oh, we landed right in front of the squad. As the team quickly loaded, I noticed muzzle flashes ahead of us. The team leader pointed all around, at places he had seen shots fired. We were right on time. The squad was surrounded, and the VC were moving down the funnel to get them. Altogether, there were eight grunts, not a giant load at sea level, but enough that climbing out of this place was going to be slow. I'm going to accelerate to cross this field as fast as I can, and then we'll do a cyclic climb up the side of that hill. I hovered for a second, then nosed over hard, lumbering off across the field. I kept the ship at four or five feet until we reached ninety knots. Then I pulled the cyclic back and the ship swooped up. The climb was very fast at first because we were using the accumulated energy from the acceleration run. As we neared the top of the funnel, however, we slowed to a grinding crawl. I knew that this was when they would be shooting in front of us, taking a lead, as a hunter does with a duck. So, when the ship was straining hard, with very little forward velocity, I did an abrupt pedal turn at the top of the climb and headed back in the opposite direction. That took everybody by surprise, and I heard shouts from the back. Fisher involuntarily reached for the controls, but stopped himself. A few seconds later, we were beyond the ridge, heading back to the beach. Beautiful, said Fisher. He was grinning. Just remember, keep yourself low when there are trees. Keep moving as fast as you can and never use the same route twice. I grinned as I said that. Lise had told me the same thing a year ago. When I was flying, my life was in my own hands. When I was back at the camp, the Army was in control of my destiny, and the Army still hadn't found my orders. This is a hot one, said the operations officer, Major Ramon. Every pilot in the prospectors was at the briefing. The Major droned on with battle plans, frequencies, ship numbers, crew assignments, and suspected enemy locations. It was so much noise to me. My hand was writing information down on my pad, but my mind was in shock. Two days to go, said my mind. Two fucking days to go, and I'm going on a hot one. 
We will make a total of three lifts this morning, said the Major. Three chances. Step right up. Three, count them. Three, Huey writhed in a combat assault absolutely free. Win yourself a body bag. Become a hometown hero. Become a memory early in your life. Okay, you've got everything you'll need. Let's go. I walked across the quarter mile of sand with Fisher. I kept checking my gear like a novice. Pistol, flak vest, maps, chest protector. Oh yeah, the chest protector is in the ship. Helmet, courage. Where is my courage? Oh yeah, my courage is in the ship. Lose something? Asked Fisher. He had been watching me check myself, patting my pockets and gear. No, I've got everything. This is really exciting, said Fisher. Yes, it's very exciting. You dumb shit. I hated Fisher when he said that. Exciting? Is that like excitement at the old football game? It's exciting to get killed? Fool. Wait a few months and then tell me it's exciting. Fisher climbed up to the rotor head and I checked the airframe. As I opened the radio hatch at the nose, an orderly ran up to me and said, They want you back at Ops, sir. For what? I don't know, sir. Major Ramon told me to tell you they have something for you at Ops. Right. I looked up at Fisher. I'll be right back. Fisher nodded. I pushed the flap aside and walked into the Ops tent. Ramon wasn't there. Where's Major Ramon? I asked the sergeant. I don't know, sir. Well, what did they want me for? Who wanted you, sir? Ramon, I thought. I was just told that somebody had something for me here, and I'm here. Is this some kind of joke? I don't know, sir. I don't know anything about it. I heard the turbines winding up to shrills behind me. The prospectors were cranking up. I turned and left. If I didn't hurry, I'd hold up the mission. I ran across the sand. A hundred yards away, the lead ship took off. What the fuck? I waved. Hey, wait! There's only one pilot in my ship. I ran faster. Then the whole flight took off. I stood in the sand, watching the flight cruise west, completely confused. A jeep I hadn't noticed before drove back from the flight line. The driver stopped next to me. Want a ride, sir? The driver was the orderly that had come with the message. All my flight gear was in the jeep. I got in. What the fuck is going on? Where's Major Ramon? Major Ramon is flying your ship, sir. I wasn't the only one who thought I needed a break. The next day, August 10th, I was called into the operations tent and handed orders. I was to proceed to Saigon to catch an 11 o'clock morning flight on the 14th. I was exhilarated. That afternoon, I was flying a Huey back to Phan Rong. The ship was due for a major overhaul, and so was I. I flew along the coast and went through a notch in a tall hill next to the ocean. As we crossed the ridge, the crew chief, a new guy, called me. Sir, we're being shot at from that hill. Shall we engage? Shall we engage? I couldn't believe what I heard. Shall we engage? Not today, Sergeant. I turned to Staglione, the co-pilot, and grinned. Not today. I laughed so hard that I cried. Sitting in the soft airline seat, I savored the air-conditioned crispness of the air and breathed in the sense of the passing stewardesses. I had a grin on my face that wouldn't quit. I was the Cheshire Cat. The man who sat next to me was Ken Clayman, a guy I had met on the Croaton. We were both aboard a chartered Pan American 707, going to the land of the big PX. We were no longer in country. I suppose now we could say we're out country? Yes, definitely out country, said Clayman. It seems like a dream. Yeah, it is nice to wake up from a bad one, and just when you thought they had you. Since I had left Phan Rong, every time I checked the time, I remembered that the maid had stolen my watch. The maid who neatly arranged my gear for me, who'd never steal a thing until the day you left. I had considered the watch a charm. It had been lifted once before. The first night I tried out the new shower we'd built in the preacher's, I hung it on a nail, took the shower, and it was gone. I'll get it for you, Rubensky had said. You know who took it? Not yet, but don't worry. I'll find the fuck. Stole your grandfather's watch. What slime. An hour later, Rubensky walked into my tent carrying the watch. There you go, sir, and don't worry. It won't happen again, Rubensky said. 
Hey, thanks a lot. You're amazing. It was nothing, he said. Just remember, Lake Tahoe. Clayman and I reverted to early adolescence during the flight back. Neither of us could sleep during the twenty-hour trip. Instead, we cracked jokes and pretended we were flying the plane. The pilots we played didn't know much. Compass? What's that? Holding pattern? Are you crazy? I can't put the gear down. We're too close to the rooftops. We landed at the Philippines and then headed for Hawaii. At Honolulu, we were invited to get off the plane to stretch our legs, buy gifts and such. Clayman told me to pick up a small chess set so we could play on the long, non-stop flight to Fort Dix, New Jersey. I found a small traveling set at one of the airport gift shops. I also grabbed a Newsweek and went to the counter to pay. The clerk, a young woman, took my money and asked if I was returning from Vietnam. I said yes proudly. She suddenly glared at me and said, "Murderer." I stared at her for a long minute, feeling confused. Then I smiled. I realized that she was talking about someone else. Epilogue, and then what happened? Ground war here in Vietnam is taking on a new cast, with more and more direct conflict between U.S. and North Vietnamese troops. At this point, no one is sure how far this dangerous confrontation will go. U.S. News and World Report, August fifteenth, nineteen sixty-six. I made it. I smiled as patients ran toward me. She was crying. Jack toddled across the parking lot at the bus station, holding my sister's hand. He looked bewildered. I had been away half his life. I thought you'd never get here," said Patience. We spent our first week in an apartment my father had rented for us near the beach. We spent the days at the beach, which I enjoyed. My nights were troubled. I kept waking up three feet in the air above the bed, frightening Patience. The dreams continued relentlessly, though the dreams were not what woke me. Back at Fort Walters, Texas, I began training to become an instructor pilot. During this training phase, my sister asked me to come to her wedding. She wanted me to wear my uniform. I don't think people would like to see me in uniform, Susan. You look so good in your dress blues, and I'm proud of you. Okay. I flew to Fort Myers for the wedding. I wore the uniform, the silver wings, and a bunch of ribbons, looking good. During the reception, I heard some laughter when I walked in the door. A man I did not know asked loudly, "Hey, where's your flag?" I flushed with anger. The place was quiet for a minute. People looking at me. Susan looked horrified. A fight at her wedding? No, no fight. The only fight going on was the one inside my head. I should have gone over and decked him. Alas, there are no time machines. I cooled myself by thinking, if he knew me, he wouldn't have said that. I took the instructor pilot job very seriously. It gave me the chance to cull out potential stupid stoddards. During the two-month cycle, each group of four students spent with me. I taught them stuff not covered in the school syllabus. The school was interested in getting numbers out the door. I was interested in their survival. For example, the school no longer allowed simulated forced landings to the ground. Instead, the instructor had to take control of the ship and abort the landing before the ship hit the ground. I thought that actually skidding across the ground, finishing the auto rotation, was a key experience. So I let each student do it. Instructor pilots flew half days. The flights alternated weekly, so that you flew mornings one week, afternoons the next. I spent my free time learning photography. I taught myself how to print photographs and enlarged some of the pictures I took in Vietnam. I won an army photo contest with one. Invariably, I tore my displays off the wall. I wanted to say how I felt about the war, but my pictures weren't doing it. I took pictures around Central Texas. Mostly of abandoned farmhouses, and my technical skill grew with the practice. A few of us who flew the H-23 Hiller were picked to cross train in the new Army trainer, the Hughes TH-55A. When I became rated in both trainers, I became a substitute instructor pilot in addition to my normal load. The demand for new pilots was growing monthly. 
The new trainer was falling out of the sky, killing veteran pilots and their students. The ships were always found the same way, nose down in the ground, mush inside the cockpit. One or two pilots and their students were killed each week. After two months of this, an IP called in as he crashed. He said that the ship had tucked in a simulated forced landing, and the controls had no effect on the dive. Then he died. They found out that if the cyclic was moved forward when the power was cut, the ship would immediately nose over and dive. Once in this position, pulling back on the cyclic was useless. Hughes' test pilots discovered that the ship could be saved if the pilot pushed forward on the cyclic, not back as he would instinctively do, and if he had 1,000 feet of air to wait for the recovery. We flew at 500 feet in the training areas. We were told to demonstrate the tuck and its hairy recovery to all our students. I had it shown to me a couple of times, but I felt that students were not going to be able to appreciate the subtlety of the maneuver, especially since they were still trying to get the trainers into the sky and back to the ground in one piece. I found that a vivid explanation of the tuck effect and an immovable hand in front of the cyclic were adequate. Four students stayed with me for a two-month cycle, and then four more would take their place. They were overjoyed to be in flight school. So was I. I flew all the time. I began to know each of the hundreds of confined areas the Army had rented from the local farmers. Even though we had so many places to train, the fact that there were 1,500 helicopters milling around the sky each training day made flying dangerous. Mid-air collisions, especially between two solo students, became commonplace. One afternoon I cut the power on a student near a grassy clearing used to demonstrate forced landings. The student reacted quickly, bottomed the pitch, maintained airspeed, and maneuvered the ship toward the clearing. He was doing just fine. Unknown to us, however, another ship was auto-rotating to the same field at the same moment. I noticed a shadow above us while we sank toward the clearing. He was descending faster than we were. As his skids closed on our rotors, I knew there was no way out. If I moved the disc, the rotors would swing up into his skids, we were already descending as fast as the ship could go. At the last second, the other ship saw us and jerked violently away. By my reckoning, he missed us by an inch. But close calls in training were not what was bothering me during the night. Every morning the truck comes. I have to open the back door. I know it's out there, but I still go to the door, I said. It's always the same. The driver backs the truck to the door and says, How many do you want? He points to a truck of babies. Dead babies. I always gag at the sight. They all look dead. But then I see an eyelid blink in the pile. Then another. I stopped. Then what happens? Doc Ryan flicked an ash on his desk. Then I always answer, Two hundred pounds, Jake. I laugh when I say it. Jake picks up a pitchfork and stabs it into the pile and drops a couple of corpses on a big scale. Nearly ten pounds ahead, he says. Inside my head, I'm yelling for him to stop, that the babies aren't dead, but Jake just keeps loading the scale. Each time he stabs a kid, it squirms on the fork, but Jake doesn't notice a thing. Then what? Then it ends. What do you think it means? I was hoping you'd tell me. I'm more interested in what you think it means. I don't know. Well, time's up anyway. Think about it. Same time next week? Okay. Dr. Ryan, Captain Ryan, led me to the door. The tranks helping? They help me sleep, but I can't fly with them. A little more time, he said. You'll be back up. I was grounded. Seeing Doc Ryan each week was part of my new schedule. This was the second time I had been grounded at Walter's. The first time I was with one of my best students landing at the main heliport. At the end of the training sessions, the heliport was normally crowded with hundreds of returning trainers. Usually the instructor flew the ship in this congestion, especially on the flight line, where the competing rotor wash made hovering tricky. As I hovered toward the parking slot, I felt the ship rear back. I pushed the cyclic forward, then realized that the ship wasn't falling backward. I was. I squeezed the intercom trigger. You got it! 
The student grabbed the controls instantly, thinking I was just giving him one more surprise test. He maneuvered into the slot, landed, and shut down. While he did that, I fought the dizzy feeling. Back at the debriefing, I complimented him on his landing and gave him a double-A grade for the ride. Then I went directly to the flight surgeon. He could find nothing physically wrong, but he grounded me for a month. Being a grounded pilot in the midst of flying pilots is torture. I worked in the tower, kept records, and drove trucks out to the stage fields. I was performing a job normally held by a PFC. During the month, the nightmares continued, and my wake-ups became worse. I lived long nights alone in my own home. After Patience and Jack were asleep, I paced, read, built model airplanes, anything to become sleepy. Generally, I would get to bed at four or five in the morning. I reasoned that things would only get worse if I didn't fly. The trauma of being grounded was inflaming the problem. When I saw the flight surgeon again, I told him everything was just fine. I felt great. Sleeping like a log. When can I fly? He said that if I went another week doing as well, he would put me back up. And he did. I taught flying again. I showed students how to get into and out of confined areas, how to take off when you couldn't hover, how to fly formations, and I even demonstrated night auto-rotations. Lise would have been proud. At the end of the cycle, the students, whom we had put through hell, were so happy that they usually gave their instructors gifts. The traditional gift was a bottle of whiskey. I did not drink at the time, so my gifts accumulated in a cupboard at home. My days were good. My nights were hell. I had been back from Vietnam for over a year. The dreams still oppressed me, and the unseen fear kept me bouncing out of bed. On one of my late-night wanderings around the house, I decided to have a drink. Three drinks later, I climbed into bed and fell asleep. I tried it again the next night. It worked, though I had to drink a bit more to do the job. After I'd taught two more cycles, the dizziness returned. I was flying cross-country with a student when I felt the ship rear back. I was grounded again. This time it would be permanent. That was when I started seeing Doc Ryan. While the school was trying to find a job for a non-flying pilot, I spent two weeks taking psychological tests. For one set of tests, I had to go to Fort Sam Houston for a consultation. In the parking lot at Fort Sam... I met Niven, the prospector who had caught the wire in the minefield. He was now a major. Well, how do you feel about your DFC? asked Niven. What DFC? For the night we dropped that ammo, remember? You tried it once, started to fall through, and went around and did it again. Yeah, I remember that. Well, the grunt commander on the ground that night put us in for DFCs. I've got mine. I never heard a thing about it. I can't understand, Niven frowned. It couldn't have been because I was logged as the aircraft commander. That sounds typical. Well, you should check it out anyway. It can help your career. It doesn't matter. I'm leaving the Army. Why? I'm grounded. Without flying, the Army gets old quick. Why'd they ground you? I'm nuts. I walked through a hallway at the hospital. Fort Sam Houston is the burn center for the military. I saw 18-year-old boys with their faces burned away, bright pink skin grafts stretched over strange, stunted noses. Had someone photographed the men there, twisted and deformed with featureless faces by the hundreds, the war might have ended sooner, but probably not. With the results from my various tests, the Army gave me a new medical profile. A sentence in the profile reads... Aviator may not be assigned to duty in a combat zone. At a time when the Army was shipping pilots back to Vietnam after only a few months in the States, this no-combat restriction was known as the million-dollar ticket. People who knew me knew that I wrote stories. The head of the faculty development branch found out and interviewed me. He asked if I'd like to try writing lessons for ground school and be a platform instructor. And that is what I did during my last six months in the Army. As a platform instructor, I taught incoming pilots from Vietnam how to train students effectively. I stood on the stage, a has-been, 
and gave expert advice on how to do it. If you can't do it, teach it. I was witty. I was popular. I was a closet basket case. I was drinking half a bottle a night to get to sleep. Even though I could never go back to combat, the war enraged me. I watched television. The war was going stronger than ever before. The scores were always ten to one, proving that we were winning. Only a few people seemed to realize that the war was wrong. To the rest of the people, the war news droned on every newscast and had become an annoyance. People didn't want to stop it. They wanted it to go away. Meanwhile, pilots were being sent back for their second tours. At the officers' club one night, a pilot I knew came through to say hello. He was visiting his wife on a leave from Nam. A week after that, we read his obituary in the Army Times. The pilots read the obits and calculated their odds of surviving the second time around. The joke about going on the second tour was, if they try to send me back, they'll have to have a door on that plane big enough for me and my telephone pole. That was so much bravado, for almost all went. It was either that or end your career. For a year and a half, Patience and I had been going to the mandatory monthly cocktail party at the club. Patience hated army etiquette. We went through a receiving line each time, shaking hands with the post VIPs. One night she told a colonel that his sunglasses made him look cool. He took them off, glaring. Luckily, I was leaving the army anyway. After one of these receptions, I wandered around the club looking for old friends. Some of the instructors at Walters were former classmates, or guys I had flown with in Nam. I heard a familiar voice. Mason, I'll be damned. I thought I recognized the voice. It's me, Hawkins, he said. Lady Killer Hawkins? That's it. Some people moved behind me, allowing more light to shine on Hawkins. Something was wrong. That was definitely his voice, but his face. Just got here, said Hawkins. How come? I've been here a year and a half. The first thing I noticed was that Hawkins had no eyebrows or ears. His hair was patchy from implantations. His nose was shiny and deformed. Hawkins? The handsomest guy in our class? I've been in a hospital for a long while. Jesus, it is you. What the hell happened? Crashed and burned, said Hawkins. I got knocked out in the crash. I was unconscious in the fire for quite a while. You're lucky to be alive. That's what they tell me. Then his voice trailed off. I don't feel so lucky. They'll get you back in shape. Don't worry about that. The Army has the best. They've already done their best. Patience and I went to New Orleans for the weekend with another couple. It should have been fun. Instead, I collapsed while touring a catacomb. I sank to my knees, feeling death. I felt like I was going to roll over and die on the grass. The tombs seemed to beckon me. Later, when we got to a bar, I anesthetized myself. That helped. If I stayed drunk, I could cope. When I was sober, life was unending anxiety with no focus. I did so well as a platform instructor that when I told the head of the department I was leaving the army, he offered to get me a direct commission as a captain if I would stay. But I would be a captain who walked. I could wear my wings and walk to the flight line and watch the ships fly away. So when I left the army in 1968, it was as an ex-pilot and, in my mind, a failure. A lot has happened since then. I have followed a pattern of behavior that is typical of many Vietnam veterans. The funny thing is, I wasn't aware of the pattern until I wrote it down. It has taken a very long time for me to see it. I returned to the University of Florida to complete the education I had begun in 1960. I saw student demonstrations that accused veterans of being fools for going to Vietnam. I felt like a double loser. Some internal flaw had caused me to lose my flight status, and now I learned how dumb I had been for having gone to Vietnam. I studied art, mostly photography. I tried to learn a new career and rejoin society. I could not sleep without having nightmares. I arrived at my eight o'clock morning classes only after at least two stiff drinks. 
If I drank all day, I could sleep at night. I could not face a campus filled with young, smiling faces, while guys still leapt, screaming out of helicopters, killing and dying for a cause unworthy of their bravery. They deserved to be heroes, but they were fools. I kept jumping out of my skin at night, so I asked the Veterans Administration for help. They declared me a 50% disabled veteran by reason of nervousness, now called post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic DSM-3, 309.81, and issued me tranquilizers. I still drank, but now with the tranquilizers, and also smoked pot, introduced to me by students. I never saw the stuff in Vietnam. After nine months of school, I dropped out and moved my family to a small village in Spain. While we were there, America put the first man on the moon. After seven months, there was no improvement in my outlook or attitude, so we returned to the States. I worked as a technician in an electronics company. To the drinking, tranquilizers, and pot, I added a new vice, a girlfriend. When patients said she was going back to school, with me or without me, I also returned. During the two years it took to finish my degree in fine arts, Patience and I broke up for a month. I was up to almost a bottle of whiskey a day and four or five volumes, yet I was still as tense as a snake. I was seeing shrinks weekly at the VA, but the nightly wake-ups continued. When I graduated in December 1971, I started a commercial photography business. In less than a year it failed. I tried to get a job with the government as an aircraft dispatcher, deciding what ships were flyable and what ships needed maintenance. I wanted to be around helicopters. I was turned down because of my disability. Even Congressman Don Fuque could not get the government to hire this disabled vet, though he tried hard. The turn-down notice sent me was in an envelope stamped with the slogan, Don't forget, hire the vet. The war was still going on in Vietnam and inside my head. My father risked some money to start an import company with me. I wanted to buy pocket knives in Spain and market them through the mail. I had a car wreck in Portugal, broke my hip, and we ended up selling 30 knives. So much for importing. Finally, through an intricate series of business deals over a three-year period, I became vice president of a mirror manufacturing company in Brooklyn. There I had the money I wanted. I had 50 employees under me, and I quit using alcohol and tranquilizers. Still, I was painfully dissatisfied, and I continued to jump awake at night. By now, I had been back from Vietnam for ten years. I would not allow myself to believe that my unhappiness could be a reaction to my experience there. Instead, I drew the conclusion that I was somehow basically inferior or mentally disturbed. Two and a half years after I started at the Mirror Company, I resigned my position. We moved back to Florida, to ten acres of land next to the Santa Fe River. I built a cabin. Encouraged by my wife and friends, I decided to write about Vietnam. Things went badly. I had arranged a separation settlement from the Mirror Company that allowed us to survive while I built the cabin and wrote. When the money ran out, patients got a paper route to make ends meet. I looked for work, too, and finally decided also to run a paper route because of the free time it would give me for writing. The car broke down, and the bills began to pile up. For the time I had spent writing, I got four rejections. What did the desperate man do? I can tell you that I was arrested in January 1981, charged with smuggling marijuana into the country. In August 1981, I was found guilty of possession and sentenced to five years at a minimum security prison. I am currently free, as of February 1983, appealing the conviction. No one is more shocked than I. The End You've been listening to Chicken Hawk by Robert Mason, narrated by L. J. Ganser. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends If You Survive by George Wilson, narrated by Brian Keeler. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another recorded book, 
or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into narrator profiles and author interviews, so visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.